So High Guardian Spice was released late last year and was instantly the internet's favourite punching bag for a good few weeks. I'm late to the party, but in my defence, I had to sit down and actually watch this show. High Guardian Spice was off to a bad start even before it had started production, being advertised as Crunchyroll's first original show in a new lineup of content called Crunchyroll Originals. This angered the majority of Crunchyroll's paying members because for years, Crunchyroll's motto had been that you should pay for a premium membership on their streaming site instead of pirating anime because Crunchyroll directly supports Japanese studios and more importantly, their animators. If you're not up to date on the animation industry in Japan, it is dire. で、いくらぐらいですか毎月最初会社に入った時は固定給で新人だったんで出るんですけどそれが5万円で、で、会社を出てフリーランスになった時は4万円、3万円とかでやってましたね。今やっと5万、6万くらいは稼げるようになったん
is, because of this extremely toxic production and all the mudslinging involved, I feel the real world drama has overshadowed the show's quality as an end product. Crunchyroll's diversionary tactic by uttering the word feminism had done what it intended to do, in that now whenever the show is mentioned we have to talk about the feminist angle before we can even talk about the show's quality. It's also done its job in that many people, regardless of where they stand or what opinions they hold, get tripped up by the word feminism and LGBTQ and end up responding to the words in whatever way eventually getting completely redirected to discussing the larger topics instead of pushing it to the side to ask the question but is the show actually good this is nobody's fault i just had to front load this entire video mentioning this because it's a subject you cannot pretend isn't sitting in the middle of the room however it's also important to recognize the extremely effective way it's used to divert discussion and attention away from the show itself and turn every conversation about high guardian spice into an ancient greek debate and not the kind where everybody stands around looking intelligent and important but the kind where diogenes is throwing chickens and biting people if I could, I would have cut this entire first section out of the video completely and just actually talk about what the show is like, but I felt it is important to give proper context into the behind the scenes situation. However, I'm not going to go too deeply into the wider discussion because these subjects are complex issues and as such, they deserve to be treated and discussed with the importance and maturity they require. Also, I'm not here to personally attack any specific individual involved in the show's production, regardless of what I feel about some of the things they've said or done. I'm interested in looking at how they managed and executed the project. However, it's borderline impossible and arguably irresponsible to ignore the kind of individual who is the person in charge of all aspects of the show. In this case, the creator, character designer, writer and series director, Ray Rodriguez. I don't know what type of person Ray is in reality. I can only give comment on what he himself has made a choice to put publicly online and how his words and work reflect back onto him as a creator. And what the work and his public behavior reflects to me is that this is someone who is far too inexperienced to have been given the reins of being in charge of an entire show. Remember, Rodriguez isn't only the character and scenario designer, he is also the creator, which means director of all departments, not just art. Everything that appears on screen had to be reviewed and passed by him to make it into the show. This goes from writing to storyboards to animation to final execution. He may not have been the head art director who gives feedback and guidance to the art department, but he is the head series director, which means the art director had to deliver their department's materials to him to be approved and marked as finalized. And nothing about the show's execution, nor things Ray himself has said publicly, makes me feel he is seasoned enough to have been burdened with so much responsibility. Ray is a creator who has referred to the characters in the finalized and produced show as his OCs, as a character being another character's senpai, as well as this tweet, which originally I had a whole sequence on why it's ridiculous, but it was kind of mean and ultimately not very constructive, and we've got enough to talk about as it is. But I wanted to mention these things because they paint a rather clear picture of the person who is quite literally running the show and his level of maturity and professionalism. This is the guy in charge. Good grief. And now, about nine years later, we can actually talk about the show. We first get hit by this disclaimer. Remember this disclaimer. It will be important later. The intro theme song is fine. It's fine. I don't like the font choice for the credits, but whatever. The song is actually not bad at all. I'm guessing if I tried to play all of it, YouTube would yeet this video into the sun, but it's genuinely catchy. Actually, you know what it reminds me of? We 
We start the cartoon and are right away introduced to our main characters, Rosemary and Sage. Sage, it's finally here! Can you believe it? I almost can't. We've been preparing our, our whole lives for this day. I'm so happy I have you as my best friend and I love Lisa so much. We get their families awkwardly introduced as quickly as possible before Rose and Sage travel to the Academy to become Guardians. What's a Guardian, you might ask? I have no idea, and the show makes no attempt to tell us. We learn Sage's parents expect her to become a healer, which I'm guessing is the family business based on their outfits, and Rose is given a big sword that belonged to her mother. I'm also very confused by the character design for Rose's brother. His paler colors make him stand out from the others, and he looks like this in the intro, suggesting he has a major part to play in the story, which is why he's designed in a way to draw the eye. He does not. This is one of two times outside the intro he is on screen. Sage, don't forget Chompy. Wait, is that? <laughs> is that Scarborough Fair? Did you seriously decide to use Scarborough Fair as your le motif for this show? Why? Okay. Okay, let me explain. So, Scarborough Fair is an English folk song that's roughly dated to around the 1600s. It gained popularity in recent years thanks to Simon and Garfunkel in the late 60s, and you might have heard it recently when Ninja Sex Party released their cover of it in 2020. Uh, their cover's really good, by the way. The story of the song is about an impossible love a man has for a lady who lives in Scarborough Fair in Northern Yorkshire. He tasks the listener of the song to tell her to weave a shirt with no thread or needlework and then to wash it in a dry well and if she completes these tasks they will be together forever. Tell her to make me a cambric shirt Parsley, sage, rosemary and I originally gave the show the benefit of the doubt that the names of the characters came first and when Rodriguez realized the lyrics of the song matched, he decided to implement it regardless of tonal relevancy. But according to Wikipedia, they were named after the song which is worse because it displays a willful ignorance to the song's story. My friend said it reminded her of when teenagers put ill-fitting songs in their fanfics and at first I agreed but actually no. Because at least when teens are kind of tone deaf about this sort of thing, they almost always use ill-matched songs because at least the song itself made them feel something. At least the song had some or other emotional resonance with them. I have no idea why this is here other than my OCs. Basically what you've done is this. By the rising of the moon. This may seem like a really small nitpick that isn't really important, but it sets a precedent for what is going to be the biggest problem for the show as a whole, and that is weird, meaningless story decisions. The pacing of episode 1 is, I, I can only call it terrible, I'm so sorry, but the pacing is awful. Each episode of High Guardian Spice is around 22 minutes with a total of 12 episodes. So it has more or less the exact same time to work with that Madoka Magica did to tell its story, just as a comparison. If you want a non-magical girl comparison, it has the exact same amount of time to tell a story that Erased did. The first episode opens up and our characters name themselves, say how excited they are to leave and become guardians, and talk about their personal motivations for wanting to go within the span of a few seconds. We then have them meet their individual families who see them off as they climb aboard this ostrich wagon, which they then take to this bus, which they then take to this barge, which they then take to this train, which takes them to the city of Lindbergh, where the Guardian Academy school thing is located. Here they meet Sage's cousin Anise and her wife Allo, which then take them to their home, clumsily mention old and new magic, Rose has a Steven Universe flashback about her mom and is sad about it. Then, in a completely unnecessary scene which you could literally cut, the characters have breakfast when nothing of importance is said. I'm not joking, it's just a lot of, would you like breakfast? Haha, <laughs> don't get an aloe's way in the kitchen. I sure like food. 
Hell, I could have cut this from the review and you wouldn't even notice, except this is the famous bread PNG scene, so I have to mention it. It's beautiful! I was going to compliment the backgrounds of this show because a lot of them are genuinely good, but the quality dips dramatically in certain shots and just gets worse as the show goes along. At least the colours of the show are nice. It is very hard to try and explain pacing in a condensed review format, but the plot and character relevant things we learn across the 22 minutes of the first episode is… There is a school where you can become a High Guardian. Rosemary's mother was a High Guardian and Rose was given her sword. Her mother is missing, presumed dead and Rose is sad about it. Sage's parents want her to become a healer. These doohickeys are new magic and new magic is incompatible with old magic. Sage's cousin lives in Lindbergh where the school is located. We get a glimpse of future main characters, best girl Parsley and Time. Twice. Rose has a locket with a picture of her mom in it and she's sad about it. Now it may sound like I'm leaving out world building details in this list, like what is a High Guardian? Why is there an entire school devoted to becoming a High Guardian? Why did Rose's mom go missing? What is new magic and what is old magic? How is magic and being a guardian tied to each other? What is the city of Lindbergh like? Why does it look like every single city in an isekai? But apart from talking about new and old magic once or twice, none of these things are ever developed any further than establishing them and then delegating them to offhanded mentions while we focus on the really important details like the fact that Anise and Allo are married. Almost every single scene of the 22 minutes of the first episode take way too long on a mechanical level or ultimately mean nothing. Why did we need to see Rosemary and Sage go from an ostrich dragon to a bus to a barge to a train? The barge adds absolute zero net worth to the episode, characters or setting and could be completely cut and lose nothing. Why did we have to see the extended cut of these bootleg Totoro's mating dance when we never see this animal ever again at any point in this show whatsoever? The things which get the most attention, not only in episode 1 but in the show as a whole, is this show's creators going these are my OCs, Anise and Allo. Anise is a spunky lesbian and Sage's cousin who lives in Lindbergh. Despite Sage's family using old magic techniques, Anise prefers a more modern approach. She's married to a woman named Allo who is an elf. Allo and Anise are married. Because they're lovers. Okay. When Anise and Allo hold hands, the combined power of their love lets them use magic, which Anise couldn't do otherwise. Something, something new and old magic, I guess? Uh, don't ask me about the magic system too much, I haven't figured this part out yet. <sighs> you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of early 2000s webcomics, which would have the story happen in the actual comic, but then have pages upon pages of supplementary material that went deeper into the setting and creatures and races and character bios. Except the show has no way to give all this pointless plot irrelevant trivia, so it just shoved the character bios into the show itself and not bothered with the world building details at all. Which ends up with us having long conversations about how being transgender works in this world for several minutes which has no relevance to the plot and exists only because the creators are really proud of these details and are desperate for the audience to know about them. I'm not just talking about the queer content here by the way. Uh, do, you, do you want me to show you the full squirrel mating dawn sequence? Because I had to sit through the entire school mating dawn sequence. These animals are never seen again. I genuinely don't know what's worse, cramming meaningless character minutia into the show itself and using up all your runtime on things that don't matter while ignoring plot crucial details, or telling your audience to do homework using extra material which will end up being quiet reading if you want to understand what the basic plot is. Anyway, the time not spent this episode showcasing side characters is spent on characters having really mawkish conversations that'd be right at home in a 1940s dad knows best TV show, or like a, like a, a Darman video. I'm going to explode. You're not going to explode. Well, what would you do if I did? I'd put you back together. <laughs> you say that so confidently. Yep. 
You could say that these conversations are here to familiarize us with the characters, but they come across as so fake and performative that by the end of the episode, you don't feel like you know anything more about these characters than what you could pick up from the cold intro. The majority of the episodes following the first do handle their pacing slightly better, but the pacing of individual episodes slowly build upon themselves and becomes a bigger and bigger problem as the show continues. I know I'm stuck on the pacing for a long section here, but it's important to understand that this is the biggest and most prevalent problem, but it's also the hardest to explain without actually watching the show. The best I can do is show you how much nothing can be cut from the opening sequence alone. Trust me, not a single ounce of important information has been removed here. Now granted, there's an intro sequence, I've just combined it with the travel sequence because it's the first episode, so you can do that. Uh, this is just one way you could reduce the time though. Leaving everything as is and just cutting things like the barge sequence, the meaningless back and forth with the bus driver or this part while boarding the train would already really help the flow. You could even have them board a train at the start, fade to the intro and then fade back to them getting off the train. There are a thousand ways you could tighten this up. Also yes, I see the very obvious Kiki's delivery service inspiration here, I just don't have anything interesting to say about it other than I see it, which honestly is not really a crime, it's just, oh hey I like that, I like that movie too. Anyway, we need to keep going, so moving on. Oh yeah, I like Azumanga Daya too. Episode 2. We get inside the High Guardian Academy and this is where we learn a new detail about this show. This show really, really, really wants to be Harry Potter. And I don't mean this show is using the setting of a magical school as was popularized by Harry Potter. I mean this show really wants to be Harry Potter. I'm surprised there aren't schoolhouses. But we do have classes devoted to seemingly nonsense magical skills portrayed to look whimsical more than anything practical, faculty made up of magical creatures, care for magical creatures class, school tests that seem overly complicated and also weirdly specific, hallways with changing paintings. The headmaster or headmistresses in this case are both wise as well as quirky. 
there are teachers who knew the main character's parents when they were young. Teachers who seem more interested in murdering their students than teaching them. Botany involving magical flora that could kill you. This class, which gives me really big divination vibes, as well as just the, the overall feel, if that makes sense. There are a lot of things that may not be direct comparisons to Hogwarts, but damn if it's not giving me Hogwarts vibes. Welcome, 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 Hogwarts. We still don't know what a High Guardian is. And the show has not given us any hint of what a High Guardian even looks like. The closest it's gotten to showing us is Rosemary's mother, Lavender. But then apparently Sage will become a great healer if she goes to this academy and become a High Guardian? Are her parents High Guardians? Guardians also protect nature or something? The show has still not explained the foundation of its own title. It's just thrown us into a magical school setting and gone, we've all read Harry Potter, we know how this goes. What the show tries to be is Harry Potter meets Steven Universe, when what it is is Harry Potter fanfiction meets My Life Me. The episode starts and we're introduced to the headmistresses called the Triad. I actually like this. The triple goddess concept of the maiden, the mother and the crone is thousands of years old and directly tied to witchcraft in general. Except I have to remind myself that this show has nothing to do with witchcraft. We're supposed to be learning how to be guardians. Is a guardian a witch? Is Lavender a witch? I don't know. Guardianship is something special. But what is it exactly? If you knew, you wouldn't be here. Wait, you don't know either? The longer I stop to think about any surface level idea in this show, the more I feel like I'm going insane. We meet up with Parsley and she's dragged along the surly time, who's her roommate. Ah, so Parsley is the kind of person to make friends easily and have people naturally drawn to her. Noted. So the students need to make up their own definition of what a guardian is and present it at the end of the day. This isn't a terrible concept and can actually work as a good backbone for the show as a whole. Have characters make statements at the start of the show on what their priorities are and then at the end of the show have them make new ones and see how those priorities have changed. Sage is here to master magic and Rosemary, you're on the warrior track like me. And time's on both tracks and she's got that fairy woods background so... Is this academy just a character creator screen? And not the Skyrim kind, I mean like the Pathfinder kind that take like two hours. It was at this point where the pacing was bothering me enough to wonder if this show didn't use storyboards. See, there's this absolutely insane thing certain shows will do, often the bad cash-ins, where they will just skip the refined storyboarding stage and just use the sticky note stage for finished storyboards. I legitimately don't know how they work without proper storyboards, I've never worked on a project without proper storyboards, but since storyboards and animatics are what dictate the timing of an entire episode, from voice acting to editing to the animation, I was curious if they had just skipped this part. Is, is this for the entire show? This can't all be for one episode. What the actual fuck? Why? Normally, most shows have two, maybe three, sometimes only one storyboarder on a single episode. Episode two of High Guardian Spice has eight. I thought Rodriguez said the show was bad because it had no budget. How are you paying all these people then, Rodriguez? I even double checked with some of my industry friends to make sure I wasn't overreacting, but why? Anyway, they go to their classes where Parsley's job as an actual blacksmith gets her bumped up to third year classes in metallurgy. Meanwhile, Sage seems really off kilter and saddened that she and Rose have different schedules. Remember this. Remember this. Rose meets a character who will end up being more important later called Snapdragon. I'll talk more about him later, but I just want to point out that although this is a design choice I usually like, it's a little weird to have his eye design completely different from every other character. It's not a big deal, I just notice it every single time this character is on screen. We also get introduced to... Don't worry, I'm here. At ease, pores. My new favorite character. See, this is what happens when your main characters sound insincere and fake whenever they talk. I imprint on the bitchy trash gremlin. 
Hey, you should apologize. You should apologize for that posture, sweetie. You look like an invertebrate. At the end of the day, the triad tells the group that their vows were good, but it seems they don't fully understand what a guardian is yet Join the club. They then make the entire group listen to everyone's vows, which sounds mortifying. I bring it up because we get our introduction to another character that we'll see more of later, Parnell. I vow to protect ghosts and grogs, and also people, but first ghosts and grogs. Parnell is great. The triad then tells them the kind of things they should have made their vows about. To protect and keep the land holding it down. I promise balance, keep history alive and never be constrained by its relics. I vow to stay curious and engaged, to look at the world with a questioning eyes. I honor my name, my family, and my one true self, my multitude. This I vow. Well, that's all well and good as far as vague platitudes go, but what are the practical real-world applications of a guardian? Okay, bye! Oh. Being a guardian can kill you. They just say that stuff about death to scare people who aren't willing to do the work. No, they don't. They say you might die because you might die. Does anyone here have any concept of what a guardian is? Episode 3. We get a recap that just reinforces that being a guardian means nothing outside of vaguely worded concepts of chivalry. The triad does say what I mentioned earlier about revisiting the vows though, so I'm glad the show was able to recognize this as a solid structure to build upon. Then Rose breaks her sword, an important and dear gift from her mother. Oh, well done. Time rightfully shades Rose for not taking care of her weapons and is generally being antagonistic, except to Parsley, who, despite the fact that Time seems very antisocial, she refers to as Pars, saying she'll see her later. <laughs> I've ruined the one thing that matters to me. Wait, what about the cake locket? The stay consistent between consecutive episodes challenge. Professor Carraway asks Rose to stop by his office to talk about her choice of focus during free period. I'm not super fond of the voice actor's performance if I have to be honest. It's not the worst thing I've ever heard, heck it's not even the worst thing in the show, but it's just on the edge of stilted where I notice it every time he talks and it's, it's distracting. I can see the actor reading the script when he speaks. I'm guessing this is the actor's first or at least an early job, considering this show is proudly non-union. But really, this actor could very well go on to improve with time if given the opportunity. Oh. This episode we get a lot of Steven Universe flashbacks to Rose's mom, usually doing something with Rosemary and her sword, and this background staying the same between shots is bothering me, uh, and we learn the sword's name is Flowering Thorn. These scenes are here to remind us that Rose's sword is her mother's, and that her mother is no longer around and Rose is sad about it. Anyway, she goes to meet this Snape did nothing wrong character voiced by the show's creator who gives her an extended talk about how he knew her mother when they were young and then explains how being trans works in a setting where there are no limitations to the magic system, shapeshifting is so common as to be mundane, and people can make castles out of sausages. Make a castle out of sausages! We also get an extended flashback and Rosemary learns that the sword was broken before she flung it around. Not having any consequences for our actions, we love to see it. After all of that, we finally get to the point. Rose needs to pick a focus for her free period. Oh wait, enough of that, we need to focus more on Rose's mom and the sword. Did you know Rose is sad about that? Meanwhile, Parsley is concentrating on metallurgy as her focus. She gets given a little Harry Potter quest to fix a skew portrait in one of the hallways that changes when she straightens it, using a very small and seemingly unimpressive hammer. Fixing the painting opens up a trapdoor into what appears to be old catacombs beneath the school. She uses the tiny hammer to work her way through the tunnels, looking to escape. She comes across a cave full of trabbers, who she immediately befriends with her kind personality and asks for their help. They lead her to a non-Euclidean bridge 
broom closet and, using the tiny hammer, she climbs up until she's between the walls of the school. Apparently there was also a bunch of stuff off screen we skipped while we watched the third flashback of Lambda in this episode. She finds three nails and, upon hammering them down, is back in the smithy, where she learns this was a test for her to be resourceful when only having one tool at her disposal. She is gifted the tiny hammer as a reward. We never see this hammer again. Meanwhile, Sage is having a bit of inner conflict as her parents raised her to only use old magic. She wants to use more new magic, but she's struggling because she's not used to it. She also finally explains the difference between old and new magic. With old magic, you have to draw it out of the earth and it can take a physical toll on you. Whereas new magic... This new magic stuff? There is no cost. They can just do things. Cut their hair. Fly around the world. Make a castle out of sausages. <laughs> that seems really poorly thought out as far as will building goes. Oh, also, Rose gets three flashbacks about her mother during this episode, but we have to learn about Sage's inner conflict by her literally standing around telling us about it in words. Well, she tells her cat. Oh, she has a cat now, by the way. It's called Neppy Cat. Not Neppy, specifically Neppy Cat. Wait, is that a Homestuck thing? Oh, great. An infestation of nerds. <laughs> oh, thank fuck. Amaryllis and Snapdragon interrupt because the script needed them to mess up Sage's potion and... Oh, are you going to... <laughs> oh no! So Nippy runs off because he has a mission now, apparently. I love her so much. Anyway, Time tries to fix everyone else's mess, but it doesn't stop Neppy for long. He then goes on to beat the shit out of this tree. Time has had enough of this, and this time puts Neppy to sleep properly. Turns out though, Neppy was trying to stop these weird black roots from spreading on this tree. Sage berates Amaryllis and Snap for messing up her potion. I meant to cast a gentle, harmless spell. 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 You're a jerk. Jerk. Oh, someone has a type. Good for him. Whatever it was that was making the tree sick, Time immediately reacts to it with horror. The episode ends with Rosemary saying that for her free period, she's gonna focus on being a fighter. I wouldn't say protected exactly. It was more that we didn't cut it in half with swords. And Rosemary, you're on the warrior track, like me. By the end of your time here, you will understand my heart. Yep. The last thing we see is Time looking angstily out of her window as what she calls the rot spreads further. Ooh, plot. I'm eager to see where this goes, actually. You may have noticed between those three stories, the one with Rosemary, our main character, was the least interesting and added almost nothing to the story or Rose that we didn't know before, other than Caraway knowing her mom. Will that ever be important? Maybe someday. And so we come to the end of the first quarter of the show and the first video of what was going to be a simple first impressions look, but I was so inundated by this show's bizarre execution. There are a lot of smaller things I didn't bother mentioning because I genuinely could do a more length discussion on every strange decision in this show the creators made. I was going to talk about art style at some point and I just couldn't be bothered because it paled in comparison to the larger problems. There's also some odd animation here and there, but it's generally just kind of subpar at its worst and so not actually worth talking about as much as braid PNG. Usually when I want to check out a 12 episode show, I watch the first three episodes, because I feel if by episode three, if it has not given me enough to justify spending time on it, then I'm, I'm well, I'm not going to spend my time on it. I have too little free time and too many other things I need to watch which I know will be good, I'm sorry. I just started watching TNG for the first time. I'm not 22 anymore and willing to sit through 70 episodes of Sonic X waiting for it to get good. So at this point I would have stopped watching to be perfectly honest. I wouldn't have hated the show or been actively angry at it or anything, but I would not feel there's enough here for me. But who knows, maybe the show picks up after this. 
Also, don't go harassing the people who made this. This show is fertile ground to critique on its own. We don't need to get tacky about it. Besides, there's better use of that energy. Like watching TNG. TNG is progressive and has good writing. What a concept. Okay. For two days, I've been trying to construct sentences without personal pronouns. Now I give up. What should I use? It? To us, as rude. I've got links to coffee in the description as well as Patreon, which I'm trying to get less scared of using despite using it for years. And okay, that's all. Episode 4. Episode 2 is when we got to the academy, so of course episode 4 has our main characters going home. Because when you set your show in a magical Harry Potter school, you want to immediately break away from that setting. Due to a Trabber infestation, the girls all have to go home for the weekend while the school gets their magic equivalent of fumigated. Good morning, everybody! Get out of here immediately! Rosemary and Sage go back to Anise and Aloe's house. Time wants to go camp out in the woods rather than see her mother, but Parsley decides this is unacceptable and insists that Time come stay with her instead. Parsley takes Time to her family Smithy to stay with her indeterminable amount of younger brothers. I think there are 14 now. And her parents who... <laughs> okay, no. I am sorry, there's a lot of fluidity in fantasy I can handle. I like when fantasy settings don't just copy and paste the same tropes over and over, but I am sick and tired of this erasure of female dwarves having beards. Terry Pratchett and Tolkien himself did not establish the fact that dwarven women are bearded just for the entire entertainment industry to go, um, yeah, actually, we don't want to do that. It's the beards. You absolute Cowards! Give your dwarven woman beards! It's okay for Parsley to not have a beard because she's not an adult. Also, it's okay for Varric to not have a beard because his entire character is about his disdain for the suffocating traditionalism of dwarves that led to his borderline abuse of father's obsession with dwarven honor that got him killed and sent his mother to drink in an earlier grave. Uh, he he's allowed to shave. But Bianca, on the other hand, fucking cowards! Where was I? Oh right, Parsley goes home to her plethora of brothers, her parents, and... It is a girl. Girl! Oh, Meanwhile, Anise and Allo ask Rosemary and Sage how life at the Academy is going. It's... good. It's different than I expected. Okay, so I literally just realized something while writing this, but Sage has never been happy so far. And you might be thinking, oh, but that's her character. She's supposed to be anxious and also struggling with the poorly defined magic system. And I fully understand that that is the intent and her character is mostly written to match this, but it's more than just that. Sage is never happy or excited or enthusiastic or even just content with anything. Maybe I'm noticing it because I used to know someone like this a long time ago, but it comes across not that Sage is struggling, but more that Sage actively tries not to enjoy herself. She was unhappy not to share every class she has with Rosemary. She was understandably stressed by the lack of orientation on her first day. She was stressed about not understanding the new methodology because it's different than what she's used to and not being good at something right away made her feel like a failure, which... Okay, yeah, I'll give her that one. She was bothered by Amaryllis making fun of her old magic upbringing, and when asked how the academy training is going, she responds with, It's going okay, I guess. At this point, I think her being a little unhappy can still be justified, but I'm gonna bring this up again in an upcoming episode, so just take note of this. Anyway, after sounding less than enthusiastic about her time at the academy so far, Anise and Allo give Sage a gift to try and cheer her up. Rose doesn't get a gift, but Allo bribes her by materializing food out of thin air without any equivalent exchange for doing so. I'm sorry, but the lack of world building in a show when it has its fantasy setting at the forefront is infuriating. Sage's gift turns out to be a terrasphere. These magical doohickeys which people, I guess, used to do magic with? They're briefly mentioned in the first episode when Sage is impressed by Anissa's Terrasphere and asks to hold it before saying that she thought that new magic and old magic were incompatible. 
So, uh, I, I think they're needed to do magic, I think? <laughs> Look, they're wands, okay? They're Madoka Magic Soul Gems that work the same way wands do, except they only do new magic. That's as much as I can figure out. Sage is... It's... Uh... Do you like it? She loves it, right Sage? I... Uh, of course. Anise shows her how to activate it. <sighs> okay, Sage. Aloe says that Sage is too sweet to admit she dislikes it. What? Anise says they'll take it back, to which Sage pulls this face. But when Anise elaborates that they'll go with her to get a new one that fits her better, Sage is unhappy about this. You see what I mean? Let's check with Parsley and Thyme instead. The backgrounds in this episode are not bred PNG like the first episode was, but they still bother me. Mostly in Parsley's home. The perspective is very weird. I think it's supposed to be a fisheye, or maybe not. I think it just looks like a fisheye because we're supposed to be high up in like one of the arches. But the perspective on this countertop here feels like we're looking at it completely top down and don't match Parsley and her mom who are working on it. Uh, this continues on throughout these scenes where shelves in the background seem to bend at odd angles or make you feel like there's not enough space for a character to be standing where they're standing. Also, while I'm here, there's a strange issue I noticed in this episode specifically where the characters' eye lines are not properly drawn. So they often look like they're staring off into space and having war flashbacks. Here, I'll show you. You see, once again, just like the bad animation in the first three episodes, this is a storyboard problem, not an animation problem. The animation was outsourced to Korea, and Korean studios are incredibly particular and do exactly as they're told. If you give them badly drawn boards, that's how they will animate them. They're not paid to improvise. Anyway, back to the plot. Apparently Parsley's mom had an entire baby and didn't bother telling Parsley about it, let alone that the new baby is her first sister because we've needed all hands on deck lately. Then she goes back to peeling potatoes without elaborating. Okay. While Parsley's mom questions time, we learn that time is from somewhere called the Fairy Woods, which is a few weeks journey away from Lindgarth, which I kept calling Lindbergh in the first video because I'm terrible with names. Time says her father is still in the woods, but her mother is in Lingard, before she contradicts herself and hurriedly says that her mom's out of town. Although Time so far has been very shut off, slightly antagonistic and reluctant to engage with other people, we get the impression that there is most likely some family trouble going on. This is further punctuated by Parsley's dad coming home. He greets Parsley before Time is introduced as Parsley's friend. Time tries to correct her that she's just her roommate, but Parsley's dad brushes this off and says any friend of Parsley's is part of the family. And when Time acts stiffly to his offer of a handshake, he pats her on the shoulder warmly before sitting down. Do you see what I've just described here? We take it completely for granted in shows that are written well from start to finish, but it's in shows like High Guardian Spice where the writing so far has been extremely subpar or distracted by giving us stiff and awkward character reference sheets that we can contrast when it does actually know how to give us good, subtle and informative character writing. From just these brief few scenes that only take maybe a minute of screen time, we know that Parsley is part of a large and close-knit family, but that there's some tension underneath. Time is shown in complete contrast when placed within this dynamic. She's not being mean or aggressive, but comes across as out of her element and unsure how to act telling us that whatever family she's from, it's probably not as lively and affectionate. She's also very guarded, not even talking about her family at all. From just this scene alone, we learn so much about Parsley's upbringing and home life, but we learn just as much about times, and all this without any actual explanations or showcase that distracts us from the current plot. Parsley's dad is excited for Parsley to have met the new baby girl in the family and goes on to say he can't wait to have all of his girls back under one roof. You mean for the holidays, right? <clears throat> Time makes the correct decision to get some firewood and excuses herself from the room. It's just... We're wondering if you've got it out of your system yet. Oh no... 
Surprisingly, Parsi does not blow up at her parents about this. She doesn't even seem that shocked. She merely excuses herself from the table, saying she needs to go sit on the roof to process this and leaves. Anyway, Sage has to go shopping to pick out a new Terrasphere she doesn't want. Rosemary, I, I don't want a Terrasphere. It's not right. I'm not... I don't do new magic. Sage does actually clarify the problem. She says the reason she doesn't want a Terrasphere is because her mom would be furious with her. She's gotten what she wants and what her parents approve of mixed up. Which does make me wonder why on earth her parents sent her to the High Guardian Academy in the first place if this was going to be a problem. Wouldn't it make more sense to homeschool her in the ways of old magic and healing if they didn't want her to use new magic? That's like sending your Muslim daughter to a Catholic school and then getting upset that she has to buy a rosary. Why would Sage's parents send her to the Academy if they didn't want her to use any new magic? Did they expect her to do all the academy studies but only use old magic regardless of what the school curriculum is? Are they so insular that they were unaware that the academy operates mostly on new magic despite Rosemary, Sage's best friend's mother, being a graduate of the academy and could have informed them of how the school operates? Is it actually not that big a deal to them and they meant for Sage to focus on being a healer first and foremost and there was just like a lack of communication? Is it a giant non-issue and Sage has been overthinking this so much she sent herself into a state of anxiety over it? I guess we'll have to find out in a later episode. We never find out in a later episode. They go into a Diagon Alley wand shop where they meet another side character who goes to the High Guardian Academy, Slime Boy. He's... Oh, wait, hold on. He's one of the more popular characters in the show, for presumably the same reason Vet Summer is a popular character. This is what everyone calls me. I kind of like it. Uh, you know, it's the same slime, and then boy. In case you're wondering, Slime Boy isn't voiced by a professional voice actor either. He's voiced by Julian Costa, who I'm told is a famous musician. Also, the wiki lists him as an elf for some reason? Is the High Guardian Spice wiki run the same way the Invader Zim wiki is, in that all its facts are sourced from hopes and dreams? Anyway, Slime Boy opens the glass cabinet for Sage to pick a new Terrasphere and then decides to leave them unsupervised. Sage picks one and Slime Boy re-enters the scene. Why, why did he leave? Remember how in part 1 I said this show makes bizarre meaningless decisions that eat up time and serve no purpose? Anyway, enough of that. We need to get back to Parsley, who is... coping. Are you... alright? I'm fine. Why? Luckily, before anyone is in danger of emotional honesty, Time's mother comes into the forge to have some scissors sharpened. Parsley accidentally lets slip that the school is evacuated for the weekend and that Time is staying with her because her mother is out of town. You're probably not shocked to hear that Time and her mother have a tense relationship. Parsley's mother invites Time's mother, whose name is Flora, by the way, to dinner. This can only lead to good things and won't be awkward at all. Misplaced my appetite. Gonna go find it. Flora chases off to Time, leaving Parsley alone with her family. This can only lead to good things and won't be awkward at all. She shouldn't treat Time like a child. She is a child, Parsley. You both are. I never got to be a child, Mom. I've been looking after my brothers my whole life, and I love them. They've been my whole world. But I finally get this shot to make something of myself, and you want me to leave? And here's where I drop an opinion I've been building up to. Parsley should have been the main character. And not because she's my favorite. If that were the case, Amaryllis would be the main character. <laughs> But Parsley is more equipped as a character and writing device to be the primary focus of the show than Sage and especially more so than Rose. Parsley is a young girl from a very large family who has had to put her own life aside both to help raise her siblings and also to take on the expectations of her parents regarding the family business. She gets a chance to claim her own identity by going to a prestigious academy to become a high guardian. 
Despite of, or perhaps because of her upbringing of putting her own life aside for the sake of others, she's very quick to help people and forges friendships and easily endears herself to those around her. She seems the only one capable of warming up to the cold and closed of time, who leads Parsley into becoming involved with the main plot, that being the mysterious rot that's affecting the tree near the school, who time has an obvious history with. A history we as the audience don't know yet, but we're interested to learn more about. Information currently held close to her chest by time. And so Parsley, who is naturally kind and likable, is the perfect window for the audience into what time's troubles are. Because just as Parsley is easily liked by the fictional characters within the show, she is also easily liked by the audience. We see her be kind not only to named characters, but also to small animals. We see her have her own passions and interests she works hard on. We see her be inventive and resourceful. We see how she reacts to when problems are put in her way and how she navigates that. We see she has a range of emotions like sadness and anger, so she's not merely the happy one. However, we also see her personal struggles, which are extremely relatable. She has ambitions and dreams, but they are in conflict with what her family want. And her family aren't horrible, abusive monsters, they're people she loves more than anyone. So it's not easy for her to just chase her dreams and forget about them. All of this is a hundred times more interesting than Sage, whose biggest conflict so far has to do with the fantasy settings magic system, which continues to be ill-defined and poorly explained, making her problems frustrating to try and understand. And although her worries about her parents' approval is relatable, it's poorly executed and results in making Sage look very ungrateful as well as making her a downer to be around as an audience member. And as for Rose, I complained a lot previously on how Rose gets constant flashbacks to her mother being gone and her being sad about this, but while we were watching this, my friend nailed down what the problem is. Rose has to remind us about her mother so often because it's a substitute for having a personality. Think about it. What do we know about Rose as a character? She's energetic, optimistic, and likes to hit things with swords. She's also illustrated by the show itself as not being very bright. This doesn't have to be a writing problem or make her uninteresting, however. Just because a character isn't very smart doesn't mean their problems have to be shallow or uncomplicated. In theory, Rose's problems are complicated. Her mother, who meant the world to Rose, went missing and Rose is trying to live up to her legacy as a guardian. However, nothing is ever done with this groundwork other than to remind us that Rose is sad about her mother being gone. And the reason I bring it up every time it happens is because the fact that Rose is sad about this is never developed any further. We don't learn more about Rose's feelings about her mother's disappearance other than she's sad. And never in the show is her desire to be a guardian explored. She wants to be a guardian because she likes hitting things with swords. That's it. She's not trying to become a guardian because she thinks it could help her connect with her mother who has left a massive hole in her life she doesn't know how to fill. She's not becoming a guardian out of a sense of duty, even if it might go against her true identity. She's not becoming a guardian out of a sense of unfulfilled justice against those who took her mother. She's becoming a guardian because she likes hitting things with swords. Being sad about her mother? Uh, that has nothing to do with it. That doesn't have to do with anything, really. It's the only part of a character which isn't purely one-dimensional, and yet it also is never developed beyond that surface-level sadness. So then I need to ask the question. Why is Rosemary the main character? What about her personality or her story makes her being the central focus of all the events in the show warranted? And these are questions I would not ask if it weren't for the fact that the show is actively giving us other characters who not only do display personal stories that are more interesting to explore and get invested in, but who are also directly tied to the main plot, which Rose is not. And you might be saying, Oh, but Rosemary is going to be Time's friend too eventually, but no, no, not really. The only reason Time becomes part of Rosemary's friend group is because Time is friends with Parsley. Which is another reason Parsley is the best equipped to be the main character. 
She is the glue that holds all four main characters together. Sure, Sage and Rosemary are friends, but Time isn't friends with Rose or Sage outside of Parsley, nor does Sage or Rose care about Time. If anything, Time is often shown in a way where she could be more of a rival or in some cases straight up antagonist towards Sage and Rose. Parsley is the eye of the friend group. She is easily likable, her problems are both complex as well as universally relatable, and her friendship with Time directly ties her to the main plot, as well as motivates her to help solve the problem based not only on the fact that it's something dangerous, but because her friendship with Time gives her a personal investment. Parsley being written as well as she is actively hurts Rosemary as the main character, as it puts a spotlight on how uninteresting Rose is, as well as, as how unlikable Sage is, which is a growing problem and will continue to be a problem as I move on to other episodes. Back to this episode, one of Parsley's brothers manages to climb up to the roof. Without a need to think about it, Parsley and Time fall into perfect harmony to rescue him, with Flora jumping in to help her daughter. Back with our main characters, Sage has finally been placated with the Terror Sphere. She also finally opens up to her cousins as to why she's been acting strange. Mom would be so angry. She despises new magic. She doesn't want me to use it. Then why did she send you to this academy? Sage has a full-on meltdown about how everyone makes fun of her at school and how her mom would be furious with her using a Terra Sphere, but also she feels weirdly drawn to this one and that they seem to have a bond of some kind. Her cousins tell her that if her mom gets upset about this, they'll take responsibility as bad influences. But also it would be very hypocritical because when Anise and Sage's mom were kids living in witch country, Sage's mom had a rebellious phase as it were. Also, yes, there's a place called Witch Country where Sage's family is from and it's literally just named Witch Country. Sage calms her form and finally decides to accept the Terror Sphere. Aloe conjures food from the ether again and Rose opens up her cake locker to remind the audience that her mom is missing and Rose is sad about it. That evening, Time has a tense goodbye with her mother. It seems whatever has driven them apart has not completely ruined their relationship as Flora is willing to give Time space and Time seems to second guess her desire to lash out. Parsley has some words with her mom in private. She seems resigned that her parents will insist she stay home, but her mother says that after seeing how brave she was in saving her brother and that although they only realized how much they relied on her after she was gone, that it's not Parsley's job to raise the family on her own. She tells Parsley that both parents support her fully, and Parsley in turn offers to come visit on the weekends, which she's not busy with school, to help out a little. But that's not your job. You've given us so much, and the least we can do is support you. Mom. Don't you cry, or I'll start crying, and we'll wake your sister up. Am I feeling an emotion? <laughs> episode 5 The episode starts with Sage practicing with her new staff instead of her traditional broom. It goes about as well as expected. Luckily, time is there to stop her from breaking an arm. Just trying out my new Terra Sphere, but I can't control it yet. You know how it is. Not really. I don't mess with that shit. God, see, that's what I'm talking about. Look at that. That is how language should be, Sega. Time is hanging out by the corrupted tree, which we haven't seen since the end of episode 3, so we're probably going to get some progress on the main plot this episode. Oh, and I haven't mentioned it, but they've got two more cats in their dorm room now that apparently don't belong to any of them. They barely mention this and seem completely unconcerned, which... To be fair, if my dorm at school came with free cats, I wouldn't question it too much either. After the intro, we cut to a botany class that reminds me of the class in Hogwarts where their very first lesson was dealing with mandrakes whose screams could kill you if you hear them. There's a very small but nice second of footage where Time touches one of the trees and smiles to herself. I like it. Time not being very talkative forces the writers to communicate more about her through actions rather than her just saying her motivations. 
Anyway, the crazy lady who turned everyone into animals in an earlier episode tries to murder a student to prove how dangerous these plants are, before she kills a live mouse by having the plants melt it like she's a serial killer or something. I'm not so much upset at her killing a mouse because nature is cruel sometimes, but more that she's doing this for the sole purpose of traumatizing her students. And also that none of the students seem too upset about this. I went to high school with a girl who would burst into tears if the other students swatted a bee. I can't imagine a class of 14 year olds being cool with the teacher killing a mouse in front of them. Try not to lose an arm. <gasps> Guardians mustn't worry about their limbs. The class gets divided into groups and Sage, Time and Amaryllis end up at a table together. Not that Time cares too much, she's busy trying to progress the main plot by writing down her findings on the rot. Meanwhile, the PE teacher tells his class they have an essay due. I legit can't understand what the topic is because of how the voice actor mumbles the line. Five pages on Gwenner's axe. Any questions? He teams the students up, but since Amaryllis is in botany class, Snapdragon gets paired with Rosemary and Parsley, much to his annoyance. I wasn't a big fan of Snap's voice at first, but it didn't take too long for it to grow on me, to the point where eventually it's one of my favorite performances in the show. See, unlike Rosemary, Sage and Parsley and Time, who all sound as you'd expect animated main characters in the show to sound, Snapdragon's voice is very quiet, kind of nasally, brittle and completely lacking in enthusiasm. In other words, it's one of the best performances for a 14 year old I have ever heard. <sighs> Whatever. I do think this is based more on the actor being cast to play herself essentially and not exactly a display of good range. But for the purposes of this character in this show, it's perfect. Julia Kay is actually good at emoting too but we'll get to that in a later episode. Anyway moving on, we're back at botany class. Sage asks if she can use old magic to prune the plants instead and the teacher asks why? What exactly makes new magic new? I, I actually started writing down extremely basic questions here like how long has new magic been in use to still be referred to as new magic and old magic instead of like modern magic and traditional magic but it made my brain hurt and we both know that there are no answers to these questions. They just they didn't bother with the world building. I don't know why I bother asking these things anymore. With new magic you can do anything! <laughs> so we have Sage arguing points which we, the 2020s audience, understand as probably being correct because we understand concepts like sustainable resources. And whereas this teacher, who should probably not be allowed near children, is arguing in favor of opulence and the ability to do anything without cost, Sage is arguing things like planting trees and thanks after drawing magic from the earth. And she says all of this as we pan over time's notes. It makes you think that this argument of all the new magic they keep bringing up is gonna play into the main plot, which is also why Sage's character arc is so focused on that conflict. The teacher tells Sage that she can do what she wants, but says that history has proven that those who don't adapt are doomed to obsolescence. Which is kinda true to a point. Adaptation is not really necessary unless there is pressures to adapt. If there's no need to adapt, then well, you don't need to adapt. Did you know leather burnishes have been found among Neanderthal remains and are identical to the modern bone versions we still use today? Sorry, you activated my hyperfixation by mentioning history. Sage struggles to prune her murder flowers using her old magic well after everyone else had already finished and left class. Amaryllis, annoyed to be sitting and waiting, says she'll just do it for her. Time, still engrossed with her book, distractedly mentions she doesn't want to miss lunch period. This upsets Sage. Uh, you could help me, Time. I know you know how. Um, didn't Amaryllis just offer to help? Also, wow, Sage. Ever hear of asking? Anyway, Amaryllis just does it for her, which annoys Sage, who didn't want to do it the easy way, and how old magic is sacred. Amaryllis asks her so what part of making them miss lunch because one person in a group insisted on using a different methodology when everyone else had already completed their part of the assignment is sacred. 
time, closing her book, agrees with the lunch pot. Sage, unable to come up with a logical rebuttal, changes tactics to emotional manipulation and runs off crying. Quick tip, if you have a character argue against your main character's logic to a point where you as a writer have no counter-argument, it's not a good look to have your main character switch to saying how much the person they're arguing with is hurting their feelings. It just makes your main character look manipulative and wrong. She mm -hmm. was conducting human experiments, Mary. I wouldn't do that. Every sick person who walks through your front door is an experiment because you are not qualified. Yay! Oh my god! Oh my, oh my god. goodness Jacob. gracious! What does this Jacob. To you? you finally pay attention to me? Go ahead, chastise him, he's right. How many people died because of misdiagnoses and bad medication? I liked you better when you acted like I didn't exist. No, shut the fuck up, he's way better. He's still yeah, he is way better. God for you. There is a bizarre moment here where Amaryllis tells Time that she was the one who made Sage cry by being blunt, and that Amaryllis respects that and even calls her brutal. For a reminder, this is what Time said that made Sage cry. Sweating into plants instead of going to lunch? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah? Uh, yes. <laughs> so now not only is Sage being manipulative, but so is the narrative. Great. Meanwhile, the teacher is feeding live mice to the plant for no other reason than she seems to enjoy it and threatens to do it to one of the cats. Why is this here? Are we supposed to find it funny? The scene is structured like a joke, but where exactly is the part I'm supposed to find it funny? Haha, <laughs> this teacher is casually killing small animals for her own amusement, you mouth. Back with the others, we learn their essay is about something called Gwer... I, I want to say Gwemer. <laughs> um, Gwerner's Axe. This is great for Rosemary, who likes weapons, and Parsley, who's a blacksmith. But Snapdragon is a bit out of his element uninterested in the assignment and unhappy with being grouped with Rosemary and Parsley. He finally loses it when Rosemary can't stop talking about Sage. While they get into an arm wrestling match, Time shows up and awkwardly asks for help. It seems she's been looking for Sage to apologize for saying the word yeah, but can't find her. Sage hides in a random classroom to cry, but it's already being used as a designated cry space by Parnell. Parnell says that their cousin Cal has a tendency to be mean to them. The two of them decide to talk about their personal problems to each other, since Parnell says talking should help, although they're not really sure how. Sage complains about how she doesn't know how to use her new terror sphere, and how everyone here only uses new magic and she's scared her mom will disown her if she finds out. Which is a very valid fear and would absolutely stress me out to the point of tears too. Parnell points out that they're terrible at geography, but they're still at the school. Huh. Greg is very supportive. Whenever I study geography, Greg is there, also being bad at geography. Sage decides to practice some more, this time with Parnell as support, since Parnell can't really do magic either. Which also makes me wonder if Sage is having such a bad time with the magic classes at the school, but Pernell doesn't do magic and is clearly not a warrior. Are there not more specialized fields here? Or is it literally you either kill stuff or do magic? Why am I bothering to ask when we know there are no answers? Oh. Well, it was a thought. Let's try other thoughts. Slime Boy shows up, also wanting to use the designated cry classroom. He's not upset, he's just a bard and apparently has a crying song he wanted to practice. He says something to Sage about diagrams, but good luck trying to understand him. I have to demonstrate it a lot at the store. Here, here, hold on. I'll draw you a diagram. While you do that, Sage, can I talk? I think it's my turn. Meanwhile, the rest of the gang are helping Time look for Sage. Well, Parsley is helping time. Rosemary and Snapdragon are arguing about weapons, while Snap is writing the draft for the essay using Parsley's outline. Amaryllis shows up looking for Snapdragon and, happy to see time again, joins the search party. I'm bored, so I'm joining your failure break. Fine, everyone can come. Just shut up. Everyone, shut up. Back with the others. Good to see Sage make good on that whole it's Parnell's turn to talk about their problems thing. 
I guess it's only important when it's about Sage. She tries to do another spell and accidentally traps Parnell, Greg and Slime Boy in a bubble. Good job. Uh, this is like a dream I once had about hygiene. I'm making so many best friends today. Sage then spawns infinite grogs in the bubble, the noise attracting the rest of the gang. I thought you were Amaryllis' new puppet. Ew, I didn't even say anything mean. <laughs> I have an idea. Hmm, why doesn't your best friend Amaryllis fix this? Oh, I see. We don't have a rebuttal to that, so we're just gonna ignore that comment. Shut up, Sage. Parsley makes time apologize for saying the word yeah, and this feeds Sage's ego enough for her to fix the problem she caused. Rose writes the conclusion to the essay, time apologizes to Sage again, and I want to remind everyone this episode started with time saving Sage from getting hurt, but apparently abstractly agreeing with someone Sage dislikes is a much bigger problem. Words are more important than actions. Got it. It isn't the best. We did it! Sharpest duo in weapons theory. Shing, shing. Oh, the essay was about weapon theory. Drinking hot cocoa, sharing our secrets. Happy cause I'm with you. Originally, I didn't have any notes for this episode because so little happens in it. But this episode is a lot more frustrating upon a rewatch. And yet, I also completely understand why I didn't have anything to say about it originally, because this episode is the most filler any of the episodes have been so far. And every single episode out of the five we've had have felt like filler. The only reason I didn't skim this one as much as I could have is because I wanted to bring focus to how Sage's character is written, not just in this episode, but consistently up until this point. The show is trying hard to write Sage's struggle with new magic as the central core to everything we've watched so far, but it could not have been a worse decision in my opinion. In episode 3 we were given the first glimpse of a main plot, but we have completely left that introduction of a story so that we can instead focus on Sage's struggle with the magic system, which we as the audience have had no proper explanation of. We get snippets of info here and there, but it all boils down to very basic lip service. New magic is easy, old magic is hard. We don't even really get any details as to why Sage is struggling outside of her not being immediately good at new magic, as she's unfamiliar with it. And because we the audience don't know anything about either magic system, we're basically left to sit back and just watch her without any way for us to relate or even really understand what the problem is. On top of this, Sage's behavior only makes her unlikable. We as the audience are already frustrated by being left out of the loop with the magic system and restless because we know there's a main plot our characters aren't aware of. So seeing Sage be emotionally manipulative to those around her instead of getting on with the story makes the audience full out antagonistic towards her for wasting our time and not even being fun to watch. Meanwhile, Rose is a non-factor in the story so far. Not only does she have even less to do with the main plot than Sage does, but because she's written as a dense, fight-focused, genki main character, she can't emotionally relate to Sage's struggles and has no deeper complexity to make her interesting on her own. And no, being sad because her mom is missing every now and then is not a complexity when it doesn't affect the way she thinks or behaves, other than when the script wants to remind us of it. She's a character completely divorced from anything in the story, be it the main plot or the other characters. This leaves her with absolutely nothing to do in this episode except actively ignore the essay her group is trying to write. This episode as a whole was extremely frustrating to try and recap. Apart from some time given to side characters like Parnell, Snapdragon and Amaryllis, this episode is quite frankly worthless. Basically, old magic is dumb. Episode 6 We start the episode with Professor Carraway giving a lecture about divination using rooms in a typical Woo, look at all this foreshadowing we're doing. But that's not really important because a new student is introduced. No, just kidding. This is actually Esther and Rosemary immediately crushes on him. This is the most shocking thing in the entire series so far because... I genuinely thought Rose and Sage were girlfriends. After the intro, we cut to PE, which is being held in, um, 
Americans call this a gymnasium, right? We, we just had RPE outside. Anyway, they have to do weapons practice using physical weapons. No terror spheres or magic allowed. But enough of that. We have high school teenage relationships to talk about. My favorite. When Rose draws her mother's sword, Asta comes over to ask if it's a replica. When Rose admits it's not and is actually the real flowering thorn and that Lavender is her mother, everyone is super impressed, especially Aster. This is another big shocking twist because I can't believe Rose, who never shuts up about her mom because it's her substitute for having a personality, hasn't told everyone around her that her mother is Lavender, her mother is missing, and that Rose is sad about it. I would say it's a writing contrivance, so she could reveal that information here, but no- Are they giving Amaryllis an axe? <laughs> I feel alive! Oh my god. All I need is a miracle. All I need is you. Whoever it was on the writing team that decided Amaryllis needed a double-headed axe as her weapon of choice, what is it like having a brain that large? This is actually an important moment, uh, not really for Amaryllis getting an axe, although that is my primary focus, but because Snapdragon has his father's axe swapped with Amaryllis's rapier. This is the first mention and insight we get into Snapdragon's home life, and although it's not super subtle in terms of Snapdragon isn't the kind of person to wield an axe, it is subtle in that we hear the large axe Snap can't really use belongs to his father, which is the sole reason Snap feels like he has to use it, even though it does not work for him whatsoever. I... I should stick with the axe. Snapdragon. It can be painful to let go of the identity others expect you to manifest. But what of your legacy, young guardian? This is actually really good character writing. It tells us so much about Snapdragon as a character, as well as giving insight into his backstory, motivations, and inner conflicts. Without, say, a series of flashbacks after which our characters look sad and then their friends tell them why their backstory is sad. Anyway, back to the no man's. Sage and I are on the same page for once, in that she's already tired of seeing Rose make eyes at Esther. Seriously? What? Parsley has no time for a drawn out will they won't they thing and tells Rose to just go talk to him. And when Rose freaks out at this idea, Parsley just shoves her towards him so we can get this over with. Luckily for Rose, Esther seems really interested in her sword. Not enough to get her name right, but enough to talk to her, and I guess that's good enough for a 14 year old girl. I guess. I don't know. This is not exactly something I can relate to, to be honest. We learn that apparently Rose's sword is enchanted, which means the metal itself can never break. Which makes that earlier episode where we had to sit through the broken hilt all the more infuriatingly pointless. Not that it matters though, this plot point is never used or mentioned again. This will end well. Displeased with her friend not spending every waking moment with her, Sage asks Parsley and Time if they think Aster is cute because she doesn't see the attraction. And boy, if you're not a fan of Sage being pissy about Rose spending time with someone who isn't her, this episode is gonna get under your skin really bad. There is only one surefire way to get over a crush. Spend time with them. Luckily, everyone else in this episode is written really well. A guy tried talking to me during lunch once and an entire clam fell out of his mouth. That's when I knew. Uh, nothing. Clams are bad. Don't look at me. Snapdragon sees Sages away from the constant presence of Rosemary and gathers up his courage to speak to her for once. After hearing Sages annoyed at Rose for, um, talking to someone, Snapdragon asks if she'd like to spar with him. It's just, the guy showed up like five minutes ago. Touché. Huh? <laughs> please, please look at the acting on this character. I'm weeping. The PE teacher has everyone gather in a circle, which kind of backfires when Sage drags Rose to stand next to her and Amaryllis grabs Snapdragon when they get paired with the person opposite them in the circle for an obstacle course. Unsurprisingly for the narrative, Rose gets paired with Aster, Sage with Snapdragon, 
Parsley and Parnell and Emeritus gets to hang out with Time, who she actually really likes, much to Time's dismay. Anyway, obstacle course Time. Nothing, uh, just doing that all <laughs> classic team activity of saying your teammate's name. Yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> Rhubarb. End my suffering. Sage is still complaining about Rose, although mostly because she's worried Rose is gonna fall flat on her face for not paying attention, which, okay, valid concern. Snapdragon is trying his best not to be too obvious with his infatuation with Sage and doing a horrible job of it. Um, um, hey, where's your hat? I'm experimenting with not wearing it all the time. <laughs> it looks good, and, and it's nice to see your hair. <laughs> mm, stop. Okay, see, this is the kind of flirty banter I am 100% behind. Luckily, this whole thing where Rose and Aster's interactions are some of the worst secondhand cringe ever, while Snapdragon and Sage are kind of genuinely cute, is intentional by the writers in this case. So although I'm complaining about it a lot, it is doing exactly what it's trying to. We're not supposed to enjoy seeing Rose and Aster together, but we are supposed to like Snapdragon, even though up until now, he's been acting as the mean girl's lackey. And so far, this episode on its own is really good at making him endearing. The obstacle course starts, and we get to see that, despite looking like this, Aster kind of... um... sucks. Rose, on the other hand, doesn't, and despite Sage's concern, has to save Aster's ass, which keeps her from messing up. Parsley and Parnell go up against this put-in-the-pendulum acrobat thing. <laughs> Parnell! <Please. sighs> Jump, Parsley! How did you know you'd bounce? I didn't. But in general, I don't believe in oblivion. Parnell? Are you okay, my dude? Amaryllis and Time are in the hedge maze, although they soon split up. Sage and Snapdragon are also in the hedge maze, but accidentally trigger the worst and most torturous trap any magical trial could possibly have. A slider puzzle. Sage is still complaining about Rosemary, and it's gotten to the point where even Snapdragon is getting tired of hearing about it. <sighs> you wouldn't get this. You're a guy. I understand friendship. Guy friendship is different. It isn't the same. Guys don't talk about their feelings. Um, excuse me? Meanwhile, Rosemary is starting to pendulum at the, um, pendulum pit on being bored and infatuated. Esther continues to kind of suck. He also still doesn't get her name right. Parsley and Parnell go through the thorn maze with actual literal corpses in it, which is kind of concerning? Are these Halloween decorations meant to scare the kids? Are these students who failed the class and the PE teacher just never bothered to rescue them? Is this like a Pirates of the Caribbean thing where they just used real skeletons as decoration? Who knows? Time and Emeralus meet back up in the maze. Turns out the maze is magic and trying to brute force your way through it kind of pisses it off. Trapping me, you bastard! <laughs> Unfortunately, we have to cut back to Sage and Snapdragon, where Sage is, you guessed it, bitching about Rose and Esther. But Rose could do so much better. I know what she needs, and it's not him. <sighs> Remember, Sage only had to endure Rose actually talking to Esther for like, what, 10 minutes tops? Anyway, Snapdragon has moved past annoyance and is just straight up done with Sage's bullshit. What if Amaryllis was going on and on about Aster all day? I'd be happy for her. She usually just talks about murder. Amaryllis continues to be the best character even when she's not on screen. Rose and I are girls. You and Amaryllis are a different story. In any case, guys just don't understand that the bond between girls is just deeper. Wow, Sage. Wow. Insisting and perpetuating the belief that men don't form emotional bonds as deeply as women do? There's a word for that. Now, now what, what was it again? Oh, and if you think Snapdragon being reduced to tears as Sage coldly tells him that since he's a boy he doesn't understand emotional connections is bad, don't worry. It gets worse. It gets so much worse. But 
Doing our best to ignore this train wreck of an interaction, Sage solves the puzzle and we cut back to Rose and Aster. Rose is seriously getting tired of Aster's stupidity and belittling her because she's the girl and he's the hero or something something gender roles. It's like you Tina, but stupid! Parnell figures out the weird wall climbing roller thing and they and Parsley finish the course first in class. Meanwhile, Time and Amaryllis are still trying to solve the maze, this time without hacking the hedges as much, despite Amaryllis' bloodlust. Time tries to learn a little bit more about Amaryllis as a human being, and not just a mean girl cliché. Amaryllis starts saying how her parents spent most of their time travelling and how she's been raised by nine different au pairs. Time interrupts, not wanting to hear Amaryllis go into a big trauma dump on how she trade all her money to have more time with her parents when Time is still trying to figure out her own parental issues. But... <laughs> Are you kidding? I'd rather eat rocks than listen to my mother go on about her affair. Wait, do you mean affairs like me? Oh, <laughs> she's a lush who never met a deckhand she didn't deck with her hands. <laughs> <laughs> Parsley and Parnell return to the PE teacher, who congratulates them on finishing first and wants to award Parsley the trophy for doing so. Parsley argues that they finished the course together, but the PE teacher says he's been tallying up scores since the beginning of class before the teams, which seems weird? Is this weird? This is weird, right? Parsley asks if he can just dock her some points or something so Parnell can win, but not unless she brutally assaults someone, that's not gonna happen. It's okay, Parsley. My psyche is pretty pliable. Back with Sage and Snapdragon, they spot Rose yelling at Esther in the distance and are both happy that it seems Rose has gotten over her crash. Snapdragon is finally free from Sage's bitching. Snapdragon, I'm sorry. I was flipping out all day about Rosemary. For nothing. And I took it all out on you. Hey. If you ever want to talk about the heavier stuff... Yes, please. I could really... There's some stuff I could... I could really... <sighs> Fuck me. This is actually really cute. Also, I will begrudgingly give Sage some credit here that she doesn't just apologize for complaining about Rose all day, but also asserts that she knows Snapdragon cares about his friends. She doesn't apologize for being a raging sexist, but it's better than nothing, I guess. I can't expect her to have her warped opinion corrected just because she made one person cry. Anyway, since we've run out of drama, everyone escapes the hedge maze with no real fanfare whatsoever. And Rose reunites with Sage. Esther starts complimenting Rose to the rest of the class, telling everybody how good she is at the obstacle course. However, now that Rose isn't infatuated with him anymore, she tells him she's not really interested in hanging out. Now, I was with Esther complimenting Rose, but the second she makes noises that she's not interested, he immediately flips and calls her a stuck-up. Oh, he's one of those guys. Anyway, Parsley breaks his foot for calling Rose stuck up after complimenting her to the whole class. May I remind you, Sage got absolutely zero repercussions for stereotyping Snapdragon based on his sex and gender, but Aster calls Rose stuck up and Parsley physically assaults him. Gender equality. Anyway, the PE teacher laughs off his students physically assaulting each other, but more importantly, he doxes Parsley's points, which means... Parnell, you are champion! <laughs> and let's all be honest, that's the real happy ending here. Guys, I'm gonna be perfectly honest, I, I think I liked this episode. Don't get me wrong, Sage being horribly sexist and bitching about her best friend having independent thoughts and emotions is infuriating. But it's the kind of infuriating I've been expecting to see based on the show's reputation. But even when Sage is being horrible and annoying, she and Snapdragon are disgustingly cute together. Sage's scenes are made infinitely better by having Snapdragon be her partner. And this is completely Snap's best episode so far giving him a ton of depth through very subtle means. 
allowing him to express his opinions and feelings, sometimes through words and other times through actions, and even helping give Sage some humanity. Parsley and Parnell, despite being sidelined for most of this, are really funny, and seeing Parsley asking to get points redacted so Parnell can win just because they clearly wanted more is another point to Parsley being just a genuinely nice person. Parnell is wonderfully weird. Time, although surly as always, gives some great blunt one-liners that often echo what the audience is feeling. And Amaryllis gets her own share of backstory and development, while just being full of chaotic joy and distraction. Rosemary and Esther aren't the most fun to watch, but we barely focus on them really, and the interactions they do have on screen are at least supposed to be awkward and painful to sit through. This is also the first episode that had me genuinely cracking up at some of the shit the characters say. Look, the show is not exactly good, but at this, the halfway point of the entire show, it is at least as bad as people say it is, but also not as bad as people say it is. I do feel like we're forgetting something though. Oh well, probably nothing. Hopefully the episodes continue like this. Maybe it was just a rocky start, and most people gave up before the show managed to get its footing, and that's why it's got the reputation it does. But at least despite some stumbling, it looks like it's on the right path now. I can't wait to see where it goes from here. Episode 7 we start with the city of Lingoth cheering for some of the High Guardian Academy students as they set off on a quest. I do like that we see Parsley's entire family cheering her on. That's nice growth from the home life situation we saw in episode 4. Time points out the cheering from the town is more making fun of the new students and trying to psych them out by telling them how dangerous their cave they're going to is more than anything else. Also, who is this? At first I thought she was just a background character, but she's consistently in every shot of the opening sequence, has a speaking role where she's getting more and more scared of the upcoming test, and has even stolen Snapdragon spot next to Amaryllis, which seems really out of character considering how rabid Amaryllis is about guarding Snaps' um, minion status. Also don't worry if you're confused about what the scary test actually is, because apparently nobody informed the students either. Townsfolk always come out to freak out the first years. Imagine if your entire city threw a parade for the sole purpose of trying to give you a nervous breakdown about your upcoming exam as you walk to school. You've heard the legends, all of Redbug's clothes are from students who plunge to their death. <laughs> Why is this woman a teacher? Anyway, the triad over here have some meaningless exposition explaining to the audience in great detail that the students are scared. I'm not kidding, they have the headmaster literally explain to us why the students we just saw be nervous about the potentially deadly exam are nervous. This would be shameless exposition dumping, but here they're doing it for the sole purpose of making sure the audience knows that the students are scared, because we're too dense to figure out that ourselves I guess. I'm sorry, I know I'm sounding hypercritical so early in the video and we only just started, but there's already just a lot. And also, I've watched this episode and I know what's about to come. Boring! I miss the days when we used to just throw them in lava. After the intro, our group of students reach the cave they're going to do the challenge in and are briefed by the ethics teacher. The students are to be grouped up and the first thing we learn is if a group fails the challenge, they will be expelled. Not, they will have failed the year or anything like that. Expelled. But why? Anyway, this is the last straw for Zinnia. She completely snaps and asks why they're being sent into a cave with monsters and who knows what else, and why anyone thinks this is a good idea. When nobody can give a better answer other than because we want to be guardians, she nopes out and leaves. We never see this character again. <sighs> Okay, so this isn't that important, but it really bothered me when I watched this episode for the first time. Why on earth did you bother giving this character so much attention at the start of the episode show? This would indicate that this character we've never seen before is going to have some level of primary focus in the episode of the day plot. But instead, you spend all that time building her up as a plot piece just to immediately remove her from the episode, with her having no major impact on anything in this episode's story. 
You could have had the scene where she freaks out and quits and not have had a single scene in the opening sequence. You didn't even need to show her and nothing would have been different. It's such a bizarre and bungled handling of basic storytelling that this moment in particular just really grinds my gears for some reason. This hasn't been as big a problem in the last few episodes, but once again, this show comes back to doing what it does best, wasting time on meaningless nonsense that contributes nothing. For the record, I find cowardice and others very attractive. These maps show the caves and corridors down to level 3, where you will find the spring of healing waters. Below level 3, the risk level exceeds your training. Questions? Yeah, I have one. Which video game was the main writer of this episode obsessed with when they wrote this? Because this is some bullshit gamer-style MacGuffin hunting if I've ever heard it. At least Time is awake this episode and asks if the healing water could heal, let's say, a tree. The teachers just kind of shrug and go, yeah sure, why not? Which makes me wonder what exactly they want this healing water for. But then I put the brakes on my own thoughts because as we all know by now, these are things none of the writers bothered to think about. Time needs water to heal the tree, which was presented as the main plot. And it just so happened, one of the school's tests will provide her with the solution to fixing the singular tree at the edge of the school grounds. Will it be useful in the larger plot? I have no idea, mostly because the larger plot has so far not bothered to show up yet. The gang set off to follow their school appointed map to their fountain, but Parsley says she knows a faster way to get there. Somehow. Don't question it, don't question it, there are no answers, don't make sense out of nonsense. They almost instantly reach a fountain underneath a forest, but it's dried up. Rose tries the universal solution of banging on it, but all she manages to do is get the group attacked by a swarm of Travers. Swords! Nature as hell sticks. They'll fucking slice a baby in half. I have no idea why this fight is so violent. So far this show has been PG at best, aside from time saying shit in one episode. It's like that for mature audiences only warning at the start was forgotten only for the show to suddenly go, oh right, this is supposed to be for adults, not children. Despite every single thing about it so far being represented as being for children. And decided to try and course correct by adding copious amounts of blood in a fight scene. Bright red blood from insects mind you, which just feels weird to me. Not because it's blood, I don't actually care about that. It's just weird to see insects bleed red. This whole sequence just feels so contrived and artificial if you ask me. Anyway, Rose gets a bad cut from the Trevor Queen. The group runs away into a side passage that gets blocked by falling rocks. They don't have a map for level 3 of the cave, whatever that means, and so decide to just try and figure a way out. Sage doesn't want to leave without completing the quest because she doesn't want to get expelled, which actually fits in with her character of constantly being anxious about her school performance. Time agrees because she wants to use the healing water for the tree. Rose doesn't mention she's been wounded, which is annoying, but I'll let this one slide since the characters are obviously very focused on not failing and I can at least understand a stupid character like Rose making the choice to hide a serious injury because she doesn't want to jeopardize the test. The group is confused as to why Travers would be aggressive, but figure it might be due to the well in that area being dry. You'd think the rot might be used as a plot device here to show how it can corrupt things that aren't trees, but the show didn't think of that. They keep walking and find a section of the cave set up to look like, I don't know, what would you call this? Generic storybook fantasy room? It makes me think of a scene from a random Jack and the Beanstalk room where Jack finds um the singing harp. It doesn't have a function, it's just generic fantasy room. They find another fountain adjourned with the image of a woman who would turn her suitors into wine and then drink them, which is kind of metal, but also I continue to ask why every single character in this show is a sociopath. I miss the days when we used to just throw them in lava. <laughs> that cave has barely swallowed up a bushel of kids. This well is dry as well though. As they turn to leave, Rose finally goes down for the count. 
The following scene as the others try to help is really weird and uncomfortable. It's clear the writers wanted the scene to really show how serious the wound is and how dire the situation is by having all three of the other characters jump into action to help and have Sage appropriately freak out. But then they have Rose herself speak drunkenly about not getting what's going on. It's like they're trying to undercut the seriousness with comedy while also playing up how serious this is. They should have just had Rose stay quiet or something because the tone here is very, very confused. That's right. No map. Can someone of you tell me where the most magical fountain is? I do like that Sage immediately gives up on the idea of the quest and says she doesn't care if they get expelled, she just wants Rose to get to safety. So that's a rare point in her favor. Anyway, Animal Rumpelstiltskin shows up to be annoying. Parsley does the smart thing and asks if he knows how to get to the healing fountain. When he starts on about riddles and nonsense, time threatens him with violence. We then have a long sequence of this character called Buckles giving them a riddle, turning on the fireplace and letting them know that if they get this riddle wrong, he'll eat them. They figure the riddle out almost instantly when Rose notices there are four shadows, meaning there are four buckles. And as a reward, he throws an egg at them and the four buckles start arguing over which one screwed up. All this while we have one of our main characters bleeding to death on the floor. What is this episode's tone? Anyway, Buckles drops them down the trapdoor and they continue on to a giant diamond cavern. Inside they find a stalactite dripping the magic healing water. I hate the sequence with Buckles so much. Just everything about it. The weird generic fantasy room inside a cave where everything is massive in scale, where a little bastard that looks like this lives to give it a riddle that's solved instantly as the tone of the episode shatters right in front of our eyes. Back to the diamond cavern, Sage feeds Rose some of the magic healing water and she's back to normal. Really glad this serious injury of one of our main characters was on screen for maybe 5 minutes at most before it was instantly fixed and didn't actually influence the plot in any way at all since they already were looking for the healing well anyway. So all of this was pointless. Anyway, Sage scooping out some of the healing water activates the room's guardian statues. While the others are distracted, Time fills a vial with the magic water before they regroup to figure out how to break something made out of diamond. Our weapons can't break diamonds! It's the hardest element. Only diamonds can crush diamonds. How do you know if a diamond is real? The first thing I want to ask you is please don't hit it with a hammer. It will break. A diamond is the hardest substance known to man but because it's so hard, it's also brittle. So they defeat the giant statues, but now they're trapped inside the cavern. Looks like we're all going to die here after all. This may sound like the usual funny one-liner from Time, but she, she's actually serious. The characters instantly accept death without one singular attempt to even think of a way out. And of course, this leads to the only logical thing you can do while you wait to starve to death in the forgotten cave. Play truth or dare. Why are we still here? Just to suffer. What is this episode's tone? I mean this both as a scream of frustration as well as an honest question posed to the writers. What exactly was your goal for a tone in this episode? Was it meant to be a more serious episode with higher stakes as you tried to set up at the start? Was it meant to push our characters into a more serious situation so they'd be forced to open up about themselves more? Was it supposed to be irreverent and purposefully dismissive of the overly serious situation to come across as edgy? Bullshit. Was it meant to be funny that our characters aren't taking a very serious situation seriously? Please, I, I just want to know what your target was so I can accurately figure out how bad your aim is. <sighs> so we play truth or dare because fuck it I guess. What's writing got to do with it? Oh wait, it's not called truth or dare because changing the name of meaningless time wasting is what this show thinks world building is. No one studies two weeks before school starts. Were you kissing someone? Uh, mayhaps a young mouth breather named Cybold Double Five. I've never kissed anyone. 
Sage uses her turn to make time compliment Rosemary, which is pretty manipulative, but then again, this is truth or dare, that's the point of the game really. And we're seven episodes in, and time is still not friends with Rose or Sage, so I guess we need to start getting on that if we have any hope of unifying the main group before the story's over. Time asks Parsley who her least favorite brother is. Hmm, I used to hate Thistle, but then Spurge almost drowned and Thistle saved him, and I knew I don't hate Thistle. I don't hate anyone. Ever. Rose? Okay, so the writers are aware of Parsley's main character traits as the core of the friend group, the one best at befriending others, and the one who could logically bring all four main characters together. So it's not that they're unaware of her character, they just chose not to use it. Cool, glad we got confirmation that it's not obliviousness, it's just incompetence. Anyway, Rose takes the opportunity to tell her friends that her mom is missing and that she's sad about it. For once in the show's history, however, it actually serves a purpose, as hearing Rosemary be sad about her mom encourages time to open up about her own family, and we finally, finally after seven episodes get some context and substance to the main plot. Time reveals that the rot has devastated the fairy woods, and that her mother had taken her and fled to Lingarth while her father stayed behind. Apparently her father and mother had a big fight before they left, and Time has not heard from him since. She entered the Guardian Academy to try and find a way to get back to her dad, and she was hoping the healing water might be an answer to undo the decay. Thanks for telling us. Ugh, I hate it when feelings come out of my face. It's okay. We're your friends. <laughs> and so, finally, we have our main core friend group. And it only took lying down and accepting death to do so. You know how I would have done this scene in a way that does not sabotage this episode's tone and get us at the exact same outcome here without making the characters doormats who just roll over and die when faced with hardship? Have the door get blocked off by the crumbling diamond statues and the group discover they can't get out. Have time get furious that after finally finding something which might actually save her home and reunite with her father, she now cannot escape. Have her angrily and hysterically try and find a way out of the cave, yelling about how this is not fair. The other characters try and calm her down and suggest they all look for a way out together only to have time snap at them that they have no idea what this means to her, and that they might all be here to play at being heroes, she's trying to save her dad. The other characters can act shocked at this outburst, and time, seeing their reaction, calms down enough to break and tearfully admit the situation with the rot and the fairy woods and all the backstory she's just given us. Then we have the exact same scene, have a consistent serious tone and re-establish the stakes, as well as showing our main female characters as being proactive and eager to find a solution to a problem, rather than have them just give up and wait for rescue or death without even trying. Seriously, the solution is so easy, and yet they somehow still found a way to fumble the setup in the worst way possible. Omedetou, omedetou, omedetou. As the characters fart around wondering why the other wells are dry, Parsley casually mentions they should try not to break the dragon egg. Apparently the others didn't realize that's what this thing Buckles gave them was. Learning it's a dragon egg, Sage dunks it in the healing water to make it into a full grown adult, because healing water excels growth? Look, I don't know, okay? Sage's meddling with the natural order has them now with a fully grown dragon freaking out in the diamond cavern trying to get out, which Sage somehow knew is what would happen. Just as she knew the healing water would turn an egg into a full grown adult I guess. The dragon digs out the rock slide and the group ride it out of the cave. Then the dragon slowly decays to bones like it's Skyrim or something and... I'm okay. <laughs> Bye, take care. You know what, fuck you. Time heals the tree, yay. Is the level of magic in the earth fading? I think so, and I plan to stop it. Oh look, it's the main plot we've been neglecting and... <laughs> what? Oh see, do not steal, cause it's hard to save the world when you've fallen in love. 
Okay, so now we need to take a detour into explaining the difference between reference, a parody, a homage, and just being creatively bankrupt. A reference is pretty straightforward. You have a show or a movie, you have a brief little thing which has zero impact on the story and isn't even acknowledged by the main characters too much and takes up zero extra screen time but is merely contained within an already functional scene. Simple. A parody is different. The definition of parody is something that exists as a representation of something else with exaggeration placed in a way that it brings the original source's ridiculousness or bad qualities to the forefront. In terms of parodying existing fictional media, there are generally two approaches. The first is parodying a very specific show, character, or iconic scene. This is the most common form of media parody. Of course, with this style of parody, you severely narrow your audience because you are operating under the belief that the person watching your story already has outsider knowledge of the work to understand why a parody is funny. Unlike some other Robin Hoods, I can speak with an English accent. I haven't seen any other Robin Hoods, so I don't understand the joke. I'm sorry which is something you don't really need to worry about with the other kind of parody. The other kind of parody, which I find to be the much more long-lasting and much more successful and interesting kind, is the parody of an entire genre within a singular work. For example... Blazing Saddles is not a parody of any specific singular western film. Instead, it makes a point of making a mockery of every upbeat Americana rugged dancing singing cowboy movie ever made this side of Italy by asking one simple straightforward question. Where are all the black people in these movies? Because you know where the black people are in these movies. Dock that chink a day's pay for napping on the job. Yes, sir. With one simple observation, the shiny, squeaky clean, dancing scene depiction of the Old West was destroyed forever. Although not solely Blazing Saddles' fault, Italy had been making waves with the grittier, dirtier, nastier version of the American West for about 10 years before Blazing Saddles came out, and El Topo somehow managed to exist. But it was Blazing Saddles that effectively ruined the American cowboy movie as it had existed up until then, forever. Because once you ask where are the black and Chinese people in this happy, sunny, fun western setting, you can never take that question back. Because even if you try, the audience is going to remember. This happened again with the movie Airplane that came out in 1980. Airplane, despite having some specific movie references within it, was a spoof of the entire 1970s disaster movie that had been massively popular until then. And, just like Blazing Saddles, killed the genre overnight. I just want to tell you both, good luck, we're all counting on you. When it comes to magical girls, a reference would be something like the Sailor Moon manga that can be seen in Steven Universe. A parody would be something like Papillon Rose as an entire show, or the scene in Megas XLR where they run into not Sailor Moon who does an overly long transformation sequence. Also, simply taking tropes and genre switching them doesn't automatically make something a parody. There's also just simple inspiration. The only thing that separates inspiration from blatant theft is to what level you let the inspiration influence your work. Just because you can tell where something got its inspiration from doesn't mean it's automatically a ripoff. Everything builds on everything else to a certain extent. Mad Max begat Fist of the North Star, which begat Berserk, which begat Final Fantasy VII. You can see the inspirations, but Final Fantasy VII is no more a ripoff of Berserk than Persona is a ripoff of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. So then we get to the one that is hardest to pull off, and that is homage. A homage is the opposite of a parody, in that it is an attempt within a work to pay tribute and respect to a previous work, usually within the same genre, but not always. I've seen a lot more instances with modern cartoons where they will copy something from a much better anime wholesale as a big emotional climax and then cover their asses by saying, it's a homage. But the thing is, these things are not homages. 
What these things are, if we are completely honest with ourselves and each other, are cartoon creators who worship someone else's work and desperately want to create something that can have a similar emotional impact on others. But instead of trying to cultivate its own impactful moment or visuals, the show directly copies that which it admires due to a lack of confidence that what the creators can craft themselves could match what they idolize. Or it's just incompetence, but honestly, that's actually very rare. And the annoying thing is, this works a lot of the time. Audiences are so starved of good content that caters to their tastes that they will eagerly eat up a copy of something else they like, simply because they are so ecstatic to find a cartoon that's even aware of their other interests. You're gonna look at me and you're gonna tell me that I'm wrong? Am I wrong? Okay, so what is a good example of a homage done properly then? If you've never seen the anime Recreators, it's a show where fictional characters from a wide range of genres and different mediums have somehow found themselves in the real world. Learning that their existence is essentially a complete lie cooked up by human beings no more important and far less impressive than themselves, the fictional characters quickly split into two groups depending on their personal philosophies regarding this less than ideal reality. One group are the bad guys made up of characters generally from darker media who feel their creators are monsters for deliberately creating such suffering and pain and effectively being responsible for everything that's gone wrong in their lives. Because fictional or not, those events were experiences they had to live through. And the other group are characters from more idealized media who come to better understanding and work through the reality of an individual person being responsible for everything that has happened in their lives. There are no direct parodies of existing characters and recreators, but more characters made up of tropes and genres the audience of anime would be able to identify without pointing and going, oh that's obviously supposed to be cloud strife. The characters who side with creators include, among others, Celestia from a light novel and anime, Ryu Kanoya from a mecha anime, Meteora from an open world RPG, and so on and so forth. And among the characters who decide to rise up against their creators is Magane from a series of horror light novels, Elisteria from a very berserk style manga, and Mamika Kirameki from an anime called Magical Slayer Mamika. Mamika's original show is something more along the lines of Precure more than Sailor Moon or Utina, a magical girl show squarely aimed at younger children. She is manipulated by the other characters into believing that people who create suffering must clearly be bad guys and should be forced to make their created stories happier. And since her original source material is written with very little nuance, it's easier for Mamika to be swayed into thinking this is a very black and white situation. Hurting people is bad, so they must be bad guys. But we don't have to kill them, we just need to get them to be nicer. Of course, the reason why the characters against the real world would want a magical girl as one of their group is obvious to anyone who's ever seen a magical girl fight. However, a big part of Recreators is how the characters operate in a similar fashion to the Fat Albert movie, in that the more time the fictional anime characters spend in the real world, the more complex and layered their personalities and way of thinking become. So although they may start as trope-specific representations of their genres, after a while they just become people. 
Eventually, Mamika comes to the conclusion that forcing their creators to change their stories or, more specifically, be killed for the inexcusable crimes of writing stories isn't justified. On top of this, she gains a very mature and adult perspective on not only both groups, but the individuals within those groups. Just because she feels the anti-creator group are doing something bad, doesn't mean she throws away the close friendship she's formed with Elisateria. But even with a more nuanced understanding of the real world, Mamika is still a magical girl. And magical girls exist not only to destroy evil, but to purify and heal wounded hearts and souls. Despite being possibly the singular most powerful character in the show, Mamika can't sway the leader of the anti-creator group and is killed. But just because she dies doesn't mean she failed. Her earnest desire to help the injured characters in the anti-creator group, her desire to meet everyone with love and understanding, and her undying belief in her friends is the catalyst for Elisateria, her closest friend, to rethink her perspective as a tortured victim. And it is because of Mamika's influence throughout the show up until this point that Elisataria is able to rethink her own trauma and see the injustice and pain the anti-creator group is inflicting on what are, at the end of the day, innocent people who only wish to tell stories that can inspire and comfort others. This is a magical girl homage. It doesn't directly reference any specific magical girl show, it isn't copying any specific outfits or attacks or weapons, nor is it copying any specific transformation sequence. But Mamika is a truly heartfelt homage to magical girls and their values, and it's very clear that the writers fully understood the magical girl genre at its core, beyond just being about cute girls who transform and shoot sparkles. So now let's circle back to High Guardian Spice. Also, welcome back if you skip the spoilers. I hope you enjoy Recreators, it's, it's one of my favorite shows. So this is Olive. She's the black cat we've been seeing hanging around the whole show so far who hasn't actually done anything. It turns out she's part of some or other shadowy group of bad guys who have been ordered to kill our main heroes. Something she says she's uncomfortable with. That coupled with the fact that she's a blatant Miuichigo recolor is all you need to guess that she's gonna have a face turn pretty soon. Uh, there's so much wrong with everything here, we're gonna have to take this in parts. First, Olive's design is Miuichigo. Or more specifically, her design is Tokyo Black Cat, which was the proto Tokyo Mew Mew manga, but I'm not sure the writers even knew about Tokyo Black Cat. So she's just a blatant Miuichigo recolor. Specifically Miuichigo, not just a random anime cat girl. The anime cat girl design is one I used to really really hate when I was younger, mostly because I didn't think it was good character design to just take an anime waifu and stick ears and a tail on her and claim it's somehow magically a good character design now. I've since changed my perspective however and these days I think anime cat girls are pretty good. <laughs> But with Olive, it's more than just adding ears and a tail. Cardcaptor Sakura actually has a catgirl outfit, which is one of her more popular dresses. But if you were to put her next to Olive, apart from ears and tail, there isn't much that's similar here. Same can be said if we look at Sailor Luna. These are clearly different designs despite also being magical cat girls. But when you put Olive next to Ichigo, yeah, there's no denying they copied the design here. Part of it is due to silhouette. Sakura's cat girl silhouette is very different to Olive's, with her large frilled shoulders, high collar, extra flourish by her skirt, and apron style front, which gives her a more triangular upper body shape. Olive and Ichigo, on the other hand, both have bare shoulders, a corset style top piece, a poofy bottom skirt or bloomers, and adornments around their wrists. Gloves in Ichigo's case, cuffs in Olive's case. Sakura is wearing long sleeves and leggings that break up her design into two very stark and opposing colors, whereas Olive and Ichigo are both beard skinned in exactly the same places. 
So even with different colors and a different skin tone and a different body type, there is no way you can look at these two next to each other and go, oh yeah, Olive is clearly designed from a place of originality. I think it's pretty sad that Kissy Cutie Mew Mew, who is supposed to be a parody of Tokyo Mew Mew, has a more original design than Olive does. Second, we are on episode 7. There has not been a single indication that an evil force even exists in this show beyond a brief mention in the intro theme song. Despite the show's complete disinterest in it, the main plot so far has been the rot. And sure, with Olive appearing here, we are led to understand that the bad guys are probably behind the rot, but the show has spent the majority of its time focusing in very, very hard on the old magic versus new magic debate. And so it should have been obvious that something about new magic, a magic described as giving immense power without cost, does in fact have some harmful side effects and payments, since we all know that you can't get something from nothing. There's always an equivalent exchange. And the more powerful something is, the higher its cost. But suddenly we have a floating orb of concentrated evil appear and demand a magical cat girl kill our main heroes, because they are, quote, closing in on the secrets of witch country, which good luck trying to figure out what that means. Because here we are, once again, at the question about world building this show never bothers to ask, let alone answer. We only know which country, as a briefly mentioned place Amaryllis is from, and Sage's family used to live in until who knows when, since she and Rosemary have been friends for forever apparently. So how exactly is which country tied up in all this? Does which country make Terraspheres? I don't even want to ask that question honestly, because in doing so I feel like I'm writing the story for the writers rather than have them doing their jobs. Also, I don't know that our main character is stumbling around for six episodes trying to do school stuff and then one test finding some healing water counts as homing in on the secrets of which country. My guy, they don't even know what the rot is. We don't even know what the rot is. We don't even know what which country is. How are we homing in on anything? It's a wet fart of an ending to what is the absolute worst episode in the entire show. And although it never gets quite this bad again, it never really gets better either. Oh god, we still have two more episodes of this video left. Jesus Christ, what a fucking shit show. Episode 8. We start with Olive still hanging around the tree. She says to her floating fireball boss that since the girls didn't tell anyone about the rot, she shouldn't have to kill them. You know, I really appreciate the show introducing a bad guy that's going to have a face turn later on in the show, but decides to completely skip the part where they show the bad guy as a bad person. So we can just speed run right past the whole messy character arc thing. Honestly, that seems to be a reoccurring problem with this show. The writers are terrified of making the character they want us to like do anything that could be viewed as more than slightly mischievous, but in general still pure as the driven snow. I hate to break it to you guys, but you can't have a villain redemption story if you don't do the villain part. Anyway, so the floating fire guy just undoes time's healing water spell. So we have final confirmation that the rot is caused by a group of shady evil figures operating behind the scenes, and actually have absolutely nothing to do with the old magic versus new magic plot as an ethics debate that's been the majority focus for 7 episodes in a 12 episode series. Part of me seriously wonders if the new magic and old magic argument was the initial plan when they started and they just pulled a hard left into having generic villains be responsible when they weren't able to do the world building needed to have a plot based on ethics. As we already know, this show started animating its first two episodes before writing was completed. So goodbye pointless old magic versus new magic debate. In the end you taught us nothing about the world gave us no insight into how the show setting works and only served to eat up screen time. I would say you won't be missed, but I'm just angry you wasted my time. Anyway, Fire Guy gives Oliver a spell to turn everyone into rocks and shatter them. Oh, also the bad guys are called the Triumphant or something? It doesn't matter. I just thought it was odd to have the bad guys have a name so similar to the Triad. Also, I look forward to me calling them the Tribunal for the rest of the review because I'm terrible with names. After the intro, we get into what this episode and the next one are mainly going to be. 
not Halloween Halloween specials. To be fair, although it's trying to be a Halloween themed setting, the actual staples of Halloween are not exactly here apart from takes place in autumn and characters dress up. It's more like a weird fusion of Halloween and vaguely unspecific Asian festival. Which honestly, I think I prefer in this case. It seems like a thin justification for having Halloween in this fantasy setting, but at least it's more than just Halloween with the find and replace name. Rose, Sage and Parsley are waiting around the entrance of the academy, waiting for time. Kel shows up to be a creep towards them. Kel is Parnell's cousin, which they mentioned all the way back in episode 5 as being mean. He has some lame insults about Rose's dragon onesie and basically cat calls Sage before wandering off. Oh yeah, Rose is dressed in a dragon onesie, which honestly seems like a giant waste of potential as far as dressing your main characters in a cute outfit for Halloween goes, but whatever floats your boat. Parsley is dressed as her metal urgy professor, which... The blacksmithing teacher? That's not weird. Time is a werewolf, although she hates the costume, and Sage is... Krahe from Princess Tutu? Gender bent Howl? Uh, I don't know. It's a cute outfit though. Oh, also, when Time complains about her costume, Sage casually mentions that in Lingoth it's literally the law to dress up for not Halloween. Um, <clears throat> what? I thought what made Halloween such a popular holiday in the US is because it's one of the only holidays without any obligations attached to it. Can I write a clickbait article about how High Guardian Spice is ruining Halloween? <laughs> Back at the abandoned school, Nepi tosses a bunch of potions into a cauldron and TFs into his alt form so he can warn the gang about Oliver's plan. Oliver is watching the festival from the roofs, in admittedly some good looking shots. Oh, also the third cat's name is Kino. He's been around too, but I can promise you he never has a purpose or reason for existing. He's just here because Olive and Kino are based off of Rodriguez's real life cats why Nippy exists and why Kino wasn't used for his role in the story instead, I'll never know. Olive doesn't want to kill the gang, so she plans to turn them into stone with the terror sphere the smoke guy gave her, but instead of shattering them, she's gonna take them to the tribunal so they can do the actual killing instead. We get a, let's be generous and call it a montage of the gang just aimlessly milling around with time looking miserable while Slime Boy plays the bandsaw. Olive approaches them and offers to give them an official guide to the festival which has a list of activities and such. Sage is displeased that Rose is speaking to another human being, does that shitty boyfriend thing where she takes hold of Rose's arm to mark her territory, and says that she's already drawn up an activity timetable for them to do. Olive is like, okay, and reminds them of how cool the finale of the festival at the bandstand is going to be. I thought this was to get them in the right place for her to cast the spell, but it's not. She makes a weird comment about enjoying it about as much as she enjoys belly rubs in what's supposed to be like a haha so quirky she's a cat girl slip but the joke doesn't really land so it's just kind of this big hollow thunk of a situation. <laughs> she was nice. I don't know. Something felt off about her. Ugh, don't be cynical, Sage. It's a festival. Sheesh. Cynical. Somebody bumps time into a tree costume and she spontaneously developed PTSD in this episode's first half, so she has a triggered flashback. Sage is able to think of someone else for once and sympathizes that time is clearly not having a good time and hates her costume. Rose, however, mentions she doesn't want time to bail and insists they should all be having fun together. However, Sage gives Time the out to leave. Parsley offers to go with her because she's a decent person, but Time turns her down. What Time means is that extroverts are replenished by social stimulus, while introverts are depleted. <laughs> oh, thank fuck. I did not need to sit and listen to Sage explaining what an introvert is. We then have a true flashback of when Time and her mother left the fairy woods. I guess Time realized we're in episode 7 and since she's the only one who actually cares about the main plot, decides she's leaving to go back to her father with the healing water. We then cut to the best characters in the show that aren't Parsley. Kel comes up to Snapdragon, not recognizing him, and tries to hit him up. But when he realizes it's Snapdragon, he has a bit of a meltdown that he has been flirting with a dude. Kel is the kind of guy who unironically uses the term trap, isn't he? Funeral director, huh, Kel? 
<laughs> you better get out of here before the funeral becomes your own. Just in case you needed more proof that Amaryllis is objectively the best character in the entire show. There you go. Also, she's dressed as a pirate. Snap! You're a fabulous mermaid goddess challenger. And, 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 you're great. And who cares what Cal says? His costume is a suit. Let's go smash shit till you feel better. Back with the others, Rose is feeling overwhelmed with how many things she wants to do on the activity list. Sage says she's already narrowed down the choices of what they can do together. They meet up with Allo and Anise, who introduce themselves to Parsley. I feel I should be surprised they don't know her yet, but honestly it makes sense. The girls stay at the dormitory at school, so they wouldn't have met her before. Although come to think of it, I don't understand why Rose and Sage stay at the school when Sage's cousins live a literal walking distance from it. Just one more pointless detail nobody thought about while making this show. I'm gonna guess the writers don't really know anything about school dormitories apart from it being a thing in Harry Potter and Little Witch Academia, so they wanted the aesthetic even when it made no logical sense. Also, Caraway shows up dressed like this, and there's this weird exchange oh we uh we go to the same parties i have no idea what the joke is supposed to be i get they're all gay or it could be referring to being swingers or i, I, I don't know listen if you're going to make a haha the kids don't know about our adult activities so we have to look embarrassed while giving a half truth joke you need to make it clearer what the basis of your joke is is for me to understand it even if I don't find it funny. <coughs> I'm gonna guess this is what they were trying to go for but I have no idea. So that's two jokes now with all the construction integrity of an American building. Time returns to her mom's home to pack for her impromptu return to the fairy woods, now with an unexplained sexy version of her previous outfit. Speaking of unexplained, Parsley is suddenly at her family stand acting as a barker. Amaryllis with Snapdragon show up in tow and Parsley makes the mistake of commenting that they're a cute couple. We're, We're not, not a couple. couple. I know, I know. Sage shows up having bought Parsley some food and literally bumps into Snapdragon. You just look so pretty right now, okay, bye! If I could make key smash noises with my mouth, I would. I'm serious, I genuinely really love the interactions between Sage and Snap, and I don't even like Sage. Their interactions feel genuine and honest. It's awkward and messy, but never comes across as like cringe or forced, or like the creators are shipping them and trying to force the relationship onto the viewers. It feels natural for two extremely awkward, anxious teenagers who genuinely like each other. Also, I think the setup with Sage's attraction is genuinely well crafted. We saw her spend a lot of time with Snap in the Obstacle Course episode, and although Snapdragon's crush is very clear, we don't see Sage respond in a romantic way too much apart from one or two comments making her flustered. But she and Snap mainly spend time in that episode when Sage isn't being horribly sexist towards him, talking. However, in this episode, when Snapdragon is dressed as a mermaid for the festival, Suddenly, Sage's blushing flusteredness spikes all the way up to 11. It's very subtle and it's building upon its own set foundations in earlier episodes and is a genuine piece of good character writing, which makes it fun to watch and you get invested in it. Come on, Snap. Time to lure pirates to their deaths or whatever. <sighs> Neppy arrives at the festival, sees Olive is hanging around and, spotting time, runs to warn her of Olive's plan. Sadly, he runs into a group of furries and or monster fuckers who cause him to crash into the bandstand and lose sight of time. Also, Slime Boy mentions Allo is giving away space brownies, so apparently that's a thing. Rose and Sage are playing the carnival games. Rose is impressed by a rare shield, causing Sage to be surprised that Rose knows something about history. Rose laughs and says of course she'd know something about history if it involves dragons. Sage responds to this like, she's super defensive about it? Uh, uh, let me show you. You're not the only one who knows things about things! <gasps> I was kidding, yikes. Yeah, I don't know what that's about. 
Parsley is done helping out at the family booth and rejoins the group, asking what they want to do next. Rose says she signed them all up for a challenge game with flaming axes, but Sage points out it's at the exact same time as the pumpkin carving contest. Oh wait, I'm sorry, pumpkin carving wouldn't be fantasy world building enough for this show. So it's pumpkin carving but with a different name. It's like pumpkin carving, but using ancient tools and adhering to very specific regional guidelines. So, pumpkin carving. Rose says she didn't see Sage sign them up, although she might either be lying or just feeling stupid for missing it, I can't really tell. Sage gets defensive, saying she thought Rose wanted to spend the festival together. Rose says she does, but she'd rather throw axes. Sage says that they always have to do what Rose wants to do, and that Sage really wants to do the pumpkin carving. Parsley tries to be the voice of reason, wondering if there's a way to combine the two games, but both Rose and Sage make it clear they don't want to compromise. Back with Time, she's just about to leave the town when Nepi catches up to her. He tries to warn Time about Olive and how he saw her speaking to a face of smoke, but due to the fact that his ability to speak is… not good, Time has a hard time understanding what he means. Nepi is able to clarify both to Time as well as the audience that what the tribunal doesn't like is that they know both about the infected trees as well as the fact that the healing water cures the sickness. Something I'm pretty sure any idiot could figure out when they hear the word healing water, but whatever. Time tells Nepi to track down the olive while she goes back to warn the others. Meanwhile, Rose is busy playing one of those strength testers while Sage is passive aggressively sulking. Rose is annoyed that Sage is still upset that they missed the pumpkin carving and says that she'll, quote, do the next dumb thing Sage has circled. Sage gets angry at this, saying that Rose is being a jerk. Amaryllis has a rare moment of annoyingness as she explains to Snapdragon and the audience that Rose and Sage are about to have an argument due to pent up resentment. Thanks, Amaryllis. I'm glad you're here to explain to me what's happening in the thing I'm currently watching. Snapdragon just nopes out of the situation, as Rose tells Sage that she can't expect Rose to get excited over things she doesn't find fun. She also very weirdly says that they don't need to be heroes today, they can just be kids, which is a good line in isolation, but at no point throughout the entire show has Rose shown any differentiation between having fun and being a hero. In fact, the complete opposite is true. Rose has the most fun when she is busy being a hero. She has fun when she's swinging her sword and going on adventures. On top of this, none of the characters has done a single thing that could qualify them as actually being heroes yet. The most adventurous thing they've done so far is getting the healing water. And even that was not a heroic quest or anything of the like. Although Time needed the water to save the trees, they didn't know this until they had already found the water. For them, the test was basically just a fetch quest as part of their school curriculum as set out by the teachers. The fact that they got into trouble and got hurt was due to the Travers being aggressive and them having to defend themselves. Nothing of what they've done can be classified as heroic. Adventurous? Sure. Heroic? No. So this would be a good one-liner for a different set of characters in a different show, but for this moment in time with these characters in this show, it doesn't make a lot of sense. You could try and write the story for the show creators and say that Rose is shaken up by the injury she suffered, but even directly following that event when they were all sitting around and waiting for their slow death from starvation, Rose's solution was to play truth or dare. Not exactly the actions of someone who has just gone through some form of trauma. Anyway, Rose asks Says if she knows how to have fun or if all she knows how to do is be a teacher's pet, even when the teachers are drunk off their asses. Her words, not mine. And then, this happens. I will play it for you instead of recapping it because I think you need to see this for yourselves in its raw form and not think I'm relaying the next line of dialogues through a bias filter. When we were kids, you had fun just being around me. You didn't need us to go spelunking into some stupid volcano full of hot knives just to consider it a fun day. And you were never, never this annoying. <sighs> Meanwhile, Sage, Sage seems, seems really, really off kilter and saddened sad that she and Rose, Rose have different schedules. Remember, Remember this. this. Remember, Remember this. this. Okay, so let me break this down. 
Sage has, throughout the entire series, shown that she is extremely possessive of Rose's attention, to a rather toxic point. When they first get to the academy, Sage is upset that she doesn't share every single class with Rose, despite them having certain classes together. When Rose is crushing on Aster, Sage immediately decides within the span of seconds that Aster is a terrible person and spends the entire episode badmouthing him for the sole reason that Rose shows romantic attraction towards him. In this very episode, when Olive is just talking to Rose, Sage does the possessive arm grab. She consistently displays an extreme domination of Rose's time and attention, lashing out viciously towards anyone that takes any of Rose's attention away from her. Need I remind you, Aster was not the person in the obstacle course episode who first approached Rose. Rose was the person who immediately started crushing on Aster. And for the most part, Aster seemed barely interested in Rose other than being a generic girl he can impress. The decision to spend some of her time away from Sage was Rose's decision. But Sage, in response, lashes out at Aster and hyperfixates on every minute detail she can think of for why he is awful, despite never having even spoken to him, as well as emphasizing that Sage knows what's best for Rose. I know what she needs, and it's not him. Now in this episode, Rose wants to do something Sage doesn't, but Sage wants Rose to want to do what Sage wants to do. At first, she takes immediate charge and simply chooses the activities she wants to do and sign Rose up for them as well. When Rose mentions she wants to do something else, Sage tries to assert that what Sage wants to do is more important. When Rose doesn't cave, Sage falls into passive-aggressive sulking, making extremely sure that Rose is aware that expressing personal desires outside of Sage is a bad thing without actually communicating with her. Instead, going for guilt-tripping and emotional manipulation, something we've seen her do before with other characters. Rose, however, refuses to back down and in fact asserts as to why she wants to do the things she wants to do. It may not make any narrative sense in the larger context of the show, but in this particular moment, Rose has independent wants that she is trying to enforce because she wants to have fun like a kid. And it's at this point where Rose dares to put down a personal boundary that Sage snaps. Her immediate response is to further guilt trip Rose. In the past, all you needed to be happy was to be with me. How dare you express personal interests and desires now, when in the past we could do whatever I wanted, because being with me was good enough for you. But also, you're not allowed to do what you want without me doing it with you, because if you spend time with anyone who isn't me, you're making a horrible mistake, because I'm the only person who understands you. I understand you better than you understand yourself. Why can't you see that? I know what's best, and what's best is doing whatever I want to do and you just coming along. And now that you have desires and interests that I don't share, your behavior is annoying. In the previous episode, where I didn't know you were hurt, I actively commented on how you're supposed to be more energetic and loud, and how that is how you always are, and I mentioned how that's how you should be behaving. But now that you're doing what I don't want you to do, the same behavior is now annoying. I'm not one to go hyperbolic with accusing fictional characters of real-world transgressions, but every singular action Sage displays gives me no choice but to give the firm statement that Sage is an abusive friend. And her method of abuse is control. And if you're having some trouble seeing it, just for a second, imagine if Sage was Rose's boyfriend. Rose is only allowed to do what Sage wants. If she isn't enthusiastic and loud, she gets criticized for not being herself. If she shows interest in another boy, that boy is the worst person ever and bad for Rose. If Rose wants to do something Sage doesn't want to do, she's hurting Sage's feelings because Sage was excited to do what she wants to do. If Rose stands her ground, she's being unreasonable, gets criticized for never needing the things to be happy before, and the exact same personality traits she was criticizing for not displaying when Sage wants her to is now used against her and called annoying. 
It's a very insidious form of abuse, one that doesn't need to involve physical violence or threats, nor does it need the two people to be in a romantic relationship with each other. It's a form of abuse which seems to have more positive moments than bad moments, as long as the abuser is satisfied with the control over their victim. Because the second the victim shows any individuality which does not fall in line with the abuser's desires and control, and you were never, never this annoying. Having disagreements between friends over what to do together or when to do it is bound to happen at some point in a friendship. Someone feeling their friend is dating the wrong person is also bound to happen sometimes. These things in of themselves are not controlling behavior. But when it is a consistent pattern for one person to pressure her control over someone and who also happens to display other behaviors of always needing absolutely everything her way, then it paints an extremely bad picture of that individual, or in this case, fictional character. Sage is not a real person. She doesn't have a psyche. All she has is what's been written for the show. The writers for this episode clearly wanted Sage and Rose to have a falling out, as Rose has here and there been behaving a little bratty in this episode regarding what the others want to do. However, Sage's behavior has been consistent throughout all seven episodes. Her lashing out at Rose like this does not feel out of character for her. The problem is, the writers absolutely did not intend for the second protagonist to be a horrible, controlling, toxic person. They wanted her to be an anxious nerd struggling with school and whose cool-headed intellectual approach to things balances out Rose's mindless enthusiasm and that their differences causes them to butt heads sometimes. But as Bennett the Sage once so wisely said, The strength of a story is not in its target, but in its aim. And the manner in which Sage has been written consistently paints her to be a bad person and is reinforced throughout the show when, given many different circumstances and many different settings, her response at every point merely reinforces the fact that she is a bad person. That is the character you have written. It's not the character you wanted to write, but that is the character you have written. Many years ago, I wrote a lengthy fanfic for My Little Pony, in which the main six characters in Discord go on a grand adventure. In the fic, I wanted to make it clear Twilight did not trust Discord at all and was antagonistic towards him. About halfway through the fic, I started getting comments that Twilight was being extremely unlikable and that her distrust of Discord had crossed the line from being annoyed and suspicious to just being petty and bitchy. So, I had one of the other characters try and talk to her about it, pointing out that she had crossed the line and was behaving mean-spirited. And I had Twilight deny this, saying she was behaving perfectly normal and fine. And then I had all three characters thrown in jail, where they were forced to work together to get out, and had the third character demand the two of them stop being assholes and talk to each other, because they weren't going anywhere anyway, so they might as well use the opportunity to air out all the underlying tension. Afterwards, I adjusted how I wrote Twilight, and then when an emotional turning point happened for Discord in particular, I gave Twilight a bit of an oh shit moment where she realizes her suspicion was unfounded. And after the climax where all the adventuring was done, I had her not just apologize, but express to Discord directly that she had changed her mind about him and that she had been wrong. I didn't mean for Twilight to have this subplot, but it's a subplot that became necessary to salvage her character. Sometimes we try and write tension and accidentally push the character too far into being mean. But if you end up in that situation, you need to acknowledge the character's fault and accept that your main character, who the audience is supposed to like, did something wrong. And if there is a consistent pattern with the main characters in High Guardian Spice, it's that the writers were unwilling to give any of their four main characters any real flaws whatsoever, ironically making them unlikable. Whereas characters who were written with the intended purpose of being problematic became the best written and as a result, fan favorites. This show doesn't want its main characters to look bad, which results in them becoming monsters. Back to the shit show. Olive has decided she's waited around long enough and starts with her plan to turn the gang into stone. Time runs into the others and quickly informs them about Olive's plan. 
Listen, I trust you, all of you. I know I've been, like, off, but I need you to trust me back, okay? This is nice. More of this, please. Time has been borderline antagonistic for the entire show towards Rose and Sage, but has more or less been forced to spend time with them due to her friendship with Parsley, and after opening up to them last episode, is now in a good position to ask for help, something she wouldn't have been able to do before now. This is good, I like her character growth. Meanwhile, Snapdragon has retreated to a corner where he's been crying over Kel's name calling. Amaryllis catches up to him to gossip about the fight, but, seeing he's upset, changes her mind and puts a force field around the two of them. Making sure nobody and nothing can hear or touch us. Now talk! Take down the spell. Not until you tell me what's wrong! I don't want to! Oh, Beat that, Sage! Rah! I'm good here. The difference here is staggering. Anyway, Snap doesn't want to talk about it, so Amaryllis drops it and they decide to play fantasy VR games together. Although Amaryllis keeps the force field up so she can swear without getting in trouble. I refuse to comment on the existence of fantasy VR games. The gang and Nippy manage to track down Olive and they run to the roof to confront her. Olive reveals herself to have been the black cat in their dormitory up until now and that she's been spying on them. You'll meet the triumvirate soon enough. <laughs> you mean the triad, right? If I meant the triad, I'd say the triad. Idiot. Oh, uh, okay, so the similar naming is actually a plot point. Okay, I retract my previous statement. You win this round, High Guardian Spice. Sage reaches for her terror sphere, but Olive disarms her before she can do anything, taunting her for not being able to use new magic before using her own terror sphere to steal time's healing water. She holds it hostage, telling them to come with her to the tribunal, but when they refuse, Time completely loses her shit and rolls initiative, but Olive can actually fight and after deflecting her arrows, casts a magic glyph from the Oh My Goddess movie. Sage manages to get her Terrasphere just in time to shield them before it goes off and turns every person in the festival to stone, except for Amaryllis and Snapdragon who are still behind their own force field. However, as she had run to grab Nepi and tried to get him under the shield as well, Parsley is caught in the spell and turned to stone. <laughs> No! Well, that was a fucked up story. Okay, one more episode. Let's try to pick up the pace so I can keep this video under two hours. Episode 9. We start exactly where we left off. Olive was knocked out and wakes up distressed to see how wide the spell's AoE was. Her smoke boss comes to laugh at her for making a mess and how the tribunal is gonna have her hide if she messes up further. He gives her until dawn to murder the gang or he's gonna report her mistake and it's insinuated the tribunal will just murder her for the screw up. The gang's force field goes down and they assess the damage. Sage freaks out thinking that Olive's spell bouncing off her spell means it's her fault this has happened. Time is quick to tell her the only person to blame for this is Olive and I have to agree with her. I don't like Sage, but in this case she didn't do anything wrong. I also appreciate her showing some sense of responsibility and compassion outside of herself, which also reminds us of her anxiety regarding her magic. The remaining three girls focus on fixing the spell first and come to the conclusion that if Olive cast the spell, she should be able to undo it. Olive meanwhile is trying to psych herself up to murdering the group while also working out the best way to pick them off based on their strengths before attacking. She takes out Time and Sage before focusing on Rose, but Rose parries her surprise attack. Olive taunts the gang before running off. Rose goes after her despite Sage negging her for being too reckless just like how she got hurt in the cave. Rose ignores her and runs off. Time and Sage move to look for Olive together among the crowd. Meanwhile, Amaryllis and Snap are still playing VR games. Guardian Academy. It should have taken us one try to beat this. It's for literal babies. Do I need to dignify this with a response? If you want to do a Ruby Chibi spin-off, just do a Ruby Chibi spin-off and save us this time wasting. Rose catches up to Olive, demanding they fight. Olive leads her into an alley before finally facing her. I've heard people call this fight scene cheap and badly done, but honestly, it's fine. 
Its biggest problem is it relies a little too much on shaky cam, but otherwise there's nothing really wrong with it. It's not the greatest fight I've ever seen, but it's serviceable. Rose manages to give Olive a nasty cut, causing her to retreat and Rose to give chase again. Back with Amaryllis and Snap playing their nonsensical VR game, Snap takes the opportunity to tell Amaryllis that she always orders him around and never says please. She doesn't respond to this, but she doesn't deny it either. They run into Time and Sage and realize what's happened when they take their goggles off. Time and Sage fill them in on Olive and the four go to find her together. While doing so, Sage mentions never having seen a spell like this even when she lived in witch country, something Amaryllis is shocked to learn as that's where she's from. Sage explains that she lived in the countryside, which is why she grew up without new magic. Amaryllis quickly assesses what kind of magic Olive would have used for the stone smell and remarks that it's really expensive and that Olive must be loaded. She also does what this show has refused to do up until this point and actually explains something about the magic system, pointing out that the thing Olive used was a ready-made spell contained within a stone, something brand new Amaryllis has only seen being sold the last time she went home. She says you don't need to actually know the spell, you just need to activate the stone when you want to cast it. After a brief argument about the ethics of ready-made spells, Amaryllis tells them all spells can be undone, but they need Olive's original Terra Sphere. And since Amaryllis is always on board for violence, she's more than happy to help them fight Olive as well. Meanwhile, back with Rose, she catches up to Olive who isn't doing very well at the bandstand, where the rest of the group stops her from running away and disarm her. Olive still wants to fight, but time refuses since she's hurt, and demands to know who the Triumvirate are and what they want with the gang. Upon hearing the name, Amaryllis' ears perk up and she asks what which country's big money guys have to do with this. They argue back and forth as Olive throws out threats and once again tells them to come with her. When they refuse and Olive grabs her Terra Sphere, Sage throws a spell at her and Olive vanishes in a flash of light. Rose and Sage start fighting but time calms them down since Parsley isn't around to be the voice of reason. Luckily, Olive left behind the ready-made spark spell and Sage crushes it, causing the spell to break and everything goes back to normal with no one even aware of what just happened. The gang relax and watch the fireworks since Olive is long gone. Time makes sure Parsley is okay, but she says it was like she blinked, so she's fine. Amaryllis offers to find out why the tribunal is after them, since she knows people in which country and can ask around, but they turn her down, not wanting to draw attention. They consider telling the teachers, but since Olive mentioned they're being spied upon at the academy, they don't want to risk it. The group go their separate ways for the evening. Snap asks Sage if she'd like to watch the band together. I'm in. Actually, uh, never mind. I'd rather throw more money down more holes. Rose is as dense as always and completely misses the vibe and says she'll watch with them instead, but Sage tells her she wants to be alone with Snapdragon. Rose seems to take this personally and finds herself alone. Time takes a moment, realizing that without the healing water, there's no point in going home to her dad. Amaryllis asks Parsley if she has any idea how to win the VR game, and Parsley tells her it's based on teamwork. She had been playing it only giving orders. Sage introduces Snap to a niece and Aloe, and Caraway mentions he's happy to see Snapdragon enjoying himself. The smoke boss tracks down Olive and tells her he convinced the tribunal to give her another chance, but they're going to send another agent to help her. Professor Caraway, who is voiced by Rodriguez, is seen flirting with one of Rodriguez's OCs cosplaying as a kitsune, complete with distracting yaoi mist. And Rose walks miserably through the festival, feeling alone and sorry for herself. Slimeboy starts singing a song, but since he's voiced by an actual musician, I assume the song is copyrighted and I can't play it, so please accept this substitute. <laughs> Well, of the three episodes, this one was the best, but that's not saying a lot. What an absolute nosedive in quality from episode 6. 
When I got to episode 6, I genuinely thought the show was pretty much just as bad as its reputation, but had redeeming qualities that people weren't giving it enough credit for, and was at least interested to see where it was going since it seemed to be steadily improving. But immediately afterwards, all the good faith it was building up broke instantly with what is the absolute worst episode in the entire show. And following right on its heels is the episode where Sage's character reaches new lows in showing what a horrible person she is. Episode 9 is only saved by the fact that it's mostly focused on action and moving the story forward, so its pacing feels much tighter than previous episodes, and world building is introduced in a much more organic way by bringing Amaryllis in to give the rest of the characters information, which also informs the audience. If episode 9 was not tied to episode 8 and had happened before episode 7, I would even call it a good episode, but I cannot overstate just how bad episode 7 is. At least in episode 9, we finally gotten some more possible main plot by bringing an actual antagonistic force, since them wanting to stop the gang for knowing too much about the rot in the healing water makes them seem responsible for it. On top of this, we get given a hint as to who the bad guys are by Amaryllis recognizing their name and mentioning their some or other wealthy organization from her home. All of this would mean a lot more for this show if there were more than three episodes left to wrap up the story and deliver on all of these plot points. Or let us know what the main plot even is. That would be nice. Do you guys remember when 12 episode stories had plots? Because I remember when 12 episode stories had plots. Episode 10. We are now on the last three episodes of the show. Three episodes to find out who is behind the assassination attempt at the Autumn Festival, what the rot is and how to stop it, why the gang knowing about the healing water is so dangerous and what the deal is with new magic. I would pretend to be excited about learning the answers but we all know better by this point. We start episode 10 very strangely, as Rose is busy telling a scary story to some other characters during a sleepover, overlaid to footage of time and parsley in a spooky forest. It's very confusing and when I watched this the first time I thought the footage of time and parsley are supposed to be stand-ins for the characters Rose is describing and it was going to be an episode where the characters all play roles as other characters in a fictional story like I don't know, Sonic and the Black Knight or something. But no, Time and Parsley are actually out on a quest together while Rose tells a scary sleepover story which is in no way connected to what the other two are doing. Amaryllis shows up and asks why they're telling stories at 2pm in blinding daylight while rain pours heavily against the windows and a thunderclap punctuates her sentence. I was wondering if this was supposed to be a joke that didn't quite land correctly, but my hunch is that they actually didn't intend this episode to take place in the middle of the day when lines were being recorded, but then changed their minds when it came to storyboarding. So they tried to cover up this mistake by adding a thunderclap after Amaryllis says her line to make it look like a joke, even though the punchline delivery is extremely weak. Then again, I might be completely off base and it's just another example of this show's inability to deliver jokes properly, but at this point the poor writing is essentially gaslighting me, so I never know if I'm being an asshole for assuming the worst or if I am completely on point and correct in my observations. Considering the title of this episode is Rainy Day Memories, I'm leaning towards it just being a bad joke, but my gut instinct is saying otherwise. I don't know. I wouldn't bother mentioning this, but it being right at the start of the episode along with the really weird opening, it's just kind of a double whammy of confusion. At the school, Sage is gloomily staring out the window, still sulking about the fight she had with Rose in the previous two episodes. I find it interesting that the last time we saw Rose, she was very sad about the fight while Sage was off palling around with Snapdragon, but in the direct next episode, Rose is busy having a slumber party and telling stories while Sage is the one brooding by herself. Oh wait, she's not by herself. She's with an eyesight of Rose, so this is most likely performative. Got it. Also Snapdragon is there too. 
Sage tries to get in a passive-aggressive dig at Rose trying to mend their relationship, but it doesn't work because Rose is too busy being confused as to why Sage and Snapdragon are now hanging out together. Yup, that's what's happening. Gross, right? Rose makes a big show of being independent and doing things by herself and stomps out. I have stuff to do too, but unlike some people, I don't feel the need to announce it. Oh, by the way, in case you're wondering, yes, this is what the majority of the episode is going to be like. If you were expecting any actual plot progression in the last three episodes of the story, then my condolences. Rose, followed by Amaryllis, run into Slime Boy and Parnell. I am happy to report Slime Boy's mic and voice acting have not improved in the slightest. Mm, I'm not good with names or faces, but your aura is always really red and dark, like old blood. Amaryllis tries to rope Rose into some of the shenanigans regarding Sage and Snapdragon. Interestingly, she refers to Snap as her best friend here, which I'm not sure is what their dynamic was at the start of the show, but I can't tell if this is character growth or inconsistent writing. Anyway, back with Time and Parsley, who are at least slightly more engaged in the actual plot. Time has decided the only logical next step in the story is to summon a demon. Okay, so the absolute nonsense here is truly incredible. So Time wants to summon a demon, so she can ask it to open a portal to her dad, so she can tell him about the healing water, so he can replicate the formula and save the fairy woods. You got all that? So. Here are my questions in numerical order because I can feel my life draining away as I try my best not to spend an hour on the first six minutes of the episode. <clears throat> Number one. Why didn't she ask the ethics teacher to open a portal to her dad since she has shown multiple times that she can do this? Number two. Why is this healing water not a common knowledge thing, considering it was a basic test at the academy and the teachers didn't really act like it was that special a substance? Number 3. If guardians are tasked to protect the magical world, why have no guardians nor the academy been made aware of the fairy woods' situation? Number 4. If they have, why did nobody at the academy think of using the healing water? Number 5. Why doesn't Time tell her mom, who is already in town, about the healing water, since her mom is also trying to find a cure? Number 6. She's going to tell her dad, Hey, there's this magic water that can heal things, as if the knowledge of the water merely existing would be enough for her dad to replicate it, as if the idea of creating a healing potion would never have occurred to him otherwise. Number 7. Even if she doesn't go to the ethics teacher, the teacher's present indicates that there should be other demonic creatures in town which could help her with a portal. Number 8. If demons can create portals like this, why isn't there some or other portal transportation system in place in this town? Number 9. Why doesn't the academy already have a stockpile of healing water if this is a common test that has been done multiple times before? Number 10. Why can't she ask one of the other students who completed the test for their water, even if it's not as strong as the kind they found in the diamond cavern to send to her dad? Number 11. Get on with it. Yes, get on with it. Get on with it. Parsley thinks summoning a demon is a bad idea and suggests they go to the triad for help. Because the show has no counter argument to this plan, Time outright ignores Parsley and does the summoning ritual anyway. Enough of that though, we need to get back to the high school shenanigans of teenagers meddling in each other's love lives. Amaryllis is pissed because Snapdragon is something she considers as belonging to her in the friendship department. She's been written consistently as being very protective of Snapdragon being her henchman, but the previous episode ended with her purposefully giving Snap and Sage alone time together, so I'm having a hard time understanding what exactly her deal is here. Because she is a new friend now, and Snap's such an amazing friend. He makes you look bad in comparison. Hey, I mean, it's not a contest, except it is. And guess who's losing? I mean, she's right. <laughs> Amaryllis' plan is to cast a spell that would display Snapdragon and Sage's most embarrassing memories to each other, so that they'd be horrified at each other's bad decisions in life. Rose is hesitant at first, but Amaryllis convinces her by pointing out that making Sage sad will give Rose a chance to slide in and give her a shoulder to cry on. Now, I would point out how truly horrible and awful this is to do to somebody because it really, really is, 
But it doesn't bother me too much within the story because Rose has rightfully been worried Amaryllis' solution to the situation was going to be murder. And also because this is the level of not thinking things through that I expect from teenagers. Amaryllis even says that she expects Sage's embarrassing memory to be about something like wearing a bad looking hat or being boring all the time. She's not expecting to expose something truly traumatic or anything like that. It's on the same level as stealing somebody's diary and reading pages to a friend to laugh about without realizing there could be honest, earth-shattering content in there. Amaryllis and Rose's plans here don't go any deeper than Snapdragon and Sage seeing a cringy TikTok about each other. Uh, but, but also, don't send people's cringy TikToks to their crush, please. Fucking TikTok bullshitting bastards making me do stupid shit. While Time and Parsley are waiting for the demon to show up, I guess. Time has a flashback to when she was an indeterminable few years younger living on Kashyyyk and her dad was showing her how to use magic to help the trees grow and lecturing her on how this is the charge of all elves, which opens up new questions as to why none of the other elves at the school know about the rot. And before you suggest that maybe Time is the only elf at school, <laughs> But also, we then see the centaurs are also involved with trying to control the rot, and the show has shown us one of the unimportant teachers is a centaur. So basically, the more this show tries to explain, the deeper it digs itself into a hole. The demon shows up, and we cut away to the school. I haven't really commented on this, but this show has a habit of cutting back and forth between separate situations before any scene really has enough time to develop. In my past videos, I've actually rearranged a few scenes so I can have enough material to talk about because otherwise the majority of these videos would have me going, we cut to Time who makes a circle of salt. We cut to Rose who agrees to team up with Amaryllis. We cut to Time waiting for the demon to appear and he does. We cut to Rose setting up the spell over and over again and I'm actually trying my best to describe the events of this show in a way that is like, you know, understandable. We cut back to Rose and Amaryllis setting up the memory spell while Slime Boy and Parnell watch. I don't actually know why they're here, I guess they had nothing better to do. Oh wait, Amaryllis says that if she has a bunch of, quote, uncorrupted souls nearby, there's a smaller chance of the spell going all evil. Meanwhile, Sage is doing her favorite thing when she's not with Rose, which is complaining about Rose. It's actually really funny to see the writers desperately try and cobble together a logical reason for why Sage is upset about Rose's behavior recently, when even if you took the show completely at its word, it sounds like nothing but gobbledygook to try and pave the way for when Snapdragon asks Sage if she's got a crush on Rose, which is the only real point of this conversation that the writers desperately wanted expressed but didn't know how to lead the conversation there naturally, and so had to hastily construct dialogue between Sage and Snap to make him ask her this. Sage gets very flustered by the suggestion, but immediately asserts she can't think of Rose that way, followed by Snap and Sage engaging in more flirty behavior, including close-up of hands almost touching, and the rainwater against the window making the shape of a heart. This is all meta-communication by the show directly that although Sage might have a schoolgirl crush on Rose to some degree, these feelings don't run very deep and her growing relationship with Snapdragon is instead the more concrete romance. Which makes it extremely confusing and overall a little pathetic when Rodriguez makes shipbaiting tweets going, Will Rose and Sage end up as a couple? Tune in next season to find out! Like, this is an episode of Victorious or whatever. Yes, I have been watching those reviews. Shipping as bait is honestly one of the absolute worst and most desperate attempts to hook an audience in my opinion. It shows that the creators have zero faith in the actual writing of the story and have to rely on clickbaiting the audience who doesn't care about things like writing and characters and only really have an interest in slapping Barbies made out of tropes together. Doesn't matter what the story, setting, narrative or characters are, it only matters which character is going to be making out with which other character. But only making out because anything more will have the very same people asking for this type of content reporting you to the FBI. We're only interested in sex, but it better not contain any sex. As for Rodriguez, this is fandom behavior that a creator really shouldn't be partaking in. My friend put it best when I asked her to check me that I'm not ranting about my personal feelings on shipping culture too much. If all you can tease about in a tweet about the fantasy magical show with big bad evil is a ship, 
You clearly don't care about the story. Also, I just want to point out this small little exchange because it says so much about the friendships in this show than any long paragraph from me could. You uh, sure do have a lot of feelings about Rosemary. <laughs> of course I do. She's my best friend. Don't you have a lot of feelings about Amaryllis? No, she's my best friend. Snap also says that he and Amaryllis have a more father-daughter relationship, which is a weird analogy, as the writers further beg the audience not to ship them together. Because a show dictating to its audience who is and is not appropriate to ship is not weird and controlling behavior at all. Also, Snap just casually mentions that Amaryllis has a crush on Hickory that she keeps denying, which is very weird since I'm not even sure who Hickory is. If anything, Amaryllis has been shown to possibly have a crush on time, although it seems the writers have forgotten this detail by this point. I will point out one tiny thing I like though, and that's that Snap is drawn far less scowly here than he's been shown throughout the show so far, and it's actually nice to see him smile. If this show actually knew how to write characters, I'd say he's happy to be helping with someone else's problems because it takes his mind off of his own. Rose has changed her mind about the memory spell after giving Sage a sad look, which I can't tell if she overheard the conversation or not, and the spell goes off hitting her and Amaryllis. No, I don't know how Amaryllis setting off the spell with her wand is affected by the candle circle or Slime Boy and Parnell being close by. Okay, yes, it looks bad. If anyone asks, it was just homework. Meanwhile, Time is trying to get the demon to summon her father, which is not what she said she wanted to do originally, but the demon speaks in rhyme, essentially saying he's gonna wait out the timer so she can't talk to her dad, and that a plague is coming upon the land anyway and their days are numbered, and that Time and possibly her friends are going to die in witch country. It's worded in a very cryptic way to fit the rhyming scheme, but that's the long and short of it. Time gets upset and breaks the salt circle of protection, causing the demon to attack. Time says she doesn't have a reversal spell because she didn't summon the demon to kill it, which just sounds like a lazy excuse to have an action scene. You'd think after Rose almost died in the diamond cavern that these characters would be better prepared for like bad situations and things. We cut back to the school where the group is running around trying to capture all the embarrassing memories in jars. Parnell, if you tell anyone I vertically face-planted because of how dreamy Leland is, I'll turn you into a lizard and keep you in a box in my room. Got it? <laughs> Threaten me with something that isn't one of my life goals. Slime Boy jokes that chasing after memories is a lot easier than just apologizing. Rose points out that apologizing to Sage is difficult because she already puts up with a lot from her parents and Rose. This just sounds like Rose internalizing Sage's guilt tripping she likes to do, honestly. Meanwhile, this is happening. They catch the demon in a magically charged vine web, and time executes the motherfucker. Perhaps we could work out on yeah. Ice cold, man! Ice cold! And that's it for the subplot. You were right. This was a waste of time. Meanwhile, back at the school, the group have caught all the memories and are catching their breath by talking about lizards, which is fairly relatable. However, before Amaryllis can leave to think of a new way to get Snapdragon back to hang out with her, they notice one lost memory of Rose is still running amok. The crying Rose memory runs into the room where Sage and Snapdragon are hanging out, leading Sage learning to the great surprise that the day Rose's mom left before she disappeared, Rose was sad about it. Rose apologizes to Sage for saying her interests are boring. Sage apologizes for blowing up at her, before going on to justify her actions by saying, I've just been so stressed and confused lately, so you're not allowed to hold me accountable because I've got anxiety. Boom! As someone who also has anxiety, Sage, that might be an explanation, but it's not an excuse. Your feelings are valid because you can't control them, but how you decide to manage those feelings is your responsibility. Also, passive aggressiveness as a method to punish a friend is not an anxiety symptom I can say that I've ever experienced. Rose captures her sad memory and she and Sage make up. Mostly by Rose saying how horrible Sage's struggle sounds while her crying child self is sobbing its eyes out right next to them. 
Sage says definitively that Snapdragon is her friend now. And Rose says that her friendship with Amaryllis is still kind of a work in progress, since Amaryllis is kind of evil. Snapdragon laughs at Amaryllis' emotional constipation and tells her that she doesn't have to be mean all the time and can scale it back now and then. Amaryllis offhandedly replies that she is who she is, just like him. Meanwhile, Time and Parsley go back to the academy. Meanwhile, Oliver's hanging out in the school attic. The end. So what was actually covered in this episode? Rose and Sage became friends again. Rose reminded us that her mom is missing and that she's sad about it. And we learn Amaryllis has a pet tarantula. Time and Parsley are trying their best to pursue the plot, but nothing was accomplished. This was definitely a good use of the show's time in its final three episodes. I hate this school. Episode 11. The penultimate episode of High Guardian Spice. And this one's a real doozy. We start with a random assortment of students fighting a purple tentacle monster with a truly phoned in design as part of the school test. A tentacle monster who first bleeds red, then bleeds purple, and is then revealed to be a robot. Great teamwork! Nice use of violence! Turns out this test was to choose a group of guardians to dispatch on a serious assignment. Naturally, the chosen students for the mission are the four girls along with Snapdragon and Cal. Amaryllis does not get to go along, much to her and my annoyance. The mission the group has been selected for is to answer a call for help from the Guardian Academy Sister School, which is specifically for mermaids. While on a mission to inspect changes to the reef near which country, the merfolk were attacked by a sea dragon which drove the group up a river. They have requested help to capture it alive as sea dragons are normally docile. So of course for this reason, the Guardian Academy is sending out six teenagers and one teacher to go help their underwater division of a school. But let's be fair, maybe there are just so many scattered missions and places that need help they couldn't save anyone else to send. Hello, girl! Professor Redbud, are you on the mission? <laughs> oh no! My only mission today is soaking up sun and reading trash. Anyway, as if you didn't see it coming the second their names were mentioned, Snapdragon and Cal get into a fight, where Caraway, in all his wisdom, decided to put the character he knows as having issues with the character he knows likes to bully people. I just think you and the mermaids are gonna get along well. Why? Oh come on! Like you don't remember gallivanting around the autumn processional? You love making such a splash in your mermaid costume. I am confused. Is mermaid supposed to be an insult? Kel, I know you're trying to be the homophobic straw man, but if you really want the audience to hate you, you need to work on your insult because pointing at somebody and going, haha, you're a mermaid is not exactly the best read I've ever heard. She's so gay, even her asshole has a lisp. <laughs> Cal does manage to get one jab in when he says Snap's dad must be proud to call Snap his daughter. Which is enough for Snapdragon to be... bothered. <laughs> Snapdragon somehow manages to break his wrist against Cal's face and gets benched for the rest of this assignment. So anyone who wanted to see Snapdragon happy because he can actually live out his mermaid fantasy, I'm sorry to say Snapdragon doesn't get a cool mermaid form of any kind in this episode. Nor does he get to do anything to help the mermaid school. Rosemary, I'll hold Flowering Thorn. You won't need her where you're going. Well, that's not suspicious at all. Although no, this is not actually foreshadowing anything about Caraway. It's just a really weird, vaguely threatening line to explain why Rose won't have her sword on her this mission. Oh, but arrows are fine as underwater weapons. Alright. Anyway, getting back to Professor Redbud. She gives the girls each a ring and tells them that all they need to do to be able to visit the underwater school is to just add water. Swim the swim, we'll dance and we'll play. Now it's very easy, go on and just take a chance and shake a feel. Let the music move you, you can do it! Don't be shy, let the music inside and dance, dance, dance. See, you can do it! 
most transformation sequences devote a sizable budget to them because the goal of a transformation sequence is to pad the running time of every episode as well as act as marketing. It's a budgeting technique. Having a singular transformation sequence in only one episode means you're either going to have to sacrifice a lot of that episode's budget to make it look as good as you want it to or you're going to end up with something pretty mid. High Guardian Spice went with the latter, mostly because I think they just wanted a transformation sequence and didn't consider the practicalities as far as production goes. So this is what we ended up with. I will give the mermaid forms one small compliment though. They gave Rosemary a white mermaid scheme. It looks much better than if they'd just given her a pink tail with pink accessories and called it a day. Time in blue also looks really good. It would have been just as easy to put her in green, but I really like the blue. I think of the four, she has the best design. What is it? <gasps> Nothing. The girls meet up with one of the mermaids and are weirdly not too excited about this. Although, granted, the mermaid is quick to tell them to stop having fun and follow her because it's not safe out in the open. She leads them to this place called the Bastion, right as the sea dragon attacks them. The mermaid acts as a diversion since the sea dragon would target her as it prefers real mermaids. Also, this is just a personal pet peeve, but I hate it in cartoons and especially anime when they get human actors to try and mimic animal sounds. I don't know why, but I always find it annoying. Is it just me? Is this just a me thing? It's probably just a me thing. <laughs> Look, not everyone can be Frank Welker, unfortunately. See now, when I said help, they can't- They're going insane with your voice elation! The group get inside the bastion where the mermaid named Elodie introduces them to two other merfolk, Coral and Kelp. Time immediately crashes on Coral, and Coral introduces them to the Precure mascot, Bubbles. I'm confused by the Bastion, however. I don't think they ever explain what it is. It's just this round fortress in the middle of this river. I don't expect them to give a deep explanation for every building this show visits, but it makes it doubly confusing when the majority of the conversation has been about the High Guardian Academy sister school, and then we see this building underwater. The merfolk being driven up the river is so briefly mentioned in comparison to them mentioning the mermaid school so many times. You'd think this building should be the school, but it's not. It's a completely unrelated building that the three mermaids are hiding in. Back to the actual dialogue, the mermaids tell the group that the water dragon is well known to them and is somewhat of a pet. As before, he would enjoy getting pet and watching over the mermaids. This is also why it's so important for them not to hurt it. The mermaids are more interested in finding out what's gone wrong than just removing it as a threat. We cut back to Snapdragon and Caraway, and I'm just going to prepare you right now that a good chunk of this episode is back and forth dialogue between these two. Which is not necessarily a bad thing. I could make an argument that having dialogue like this in the B plot when the A plot involves mermaids and the water dragon is frustrating and a little whiplash inducing. However, as valid an argument as that is, I'm always the first person who argues that action sequences with moments to highlight characters or have breaks in the pace for character interactions is not only good, but oftentimes crucial to prevent me from spacing out when the show or movie becomes visual dubstep. <laughs> So to complain that we're getting character moments in an episode promising action is not only hypocritical of me, but also goes against how I like my media to be presented. However, I will say I never had this problem in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Probably because those war scenes are comprised of smaller individual situations like destroying the wall or defending the gates. So it's not a singular event that you just need to wait out until the story can progress again. Someone else could argue against this and probably do so in a way to convince me that they're right, but it's not an argument I think would be authentic to how I enjoy my story presentation. The quality of the character interaction on the other hand, now that I can criticize. 
Caraway is now saying that he needs Snap to act as lookout rather than he has been delegated as lookout due to his injury. Now the story is... I need you as lookout. We all serve the mission in different ways. Which is a good lesson if it weren't for the fact that the only reason Snapdragon is here is because he's injured, implying that if he wasn't, he'd be underwater too. Which undermines the each person has a role to play in a mission lesson, when it's very clear this is a downgrade. It feels very teacher being dismissive of the teenage student's feelings and using morality lessons as a cover. Although I did rewatch The Breakfast Club last night, so maybe this is just me. I will give Caraway credit here. He tells Snapdragon that the triad's response to physical violence between students is suspension. <laughs> but that he's giving Snapdragon another chance and wants to understand why Snapdragon reacted violently the way he did, since he's not a confrontational person by nature. Snapdragon refuses to answer, however, and Caraway drops it for now. We cut back to the school very briefly to show Cal. He bumps into Amaryllis, who is shocked to see him back so soon and, seeing his beaten up face, becomes concerned if Snapdragon is okay. Cal grumbles that Snap broke his nose despite there not being any indication of this in the art, which shocks Amaryllis because she can't believe Snap would do something like that. Cal uses Mermaid as an insult again, which I realize is also weird considering mermaids are an actual race in this show, but never is the mermaid insult treated as if it's racist. It's just, it's not a good insult, my dude. Take some notes. After seeing you in drag, I realize now why Seattle has a high suicide rate. Olive is here too. Back with Snapdragon and Caraway, Snapdragon complains that he feels like the only person getting punished for the fight. Caraway pulls the I'll deal with Cal later, but for now I want to focus on you thing you see way too much in children's cartoons. And I may not be a child, but I do want to ask show writers to stop doing this. When you have a little shit of a character provoke our main character into doing something wrong, don't respond to the main character asking why only they are getting punished with We'll deal with the other kid later. Off screen. Where the audience will never see it. It instills a feeling of injustice in the viewer who has the full context of the situation. And this makes the audience less likely to internalize the lesson you're trying to give. Because all the audience can think is this is not fair. Not because they don't want the main character to answer for what they did wrong, but if the other person who provoked them is never seen to get punishment for their actions, and then have the authority figure not hand out equal punishment where the audience can see it, it just makes the audience feel angry and resistant to the message. We'll deal with what she did. Oh, will ya? It's been 22 years since I originally saw this episode, and I'm still waiting to see it! This is not a High Guardian Spice problem, this is just a problem in general, and I really dislike it, and I have not met a single person who isn't annoyed and frustrated by this trope. Anyway, back to the show. We get a flashback to when Snapdragon was much younger. His older brother steals his pet rabbit and hits him, causing their dad to intervene. Snap's dad tries to teach Snapdragon that when somebody takes something away from you by force, you need to stand up for yourself. He does this by having Snapdragon tackle him to get his rabbit back. He praises Snapdragon and says he should spend more time sparring with his brother, as his dad has aspirations for him to become a warrior. So I understand the situation the show is trying to portray here. They want to show that Snapdragon comes from a family that's very toxically masculine. However, it doesn't really work for me in the way it wants to. I never get the impression that Snapdragon's dad is toxically masculine. His brother seems awful, as he not only hits Snap to steal from him, but also makes fun of him for crying like a girl. But Snap's dad is shown to intervene in the fight to break it up, and actually try and build confidence in Snapdragon, and teach him that there are times you need to be assertive to protect yourself. And when Snapdragon tackles him, he honestly praises Snap and comes across as encouraging. If they wanted to communicate that Snap's dragon's father encourages responding with violence, they could have shown child Snapdragon punching him instead of tackling. A tackle is not necessarily an overly violent action, and is in fact a very basic form of play. Punching, however, is always a form of violence. The dad is also encouraging Snapdragon to be assertive in protecting what's his. 
If the show wanted us to better see the toxic masculinity of Snap's family, it would have been better to have the dad be disappointed by Snap crying and unimpressed with Snap's attempt at punching him. You don't need the dad to be angry or mean or cartoonishly awful. The simple fact of having the dad be disappointed in who Snapdragon is would be far more effective and wouldn't turn the dad into a one-dimensional straw man and leave it there for us to hate. Actually, you know what? How to train your dragon. You know Hiccup's dad? You know how Hiccup's dad is actually a good person at heart and he truly loves his son but is also disappointed that Hiccup is not the model of Viking masculinity, causing Hiccup to try and live up to his dad's expectations by acting violently, only to find himself unable to go against his true nature, and the movie ends with Hiccup and his dad learning to both better understand each other and how to communicate? That Stoic was wrong in trying to turn Hiccup into a brutish violent warrior instead of accepting who he is, which hurt Hiccup more than it ever helped him by the end of the day, and that all Stoic really wants is for his son to be strong and able to take care of himself. I knew what I was, what I had to become. Hiccup is not that boy. You can't stop him, Stoic. You can only prepare him. Yeah, How to Train Your Dragon does a much better job of showing a father figure whose idea of masculinity is destructive and have the audience understand his methods are wrong, while at the same time not turning stoic into an abusive father who we hate. High Guardian Spice, on the other hand, shows a father figure trying to teach his small younger child how to stand up for themselves and not just roll over and cry, and we, the audience, is supposed to see this as wrong. Imagine if in High Guardian Spice, Snapdragon was AFAB, and this scene played out exactly the same. That her father taught her that she can't lie down and cry when someone hits her and tries to take away what's hers, and instead she needs to learn to stand up for herself. Literally not a single thing would change in the scene, and it would actually be toted as a very good moment of female empowerment. I get the meta the writers wanted here, they just didn't communicate it properly. They wanted to show that the reason Snapdragon injured another student is because his family has conditioned him to think responding with violence is a good thing. And the show would never want us to believe violence is a good thing. But in softening Snapdragon's father into someone trying to teach his child to stand up for themselves when being bullied and showing Snap's response be a far less violent tackle than a more aggressive punch, it doesn't communicate the father figure pressuring their child into a violent masculine role the way they wanted to. It makes Snap's dad look caring but misguided more than anything else. See, what they should have given us to truly illustrate how destructive a pressuring, toxically masculine father is, is Andrew's dad. He's kind of skinny. He's weak. And I started thinking about my father and his attitude about, about weakness. I mean, how do, you, how do you apologize for something like that? God, I fucking hate him. You've got to be number one! I won't tolerate any losers in this family. Win! 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 You son of a bitch. Anyway, back to High Guardian Spice. Sorry, I keep getting distracted wanting to talk about better stories. What follows is a pretty flimsy argument between Snap and Caraway. Snap says he hit Kel because Kel disrespected him. Caraway makes a leap in logic that Snap wanted Kel's respect, which is not the same thing as someone disrespecting you, but okay. And says that Snap got Kel's fear instead of his respect. Snap says that Caraway doesn't understand how he feels. Caraway counters that there are lots of ways to become a warrior. Do you see what I mean? This conversation just ping-pongs around flimsily constructed ideas of how a conversation should go, but at no point do any of these sentences actually flow together as a singular thought. It's just separate concepts loosely following each other, 
I've been using too many clips in this review so far, so just look up that scene where Megamind and Metro Man are talking about the expiry date of justice, and this conversation has about the same level of coherency. The gang are training, I guess, before they go off to hunt the sea dragon. Time and Coral do some more flirting, and Rosemary pitches a possible name for their team. Something she's only done once before in this entire show, but is now going to be treated as a running gag when we reach the finale. The plan is for every other mermaid to distract the dragon, and Rose will use Bubbles' as venom to sedate it. We cut back to Caraway and Snapdragon, where the conversation is now about Snap changing courses, I guess. It doesn't matter. The point they want to get to is how Snap doesn't relate to his dad or brothers and clumsily goes into how he hates big shoulders and wants smooth skin and goes full on body dysmorphia. Which is like, I'm sorry you're going through that dude, but that doesn't really have anything to do with changing courses at school. But this is the part of the show writers actually want us to focus on. They just sucked at constructing dialogue leading up to this point naturally. Also, Snap mentioned the girls looked really cool as mermaids, and he wants that for him, so once again, I resent the showrunners for robbing Snap of the chance, so we could have this little talking head segment instead. Seems to me, it would have been very easy to let Snapdragon also enjoy being a mermaid, and also have this little back and forth afterwards. Do you know anything about transition magic? Gee, I don't know, Caraway. Does it sound like Snapdragon knows about transition magic? Also, holy hell, you really couldn't think of a less on the nose name, could you? But then again, considering this show's idea of giving things fantasy names is just a word find and replace, maybe that's for the best. Snapdragon, do you know anything about shifting magic? I don't actually have a lot to say about the next few lines as Snapdragon learns that trans people exist. Caraway gives some advice, which I think is very useful, and not specifically regarding trans issues, but in a general world sense. There are always more options than you think. As someone who struggles with black and white thinking, and who is trying to unlearn that habit, this is valuable advice, and I do like that the show doesn't flat out go, trans your gender, Snapdragon, it's the right thing to do, but instead just presents the possibility and moves on. But I want to talk about the general use of transsexuality in the show's universe after I've recapped this episode, so we'll get back to this in a few minutes. Back with the mermaids, they've left the safety of the Bastion to go to this underwater Greek pantheon looking place, which I'm now annoyed we don't get to see more mermaid stories involving submerged Greek and Roman structures. The real mermaids are going to draw the sea dragon closer, so Rose can throw the Precure mascot at it. The sea dragon just kind of bamfs out of nowhere and tries to eat coral before they can actually do any of this plan however. It does give time a chance to protect her new girlfriend and I feel the use of violence here is one of the few times it doesn't feel out of place or so hyperbolic I can't take it seriously. With the entire plan going tits up, Sage uses her Terrasphere to bubble the group so they can retreat to the Bastion. With two mermaids being out of commission, oh this other mer guy gets bitten too but he's a boy so he doesn't get any special focus. Elodie wants to act as bait for them to try again, since they don't want the sea dragon to go back out to sea to hunt the other mermaids. Sage suggests drawing it into the Bastion where they can fight it in an enclosed space instead. They do so and... Both injured mermaids act as bait? Whatever. They close the door after the sea dragon gets inside. Rosemary is given the cue to stab it with the Precure mascot, but is instantly bonked on the head and fails. She's fine by the way, which I only mentioned for the next part where the dragon tries to escape and Sage blasts the door to block it. I don't want people to think this is a desperate move on her part because Rose got hurt. She's doing this because she honestly thought this was a good idea. Elodie tells her her magic is unstable, which, I mean, okay, if you say so. It seems to have been working fine in the episode so far, but then again, this is Sage. She says she's unable to stop and manages to completely vivisect the dragon in the process until Elodie grabs her staff away from her. Is Elodie one of the underwater students or is she a teacher? I assume she's a teacher as she's drawn to look slightly older in the face and she's a little bit more adorned than the other two mermaids and she is the one taking charge here. But the show never outright says she's a teacher. 
It makes me wonder why only the four girls were sent below water when this was the High Guardian Academy's literal sister school asking for help. Was Caraway supposed to come along to supervise and help as necessary, but he decided it was more important to waste time having another conversation about gender issues with Snapdragon when people are literally getting eaten? I'm not accusing him, I just genuinely don't know if he was supposed to go with or not, or if this is some dumb, you four teenagers have to pass this test to ensure graduating with guardianship thing. I am going to blame Redbud though who could also have joined as a supervisor to help out the literal sister school, but was more interested in sunbathing. Although granted, if she went with, she might have teamed up with the sea dragon to eat the students. Anyway, back to Sage single-handedly murdering a dragon. Oh yeah, I wasn't joking by the way, Sage kills the dragon. Yeah, good job guys, stellar supervision going on there. Caraway tries to heal the dragon while Redbud looks on ineffectively, but Sage was so brutal he's unable to fix the wound. They say the dragon needs to be put down, and Rosemary adamantly volunteers despite literally two adults saying they'll do it. I have no idea why Rose does this. It's not to ease Sage's feelings in any way, since Sage just stands to one side and cries, and Rose doesn't acknowledge her at all during this moment until after she's done and hugs Sage for comfort. There are two certified adults and a third possible adult here, and the three mermaids said they knew this dragon very well before it went berserk, so you'd think they would like to be part of this decision, but no. They just let Caraway decide what to do and sit a respectful distance away looking mildly sad about the situation. Sage is the only one really crying here, which considering she killed it is probably warranted, but the mermaids being a literal embodiment of this is so sad, play desposito, is both weird and boring. The only reason I could come up with on my own to do the writer's job for them is that Rose feels responsible after dropping the ball so bad when she literally had one job, but it's never brought up or mentioned or anything. She just steps up like, no. I am the supposed protagonist of this mess, so there can be no other to put down the beloved pet of the mermaids which my best friend murdered. Like, that's literally it. That's the reason she has to put down the dragon, because she's the supposed protagonist. It's only here to try and give the woefully underdeveloped Rosemary some semblance of character development for the last remaining episode. But since she barely has a personality to begin with outside of Genki Ghoul trope who's sad about her mom disappearing, they had to manufacture this melodrama even if it didn't make much sense in universe. It's the kind of over-reliance on tropes that's rife in this show, and probably something a lot of less critical audience members wouldn't even think about, because the trope buttons being hit along the way like this makes it so that the audience members who just accept tropes because they are recognizable would never question why the main character is doing main character things. But if you're going to write a story with a defined main character who you want to be the core focus of your story, you can't have the fact that they are the central focus be the sole reason they're always the one to do things. In a good story, the reason why the main character is the one who does most of the important things is so naturally integrated into the plot we don't even think about it that much. Frodo is the one who takes the ring to Mordor because Frodo is the least likely person on Middle Earth Sauron would expect to wield its power. And if Frodo fails, then he's not going to do much damage on a global scale, he'll just become another golem. Aragorn leads the armies of Middle-earth because politically he is the rightful king of Gondor, and being his bloodline inherently makes him the only person able to do things like enlist the help of the ghost army. He is the only one who can draw Sauron's attention as Isildur's bloodline. The reason Sailor Moon is always the one to purify the main bad guy of a season is because she is the person who wields the silver crystal. She is the only one who can. My favorite season has Sailor Moon and Sailor Uranus arguing with each other about when is murder justified, and who should mark themselves a murderer for the greater good, and where does that responsibility lie. Travis shoots Old Yeller because he was his dog. 
The reason the right choice in Mass Effect 3 is to mercy kill the Batarian refugee already dying from his injuries is because Shepard is the one who is responsible for killing everyone he loves. In Dragon Age Inquisition, the Inquisitor is not the person who mercy kills Cassandra's former apprentice. Cassandra is, because this is her responsibility. Rose has no responsibility here. The only responsibility she could possibly have is if she was taking the burden off of Sage, who would be tasked with finishing what she started or something. But the show doesn't frame it this way. Rose is not taking a burden away from anyone, as Redbub and Caraway even offer to do it and are very much insistent that this isn't Rose's job. The mermaids have literally nothing to say about the situation at all and are just silently watching everything even though this involves them more than anyone. <sighs> anyway, Rose decides to kill the dragon, which she does. The friend group hug and we end the story here for now before we cut back to Snapdragon to finish his plot. Although I guess in light of this episode I should be saying her, huh? I mean the show doesn't actually provide a solid answer as to what Snapdragon will decide best represents them from here on out, but knowing the writing style of this show I think using her is a safe bet. Amaryllis asks Snap if she's okay, since she's been really quiet, causing Snapdragon to uh, cry. Look, not to be an arsehole, but the cry acting is kind of uncomfortable. Not because it's unrealistic or anything, but crying as a voice actor is a very specific skill which I don't feel the voice actress fully achieved. Sage's crying is much better for comparison, but Snap gear shifting from talking normally to openly sobbing without the clutch gives me whiplash. My wrist feels like it's on fire. Snap breaks the weird crying by awkwardly in a deliberate way saying he likes Amaryllis' nails before nervously asking her if she'd still like Snapdragon if she started painting her nails too. And all cynicism and joking aside, I love this line of dialogue. It's such a shy, uncertain and intimate admission without actually admitting to anything. It's trying to say something without being able to say it or even being sure what it is you're trying to say. And then to double up on this, instead of enthusiastically saying, of course, or anything like that, Amaryllis' response is perfectly in character. By not even skipping a beat to reply, she'd only accept Snapdragon painting her nails if she sticks to colors that actually flatter her. Oh, beautiful. Amaryllis then breaks her mask for a few seconds to tell Snap that she's always going to be there for her, even though she's not sure what Snap is struggling with. But whatever it is, it'll be okay. Amaryllis is the best character in the show. I know I keep saying this, but whereas in the past few videos it was more me just being very opinionated, here I mean it quite objectively. And she's not the best character for being trans-inclusive but because her having this unwavering loyalty to her best friend gives her complexity. She is introduced as the bitchy mean girl and she never stops being the bitchy mean girl. She doesn't go through a massive character arc that changes her opinions or perspectives, it's just as the show goes on and puts her into more situations with different tones, we get to see different angles of her personality, while never losing or changing that original mean girl archetype. She more or less befriends the main group of girls, but it doesn't make her nicer. She just kind of stops being awful to them. Nor do we get a sob story on how she just wants to be loved and that her bitchy attitude is because her parents don't pay attention to her. When the idea is brought up in episode 6, she literally bursts out laughing at the very idea that she'd want to spend more time with either of them. She doesn't have the stereotypical neglected little rich girl angst, nor does she have a come to Jesus moment where she becomes nice through the power of friendship. She remains the horrible little gremlin she was introduced as, we just get to know her better as the show goes on. And she only changes in that she decides which people in her life fall into the person I give a shit category and who falls into the target practice category. As for Snapdragon, I haven't really commented on this show's sermonizing as a whole because for the most part the way it handles queer representation in media is mostly in the meta of the show. My only interest is whether the show holds up as a story on its own when you remove it from its meta which was my goal from the start. But Snapdragon is the only real case of queer identity and the stigmatization of it as a narrative within the show itself. 
so I can't just not get into it as part of the story. When I watch a movie based on factual events in history, how accurate the film is to real world records is a big part of how I tend to judge it. I know many people will say, who cares if something isn't historically accurate, it's a good story. And although I fully understand where they are coming from, and in some instances would even agree with them, a problem with movies basing themselves on real historical events is the audience who then takes the movie's version of events as being accurate to real life. Because they assume if you're making a big budget movie, you'd know what the hell you're talking about. Which is why I froth at the mouth when I see people watch the pure unhinged fantasy that is something like Apocalypto and go, wow, it's so crazy to think people really lived like this. Cody, stop right there, mate. You're giving this movie way too much credit, mate. There's no point in trying to explain this scene. Mel Gibson doesn't care. He picks and chooses what he wants from history just so he can have a chase sequence in the jungle. Oh, why would he do that? Because he's fucking Mel Gibson, Cody! So it would be hypocritical for me to ignore how well Snapdragon's story as a trans individual is presented in this show. The problem is the application of real world facts is one thing, but the translation of a queer person's personal experience with trans issues is another. History facts only happen one way, filtered through perspective, but the individual human experience is virtually endless. On top of this, I'm not a trans person and have not experienced what being trans is like. So this is a double whammy here for me trying to judge how well the show pulled off the storyline. My only course of action is to look into what other trans people have said about this and, seeing as being trans is a unique experience to every individual, I have found people on complete opposite ends of the argument on whether this is well written or not. Some say they have never felt themselves presented on screen so accurately before and urge other trans people to watch it, whereas other trans people have very negative things to say about the way being trans is communicated here, and how it perpetuates being trans with eternal victimhood. However, I haven't come across anyone saying the trans representation is hateful or degrading. So I think the best comment I can give on its accuracy is, um, your mileage may vary. I feel there are much better representations of being trans in other media. Hana from Tokyo Godfathers comes to mind first, as being a trans woman is directly tied to her character as well as the larger plot. And there are moments where she explains the trans experience, both through her spoken word as well as visual storytelling. But Tokyo Godfathers is a feature film made by a master filmmaker with many years of experience and High Guardian Spice is a cobbled together low budget first product by inexperienced show creators for a brand new division of an online streaming company. Too Long Didn't Read, it's not the best written representation but it's not the worst thing ever either. What I can give my own criticism on, however, is how well the world building is done when you introduce transsexuality into the mix. And the answer is really badly. So, trans magic exists in this world. But the way it exists in this world is that Carraway himself has said he needs to take magic potion tea every fortnight or something in order for him to essentially remain physically male. The actual dynamics of the magic tea potion is never explained, nor is how the transition magic works. It's definitely not just an illusion and really is a transfiguration spell. But why does it require consistent reinforcing other than the show creators just wanted their magic fantasy character to literally need to take tea is beyond me. It's even weirder when you have repeatedly stated through all 11 episodes so far that new magic has no limits. This new magic stuff, there is no cost. They can just do things. Carraway fixes Lavender's sword when they were young, but needs to fix it again when Rose breaks it in the same place. Something that makes Rose feel better because it means she wasn't the one who actually broke the sword. To do this, Carraway uses old magic since he needs to make this glyph to do so. So the spell on the sword needs to be reinforced after some time after Rose dropped it. But why didn't he just use new magic? With new magic you can do anything! And don't tell me it's because the show implies new magic is bad in the long run because the entire High Guardian Academy is based around teaching its students new magic. That's why Sage is having such a hard time. The Academy only teaches new magic, which has no limit. So why did Carraway need old magic to fix Rosa's sword a second time and why is a magic tea potion something that needs to be taken regularly when new magic has no limit? 
In episode 2, Redbot starts turning her students into animals and plants for no reason other than to force them to make an antidote potion as quick as possible before the transformations are presumably permanent. The transformations wouldn't wear off on their own. Sage has to make an antidote for it. Neppy Cat is constantly turning himself into a furry version and only turns back into a regular cat after they sedate and undo the potion he drinks for it. It doesn't wear off. In this very episode, they have a magic ring that they only have to wear to turn into mermaids and the only thing they need to do for it is to literally add water. Just add water! <laughs> So why can't you just use the exact same established magic to permanently trans your gender? And because transfiguration is shown multiple times throughout the show as being so easy that children can do it, why is the concept of being a transsexual person so weird and foreign that Snapdragon never even knew that that could be possible? Her whole thing in the past three episodes was that she wants to be a mermaid. Did the idea that she wanted to present as a girl never even once cross her mind while she's attending a magic school? The same school where Amaryllis is happily messing around with magic for her own selfish desires? You're telling me that this little gremlin, who is your best friend, wouldn't immediately be on board with the idea of you even just playing with the concept of turning into a girl for a day or something? Uh, hello? Why, it's YouTube commenter Chaos1x. Hello there, YouTube commenter Chaos1x. What have you come to talk about today? Why is Snapdragon dressed as a mermaid in the first place? From a narrative perspective, I can't think of a reason that doesn't completely render his entire trans arc as being impossible to have occurred in the way the writers wanted it to. First, he and Amarilla show up and it seems like, oh, she bullied him into that, but on closer inspection, that doesn't seem to be the case, despite the writer trying to pull a backdoor drama on them like they did with Rose and Sage. So, he was doing stuff like this before and Amaryllis is cool with it. But that didn't make sense, seeing how the whole Cal thing shook out, particularly when Snap's brooding and Ama just doesn't seem to understand why he's so bothered by Cal's comments and then comes the scene at the end of the episode where he and Caraway talk, so playing with gender identity being a thing goes out the window. He sure as hell isn't experimenting with his sexuality or identity in episode 9 that's not even considered a thing until Caraway tells him it's a thing in the next episode, nor would he brazenly do so in public where, again, Cal's reaction tells us men don't normally go around impersonating women. You know what, you're right! Snapdragon doesn't even think about her possibly being a different gender as she constantly throughout the show tries to live up to the masculine figure her father and brother had set out for her. The very concept of possibly presenting female never even crosses her mind. So why is she dressing as a mermaid in episode 8 and 9? Amaryllis didn't force her into it. Cal acts like he's never seen a boy dressed as a girl before despite his literal blood family cousin Pernal being non-binary. So why is Snapdragon dressed as a mermaid here? Because he wants to be a pretty mermaid. But then why is she to live up to her father and brother's idea of what masculine is to the point she doesn't want to give up her father's act because she doesn't want to disappoint him? She never even thinks about playing with her gender until Caraway lets her know that that's even a thing in this episode. Are you telling me that in a magic setting with a magic system that has zero drawbacks, there aren't a bunch of people who would happily not only transition, but who would also transmogrify themselves into younger versions of themselves or different species or furries? Has Snapdragon really never seen a single person do this before? And she asks this nervous question if Amaryllis would still like her if she did something like paint her nails, when she was dressed like this in a previous episode and Amaryllis puffed her up about it. Uh, I'm not surprised anymore that this show has no interest in any logical form of world building even on the most surface of levels. But I am genuinely astonished that this show didn't do any world building on the issues it seems to care about the most. Just add water! Oh lord, we're not even done. We have to cut back to the friend group. I thought we were finished with the storyline this episode. You cut away from it in a very much implying way that we were done. Anyway, Sage is crying because she killed the sea dragon and how she couldn't control her magic. 
It's not your fault, Sage. No, it isn't. It's your fault as teachers who fail to instruct her properly to prevent her magic going haywire, which you just admitted is a common problem, and then sent her on this dangerous quest without any supervision. Time finds a random piece of seaweed on the dragon and confirms that the rot is what drove it crazy. She just says this in front of all the teachers by the way, so so much for not telling them about everything they know or whatever. Not that that leads to anything, because the only thing Caraway has to say about this is that nature being unbalanced is bad. Which is where the episode cuts to credits. This episode is so miserable to watch, I genuinely had a hard time getting through it again to write this part of the script, so I'm just gonna move on. Episode 12. So here we are. The final episode of High Guardian Spice. The season finale. The climax to the story. We open in the Everfree Forest where Olive is meeting our new main bad guy henchman. Yes, we're introducing the main bad guy henchman in the finale. He's only been here in the intro sequence of every single episode so far. His name is Mandrake, which is actually a good name in a show where everyone's named after plants. And he establishes his evilness in a rather heavy-handed way by asking if he can break Kino's neck, and then saying he surprised the tribunal haven't killed Olive yet. I mean, when you introduce your main villain henchman in the finale, you're gonna have to go into overtime trying to establish him as a bad guy, I guess. Olive is surprised that Mandrake is gonna be giving her orders, which is weird since I'm pretty sure episode 9 ends with the flame guy telling her the tribunal is sending someone to give her orders. Back at the academy, Rose is still feeling pretty bad about the sea dragon. I find this part really weird from a writing standpoint. Not the feeling bad part, but why is Rose the one who is shown to be feeling the worst, with Sage having to ask her if she's still thinking about the sea dragon? Rose was the one who inexplicably decided to put it down, but considering Sage is the one who outright murdered it by accident, you'd think she should be the one stuck in her head about it. But apparently she's already moved on and is only sad about it in a general, wow that sure was a messed up thing that happened huh, way, and not as the very person who killed a dragon in a really graphic and violent way in front of its friends. My guess is, this is another case of Rosemary is supposedly the protagonist because we say so, so she's the one who is supposed to be feeling angsty emotions so that the rest of the cast can react to it, without actually thinking they're writing through and realizing that this makes it seem like Sage is a psychopath. See, this is why when you write, you write from the general down to the specific. Because if you start with the smaller details and tropes without pulling back and looking at the larger picture, you get this. Sage accidentally kills a brainwashed dragon in a very violent and bloody way, failing the mission. With no way to cure its wounds, Rosemary puts the dragon down. The next day, Sage tries her best to cheer up Rosemary and make her feel better. You see how this doesn't make sense? I mean yeah, you didn't need me to dumb it down to understand what I'm getting at, but then at the same time, how the hell did the writers not see the problem? Ah, oh, cheer up Rosemary. I'm sorry you feel bad about the dragon I killed, but it'll be okay. Let's go cloud watching together. Meanwhile, Olive points out Rosemary and Sage to Mandrake, who is dead set on just killing them. Olive says she has a better plan of luring Rosemary to witch country, using her mother as bait. When Mandrake is confused about this, Olive points out Rose's mother is Lavender, much to Mandrake's amusement. I'm just gonna come out and say it. But Mandrake is another one of those western anime bad guy characters that was created by people who only watched Sailor Moon and didn't get any deeper understanding of the villains beyond their gay. So they can't even parody Sailor Moon in an interesting way. So all you end up with is a villain who is constantly saying nothing but I'm gonna kill the main characters over and over again wrapped up in a derivative character design. It reminds me of that one terrible episode of Dexter's Lab after it switched studios where an alien kidnaps Dee Dee and her imaginary friend and he's drawn like this for reasons that'll forever escape me. I would say Mandrake is more a precure villain than Sailor Moon one, but I don't think these show creators would have much knowledge about precure. Let's face it, this is exactly the kind of show made by people who watched the dick dub of Sailor Moon when they were kids and never did any further design research. Totally pompous, arrogant blowhard. I mean, who does he think he is and why'd I ever think I liked him? We have nothing in common. Nothing at all. Hell, even if you only watched the dick dub of Sailor Moon, I would at least expect you to have seen the R movie. 
how did you watch Fiore's story and your only takeaway from it was, oh my god, this guy is evil and gay. This is why they give kids reading comprehension tests in school. He just he threw a flower at me. Back with Rose, while she's being sad about the dragon sage killed, her mom appears out of nowhere and leads her down a dark stairway. You don't win any prizes for guessing Mrs. Mandrake who is a shapeshifter. When did Double Trouble show up in she again? Interesting. Rose is momentarily happy and confused to see her mother who disappeared and she has been sad about for 11 episodes, but this is quickly brushed aside since the show knows we know this can't be her real mom. So we skip over the entire emotional reunion so that Not Lavender can tell Rose not to tell any of her friends that she's back because there are enemies at the school. Something the main cast themselves have already stated in a previous episode. And for Rose to tell Not Lavender what they know about the rot. Rose rattles off a brief summary of all the plot we have gotten so far, most of which only showed up in episodes 8 and 9, while creepy music box music plays in the background. Yeah, your best friend Caraway. I saw him writing about it in his journal. And, well, who knows who else he told? Wait, when was this? When did this happen? Last I was away, Caraway is never shown to know anything about the rot at all, despite time mentioning it in front of him in the last episode. But Redbud was there too, as were the mermaids. So when did this happen? Was this some throwaway scene in the previous episode that I just missed or something? I'm not watching the show a fifth time to find out because I am just as sure this never actually happened and they had to hastily pencil this plot detail in because they realized they were at the finale and barely any plot progression has happened while we wasted time with slumber parties and truth or dare. Anyway, the second Rose mentions Caraway also knows about the rot and that Caraway might have told other teachers, not Lavender disappears. I don't know why, considering Mandrake has repeatedly stated that he's only here to murder the students who know about the rot, and he was literally just about to do so. My guess is the writers wanted this fake out reunion, but did not know how to not have Mandrake just murder Rose then and there and be done with it, so they had to find some justification for him to stop. It didn't really work though, because there's no reason he couldn't just finish the job here and, I don't know, blame Redbud or something. She's only one bad day away from wiping out an entire class already. Rose goes back to her dorm where Sage asks her if she's gotten over Sage killing the dragon yet. I saw my mom! Good job with that secret, Rose. The group figure, not Lavender, has probably gone to see Caraway, and you don't win any points for guessing Caraway is now also Mandrake in disguise. Oh, girls, to what do I owe the pleasure? Subtle. The real Caraway enters the room and doesn't even so much as blink before just body slamming his doppelganger, which is way funnier than it should be for some reason. Rose actually uses information we learned in episode 3 to determine which Caraway is the real one, so kudos to the writer for actually looking over what they've previously written. This isn't impressive or anything, it's just more than I expected at this stage. Although the truth is, they probably only did this to create the illusion that they had some plan at the beginning of the show, rather than just writing the finale and throwing in some callbacks. Mandrake turns his staff into Link's energy sword and just blasts Rose. Before he can deal any real damage to the group, Caraway forms a shield with one hand while drawing up a rune with his other, which catches Sage's attention. Apparently this rune was to power up his staff so he can blast Mandrake, but that doesn't make much sense to me because Sage, who sucks at new magic, could vivisect an entire ass dragon just using her normal staff without all that rune nonsense. And before you think maybe the rune was to nerf the blast so Caraway doesn't turn Mandrake into chunky salsa, the blast he does fire is enough to throw Mandrake right out the window to the pavilion grounds like three stories below. So this little rune flourish here is only done so that Sage can notice it. You used uh. old and new magic together! A solid foundation in old magic gives one the potential to merge their strengths. A skill you'll learn in time. <gasps> Why was this never mentioned before? So you're telling me that this entire show, this entire show has been Sage whining and crying and complaining and angsting and accidentally killing dragons because she can't do new magic because she's only used to old magic while all the teachers tell her how old magic is dumb because new magic allows you to do anything. With new magic you can do anything! You're telling me 
All of this, every single moment of it, was all bullshit because this entire time Caraway was aware that old magic can be used as a foundation for new magic. And all this time, you have Sage who is constantly vocal about only knowing old magic and who constantly asks these very same teachers if she can use old magic instead of new magic and who is constantly told by the teachers that new magic is better and she needs to learn how to use it. You're telling me that at no point in this entire show, Caraway has never once thought it might be a good idea to mention, even once, that old magic can be used as a foundation for new magic and Sage will learn to combine them later? Are you absolutely kidding me right now? How does this make sense? How does any of this make sense? And don't tell me this is some secret that she was going to learn in her second or third year or whatever. Caraway just casually mentions it here. And even if this was the case, why in the absolute fuck would every teacher drill it into their student's head that new magic is better if they are going to combine both magics later? New magic is better! Why aren't the students learning old magic first if it's a foundation to new magic? Why didn't you build the foundations of your story before focusing on the details? Every time I think the show cannot get any lower when it comes to literal, basic, bare writing ability, it whips out the pickaxe and starts digging. I'm so livid, I don't even know how to properly explain why this is so awful in a constructed and thought out way because all I want to do is scream. Every bone in my body is quaking with intense rage right now. Caraway tells the girls to sit tight while he gathers the other teachers. He specifically tells them not to engage with this shapeshifter, nor are they to inform the other students and cause a panic. Honestly, both very good points. So of course the very next line of dialogue is Rose saying to Sage that it was probably not her real mom she spoke to and Rose is sad about this. So she decides to find Mandrake themselves. Yeah, she kind of just assumes the others are gonna agree with her, which they do. Meanwhile, Mandrake has called the five teachers of the school together under the guise of a poker game and puts them all to sleep. Or rather, Olive puts them to sleep. Edgelord over here just wanted to murder them all. And it's at this point where I stop taking this character seriously as a villain. He is so murder happy while also being pissy and constantly complaining about not killing people that he has stopped being an actual threat and mostly just sounds like a tryhard edgelord. Also, apparently between a single cut, Olive has somehow captured Caraway as well. The gang are trying to figure out who Mandrake could be when they hear him pretending to be Caraway call all the students to a mandatory assembly. The gang realize this is Mandrake as soon as they hear this because he just told them not to tell anyone. Or rather, Rose figures it out because this is the final episode and she's supposed to now be a badass who has grown from being an airhead to a more tempered warrior after putting down the dragon sage killed. Too bad the show did not write her as slowly maturing across the multiple opportunities it had and just had her instantly switch from a different personality in the finale. I feel this is the result of only understanding creative writing from the point of taking tropes and popular set pieces within stories and fanfics you like and then shuffling them around and thinking that if you slot the correct trope into the correct position, you'll have succeeded in this thing called story. The writers want Rose to be this energetic but not very bright main character and because that is the character that Rodriguez likes her to be, this is the character role she inhabits throughout the show. But the show writers also understand that a character like this should mature and become more capable by the end of the story. However, since Rodriguez has Rose be a very one-dimensional trope that he likes, he keeps her in this role and then in the final episode, she's written as if she suddenly gained all this maturity and competence from experience, when at no point within the show itself was she shown as slowly gaining this maturity because the show does not want her to have this middle period of growth. It just wants her to be either the energetic airhead or the matured warrior. How do I explain this? You have, Rose is my OC. 
She's basically a self-insert, but not enough to just be an honest self-insert. She's an OC with a character bio illustration as the only depth given to her personality. This show is about her and her friends having wacky, non-specific adventures together. Now it's the final episode. In the final episode, the main hero of a story who started out as immature and not too bright has had experiences and been through situations where they are smarter and more capable and more emotionally developed than at the start of the story. This is how a main character is supposed to be written when you get to this point in your plot. Now put these two concepts together. I feel this is what you get when you are a creator online who is used to operating within the culture of fandom and OCs and then try and apply those kinds of creative techniques to a professionally written narrative. That's not to say that you can't make sure about an OC, but rather when your understanding of story writing is only based on answering headcanon asks about your OC and your interest in media does not extend beyond shipping and TV tropes, you do not have the skills to craft a functional narrative. You can't just go, I have OCs, I have TV tropes, and I have this line graph of where to slot in the important plot points. I can write an entire show using these. If you want to write a functional story with a cohesive narrative, regardless of whether you're writing an episode by episode story or a long form plot, you cannot skip over the part of learning how creative writing works. And fandom interaction, Tumblr asks, and OC bio sheets on their own will never be a replacement for understanding the foundations of writing both stories as well as characters. I'm constantly texting, and there's no one at the other end. I'm just a grown man who can't even look his own friends in the eye for too long because I'm afraid that they'll see that I am broken. Some people have an innate understanding of narrative, and these people tend to hone that natural ability through, you know, actually writing. Whether original fiction or long-form fanfiction. And I'm not talking self-indulgent ficlets and single-chapter meet-cute imagines, I'm talking about multi-chapter plot-driven stuff. But unless you're somebody who is a prose writer by their very nature, you need at least some education in how writing works beyond just sharing your headcanons on social media if you plan to do this professionally. Because if you try to rely on tropes to fill in the blanks of your story so you have a frame structure to hang shipping and jokes on, you're going to end up with a one-dimensional character like Rosemary. <laughs> Anyway, Mandrake asks Amaryllis if this is all the students in the smithy before he locks them in with the comatose teachers. When Olive asks him what he plans to do next, he tells her he's going to frame this as a spell gone wrong and set the school on fire. Which isn't the worst idea I've heard. He could kill off the main characters one by one, but not knowing which teachers know about the poorly explained witch country thing kind of messes things up. I do, however, think this is messy. The smarter thing to do would be to have Mandrake and Olive infiltrate the school and slowly learn how much everyone knows over a few days and then make their move. You could almost have them both be reoccurring villains throughout the season and structure episodes of the day around their shenanigans, varying them in terms of threat level. Some episodes could be goofy and some episodes could be more serious. But since we introduced Olive in episode 7 and Mandrake in the finale, the characters have no time to make plans or learn anything as they're pressed for time to do something dramatic so we can have an action-filled finale, which we need for some reason. Oh, and also we still need to give Olive her blatantly telegraphed face turn. So when she hears Mandrake is going to set the school on fire and kill everyone, she points out the main characters weren't with the other students and they run off to lure them into the library so we can have a cool setting for a fight. The gang spot Mandrake and Olive, and Mandrake puts a shield around the whole school before taunting them to come face him in the burning library. When they arrive, they attack Mandrake, but he pulls out his daggers and deflects the arrows before he and Olive split up. Rose, who is now a competent leader, tells Sage and Parsley to put out the fire while she and Time follow the duo. Rose calls out to Olive, telling her that last time they spoke, Olive told her to come with her to Witch Country. Rose says she's willing to go with her if Olive and Mandrake stop any unnecessary killing. Olive jumps on the idea and tries to reason with Mandrake, but he's too dead set on murdering everyone. He uses his ability to confuse Rose and Time by shapeshifting back and forth while attacking them. Eventually, he manages 
tries to take Time hostage, and Olive jumps in, asking him she can be the one to kill Time. Because Mandrake is an idiot, he fully buys that Olive is suddenly okay with murder despite her spending every second begging him not to kill anyone, and gives her his dagger, which Olive promptly shoves into his gut. So I guess she was okay with murder after all. Parsley and Sage jump back into the fight after putting out the fire, only to have Mandrake disappear in a burst of flame, setting everything ablaze again. Olive tells the gang that she was sent to observe them, and when the orders changed to kill them, she couldn't go through with it. The others decide to trust her for now. The group track down where Mandrake had run off to and engage in combat again, this time with everyone. Also, I just want everyone to know that this fight scene includes an epic battle theme version of Scarborough Fair. I don't have anything really to say about this, I just wanted you to be aware of it. The students inside the smithy are confused and Cal is freaking out because he's claustrophobic. Amaryllis and Snapdragon notice that Caraway is lying passed out on the table, despite Caraway being the person who locked them in. They both quickly realize Olive is probably behind this because Amaryllis and Snap are actually smart. Amaryllis casts a spell that boosts her voice, with this really cool visual of her bracelet wand turning into a choker with a waveform on it, which I really like. She quickly divides the students up into new magic users to blow a hole in the floor, non-magic users to grab the teachers and be ready to carry them out, and old magic users to use their shields and wards to contain the smoke. Yes, apparently Sage isn't the only old magic user at the school, but I'm past discussing this plot point by now. Meanwhile, Mandric pulls out a broom and escapes through the roof. Olive chases after him, with Rose and Sage not far behind. After a short sky battle between the four of them, during which the school gets even more fire literally thrown at it, Mandrix slams two pterospheres together, causing an explosion, which sends everyone flying. Rose is clinging from the gutter, while Sage has managed to get her hair trapped by some falling debris. She uses a dagger she had on her to cut her braid off so she can rescue Rose. I do like that this show took the effort to draw Sage with short hair very choppy and uneven after just cutting it. Almost every other show I've seen where a character gets their long hair abruptly cut, it's immediately in a nicely styled fashion. I really appreciate going the extra length to give Sage a brief design of having her cut hair be uneven and messy like this. Anyway, Mandrake has focused his attention on Olive while this is going on, destroying her staff and chasing her off the roof. But before he can kill her, Rose and Sage intervene. He tries to turn into Lavender to psych Rose out, but she's not having it. The bean in a salad bowl that is Sage's brain rattles in the correct position for her to remember the rage-inducing detail that you can combine old and new magic together through inexplicable means, and she uses her pterosphere to draw some runes and blast the ever-loving fuck out of Mandrake, causing the shield around the school to shatter. Why she needed to do this when last episode- oh, who cares? It's too late though, as the entire academy goes up in flame despite the presence of modern day firefighters who don't use magic putting out the blaze. In the ensuing chaos, Mandrake manages to escape, while Olive is… Uh, arrested, I think. As the characters watch the High Guardian Academy burn itself down. We cut to a little while later, where Rose and Sage are sitting below a tree and unpacking everything they've just gone through. Rose uses her enormous double-handed claymore to cut Sage's short hair into something a little nicer, while the two of them go back and forth with, you're so great, no you're so great, no you're so great, before we get to see all the girls leave the burnt out ruins of the academy to go on winter vacation. Before they leave, the two best characters in the show come to see them off, with Amaryllis demanding to know when the hell Sage had time to get a haircut while the school was burning down. Snapdragon compliments her on it though, but I think Sage could wear a burlap sack and Snapdragon would think it was the cutest outfit ever. Sage in turn compliments Snap on her newly painted nails, and manages to do so without having an anxiety attack this time. Amaryllis drags Snapdragon away before she gets caught up in more awkward flirting, and the two best characters in the show depart, never to be seen again. Thank you for your service, Amaryllis and Snapdragon. I genuinely would not have made it through this show if it wasn't for you two bringing a level of likability to this debacle. Anyway, Rosemary finally decides on the name High Guardian Spice for the group. 
because of our names. You're all named after herbs, not spices. And with a brief layer motif of Scarborough Frere, we get our final credit sequence, complete with a montage of art, which is a lot nicer than anything in the show itself. Leading me to further believe the show would have been a thousand times better if it had just decided to be a slice of life comedy and forgot about the larger arcing narrative. Especially since, if the internet is to be believed, when Rodriguez pitched the show to different networks, he didn't even have a story attached to it. He just went to various places like Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon and said, Hey, these are my OCs. Can I make a show about them? And got rejected multiple times until Crunchyroll saw the opportunity to win social awareness points on the internet with their marketing scheme of highlighting the show creators' genders and sexual identities before anything of the show itself was finished to show off. Oh, and then there's an after credit sequence where Mandrake is brought before the tribunal who all wear sunglasses and who are being led by Rosemary's mom. The end. And that's it. That's the entire show. Yeah, I didn't like it. It's not the worst cartoon I've ever seen in my life, and when it's all said and done, I don't think the show is actively harmful to anyone. But mostly because the handful of genuinely hateful moments it does on purpose, like the treatment of Esther, is so on the nose and ridiculous in how blatant it is that you can't even take it seriously. However, as a piece of animation, I find it incredibly insulting from a character and story level, and it makes me infuriated at how a dream project like this can be gifted and how it's been completely squandered for various accumulative reasons. However, I think there's a lot more to go into there than just something I can tack onto the end of an episode recap video. And so, although I would love to bury this here, please join me for one final video about High Guardian Spice, where I will talk about its writing and the larger creative application in greater detail. Like the video so the algorithm can cut me a break, subscribe if you wanna, and I'll see you next time when we put this beast to rest once and for all. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. I started out watching High Guardian Spice with the intention of just covering it in a single video and then moving on to other topics. However, it soon became apparent there was far too much to discuss and I split the video into smaller chunks. And even after doing this, the final video ended up meeting the requirement to be classified as a feature film. And yet, I am still reading comments on the videos and messages in my live chat pointing out even more things about this show that don't make sense, were badly handled, questions that were raised and never answered, botched character handling and just outright mistakes. The level of broken displayed by this show as a product coming out of a professional studio meant to be comparable to its peers is beyond staggering. To the point I couldn't even end the last video with a brief final thoughts wrap up without tacking on at least another hour to this debacle. And debacle truly is the word for it. In absolutely every way. A fiasco if you will. An absolute shit show. And that is not even considering the real world funk this show will forever have wafting around it. But I think what makes High Guardian Spice so anger inducing as a show removed from its meta context is the fact that there was potential here. The very basics of this show's idea could very easily have worked and the very brief flashes of entertainment and good ideas only further illustrate how infuriating its incompetence is. This isn't the case of a terrible show with a terrible premise and terrible writing and terrible characters ending up being terrible. If it were, there'd be far less to say about it. It's not the result of non-writers and non-animators making their first backyard show, or an assembly line product constructed by committee without any care or heart put into it. It is a cautionary tale of what happens when you write unabashedly from self-indulgence and entitlement in an echo chamber coupled with studio interference and a failure of management. So let's start the same way the show creators did and focus on characters first before we focus on any of the world building. Rosemary doesn't have any real character. She is supposedly the lead of the story, but she is lacking in the very basics that any character needs, let alone the protagonist. She has absolutely no motivation. 
She joins the Guardian Academy to become a Guardian, but she at no point elaborates on why she wants to become a Guardian. This is exacerbated by the fact both we, the audience, as well as Rose herself don't know what a Guardian is, nor do we ever find out, nor is that question ever used within the plot at any point. The only reason Rose is at the Guardian Academy is because the writers of the show have their main setting be the four girls at the Academy, and so they take the reasons for them being at the Academy for granted. Of course our main characters are at the Academy, that's what the show is about. What do you mean why? All that's left is for the audience to fill in the broken narrative on behalf of the writers by guessing that the reason Rose is at the Academy is tied to her wanting to be like her mother. And in a weird and frustrating feedback loop, the show is aware that its audience, which it arrogantly assumes is automatically going to be genre savvy, will simply make up its own mind as to why our main character is at the main setting based on other shows it assumes the audience is familiar with. I am a Jedi, like my father before me. This reliance on the audience being aware of other like-minded properties is a big problem with this show. But what makes Rose even more baffling as a main character is the fact that the other three girls all do have motivations and goals. Rose, the main character, is the only one of the group who seems to be there for no real reason, leaving her aimless and with no end goal to work towards or fail at. She exists as purely reactionary to the things that happen to her. And although having a main character as reactionary is a valid story, usually the reactionary character has some emotional response as to what is happening to them, rather than just mindlessly weathering every situation without any of it affecting them. Rose is also shown to be a rather poor student as far as studies go. The show also can't make up its mind if Rose is supposed to be a capable warrior or not. She flip-flops between being quirkily clumsy and unintentionally destructive to being competent and unusually capable as a warrior, depending on which episode you're watching, with no indication that this is character growth or applied effort. It merely happens out of convenience for the current situation. So she is an aimless character with no motivations at a school where she is not good at schoolwork and her status as a warrior flip-flops between being good or being bad based on what situation the writers want her to be in. I kept making the joke that every single time Rose talks about her mom, she has to remind us that she's sad about it. But the reason I kept saying it in this exact same way was not only because of the comedy of how often it happens, but because the simple phrase, Rose reminds us her mom is missing and she's sad about it, is the exact level of depth and relevance it is given every single time. There is no point to Rose reminding us about her sadness other than to remind us of her sadness. It's never developed into feelings beyond, this makes me sad. You can't even call it grief, because grief itself is a complex experience with various behaviors and emotions tied to it, none of which Rose ever displays. I will repeat what my friends said here as I did in an earlier video, that Rose's constant reminder of her mom and her sadness is a band-aid to try and fix her lack of personality. At some point, the writers were aware that Rose has nothing else to her character other than being the energetic, dim-witted, optimistic protagonist we've seen in every single shonen ever. However, for reasons I can only speculate on, they didn't try and rework her character into a more robust, well-rounded personality. Instead, they tried to tack on the illusion of deeper and complex emotions, which only ever show up in the very specific situations in which it's relevant, more to remind the audience that Rose supposedly has more going on than she actually does. At the fall festival, she suddenly starts talking about how this is a time where she and Sage can just be kids and not worry about guardian duties and adult matters. But she only says this because the concept of a character struggling with a coming of age narrative might say that in this situation. However, nothing else at any point of the show ever shows Rose going through a coming of age arc, nor is she ever shown to have her childish personality be a problem which she also is never truly allowed to grow out of. She merely says this line of being allowed to be a kid because the concept of this episode was Rose and Sage having a falling out due to clashing personalities. However, since Rose's personality has not changed in any way since episode 1, it doesn't have a good foundation as to why their personalities would clash now when they never had before despite being childhood friends. And so, with no building blocks to work with, they have Rose become a completely different person for this one moment of conflict with Sage, and as soon as the scene is done, not even the episode as a whole, just the scene, this opportunity to act like a child without the worry of responsibilities is never brought up again. 
I've tried to give possible reasons in the earlier parts as to why she's so broken in terms of writing. However, I want to stay clear of trying to apply theories and speculations in this final part because I worry what I say might be taken as a solid fact rather than me desperately searching for meaning as to why the writing is like this. Why Rose is giving nothing but the most surface level of tropes and stereotypes while also being denied any character growth could be for many reasons. Being an author insert, conflicting ideas between the writers, Rodriguez being overly attached to her and unwilling to have her personality change, pure neglect from the writers, simple pure incompetence. There are an endless amount of reasons as to why she's like this. And any one of those reasons sound possible. But the truth is, I don't know why she ended up this way. And the real answer may be none of those things, or all of those things, or a possible different reason nobody has considered yet. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter as to why, because apart from being an explanation as to how we got here, it doesn't fix the problem that Rose is a hollow shell of a character who we are meant to follow as the show's main focus. Sage is my least favorite character in the show, but although she is badly written, Unlike Rose, Sage has a large amount of detail and complex behaviors. The problem is that the character she's supposed to be and the character she is written as are two completely different people. The term gaslighting has become rather eroded from its actual meaning as it's currently a fad word. However, a lot of people will accuse someone of gaslighting when the person they're accusing is simply lying or disagreeing with them. Gaslighting comes from the movie and play called, well, Gaslight in which a newly married woman is slowly and systematically broken down psychologically by her husband through various methods of manipulation to make her doubt her own sanity. One of the ways he does this is to incrementally turn down the gaslights in their home by just enough for the wife to notice but unable to be completely sure it's really happening. All while her husband insists that there is no change and so her perception of the truth is incorrect. Gaslighting at its core is not only breaking someone down until they feel like they're going crazy, but in the act of doing so, making the victim believe that they are doing something wrong for implying the abuser is the one lying. It's the Uno Reverse card of mental abuse. In High Guardian Spice, Sage is written as a terrible person, and she's written as a terrible person very well. If she was portrayed as a slow burn villain by the end of the season, she probably would be my favorite character for how insidious her portrayal is. Throughout several points in the show as a whole, Sage has shown to have very little empathy for other people's feelings, both positive and negative. She makes an active effort to never be happy because it detracts from her getting to play up the anxiety-ridden victim role. She simply acts miserable for long enough until someone asks her what's wrong so she can talk about her problems. She shows an alarming level of controlling behavior towards Rosemary. When Rose shows interest in someone other than Sage, Sage spends every second complaining about how Rose is doing something stupid and wrong until Rose runs back to her side. She is horrifically sexist directly to another person's face while behaving as if what she's saying is just basic fact everyone with common sense knows is true. When the people around her don't want to fall in line with what Sage wants, she loses her temper. But when having her logic questioned, she resorts to crying to emotionally manipulate them and turn them into the aggressor. And then later makes hyperbolic claims about how the people who wouldn't submit to her once have made some slight against her, forcing them to apologize to her. Despite demanding to be beside her constantly, when Rose shows any desire or interest in doing something removed from Sage's wants, Sage verbally assaults her and, after doing so, continues to withhold affection or even just common decency of acknowledgement until Rose apologizes to her for being her own person, at which point Sage apologizes for yelling but justifies her actions by blaming her anxiety, using her mental health as a shield. She constantly and repeatedly shows herself to be extremely controlling over other people, prone to manipulation tactics and emotional abuse, disregards the emotions of others and shrugs off horrible acts after she's placated of any responsibility for what went wrong. And all this would be extremely interesting and amazing writing for a villain, but the show gaslights its audience by continuously, repetitively, insistently presenting Sage as a good person who we should like. 
Sage's actions and everything she says and does makes us experience her as awful. But the show pretends like none of these things are bad, or if they are, then they're not Sage's fault. Watching Sage genuinely makes you feel like you're going crazy, because any person with even a shred of emotional awareness can see at least some of the horrible things she does throughout the show. But the show itself behaves like the opposite is happening, and Sage is being sympathetic. That what she's doing wasn't that bad, or at worst, that Sage is in the right. Oh, you're the kindest man in the world. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. In a show with straw man homophobes, straw men who assert traditional gender roles, edgelord murderers, and a teacher constantly on the verge of murdering her students, Sage is the worst and most hateful character in the entire series, and the show insists that she is lovable and relatable. Parsley is one of the more likeable characters and probably the best of the main four girls. Her personality is positive and upbeat. She's extremely nice to everyone without the overbearing energy of similar positive characters like, say, Pinkie Pie. She's also rescued from being a one-dimensional inspirational Instagram quote by giving her grounded and relatable problems in the form of her family. Rather than going for the obvious, disapproving, unsupportive authority figures trying to pressure their daughter into a lifestyle they approve of, Parsley's relationship with her parents is strangely nuanced for this show. She loves her parents dearly and they love her back, but she comes with a typical problem faced by eldest children in large families, in that she's expected to put her own life on hold already at the age of 14 to help raise her siblings, stopping her from pursuing her own goals and desires and, in a larger sense, robbing her the freedom to discover who she is as her own person. At the same time, her status as the mom friend and her kindness and patience with others is directly influenced by being the eldest sibling in a large family. The problem is, these are all characteristic raised in episode 4 and then resolved in episode 4. <laughs> episode 4 ends with Parsley essentially completing her main conflict. At the end of the episode, her parents concede that she should be allowed to pursue her passion, while Parsley acknowledges she can help out at home on the weekend, while also attending the academy, and this conflict is resolved. And then, the writers didn't know what to do with her afterwards. As the show goes on from this point, Parsley fades more and more into the background, to the point of completely getting removed for almost the entirety of episode 9 when most of the plot starts happening. She gets some minor focus in episode 6 during the obstacle course with Parnell, but even there she is used as the C-plot, sprinkled in between Rose thirsting after Aster and Sade complaining about it, which gets the majority of the focus. Breaking Aster's foot is her most notable moment in that episode, and it's only notable because it's very out of character for her. On top of this, Parsley's reasons for going to the academy also make little to no sense. She's going to the academy essentially to become a blacksmith, which is something she already was, at her family business. The business of blacksmithing. And no, her parents' issue is actually not with Parsley's desire to becoming a blacksmith, as they more or less expect her to help with the family business of blacksmithing, while she wants to instead go to the High Guardian Academy to become a blacksmith. So she and her parents argue about this. Parsley's character has no strong foundation, as she has no reason to be at the Academy, specifically other than it's the main setting where the writers wanted the show to take place. But with an extremely flimsy motivation to be here in the first place, pursuing a path she was already on before the Academy, and is shown at the Academy as already being good at blacksmithing, and her main conflict with her parents resolved, there is nothing else the writers could do with her. And since there is no more time in the show to focus on her as a character, since her screen time was sacrificed in favor of Snapdragon's shift into being a main focus, a decision roughly made around episode 6, Parsley becomes less of a character than Amaryllis. Parsley is eventually discarded by the writers by the end of the show as they lost interest in her for shinier, more aggrandizing characters. A sad fate for what was actually their best written protagonist.
Time has the potential to be a good character, but due to her specifically being written as a closed off antagonistic stoic character for the majority of the early episodes, we never really get to know her as a person outside of her angst about the main plot, which the show also decides to neglect. And because Time's personality, goals, conflicts and inner turmoil are so closely connected by the rot and the fairy woods and trying to find a cure, the show's complete disinterest in developing the story means Time herself is neglected as well. Apparently the goal was to write her as a tsundere character, but in reality she comes across more as Sailor Morris from the manga and the live action Sailor Moon show. She starts off antagonistic and hostile towards the main group. The only character that seems to thaw her is Parsley due to her patient and kind-hearted nature. But we never actually see this develop slowly and naturally. It starts off slowly in the earliest episodes, but as the show loses interest in showing Parsley, we stop seeing Parsley develop her friendship with Time and integrate her into the friend group. Instead, in episode 7, during the tonally broken out of place truth or dare game, Time just recites her backstory to the main characters who give her a hug and she's now part of the friend group moving forward. Time is a victim of the show's disinterest, a collection of ideas and concepts brought up but never delivered on. Her driving force of the rot is never focused on to any large degree, so we only see her involved with it off screen while we're listening to Sage whine about her nonsensical problems involving the magic system. Her relationship with her mom is shown as being rocky, but is never resolved or developed past the point of establishment. She's at the academy, but whether she's there by choice to find a cure or if she's there against her will to keep her out of trouble changes depending on the episode. Her character potential rears its head now and then when she makes a statement that's overly dramatic and angsty, making her look like the overly serious dork she truly is at heart. But these moments are so few and far between, we can't even call it a personality trait. The only other time she's allowed to have her personality removed from the rot is when the writers want to ship her with one of the mermaids, which incidentally is also never mentioned again. Time is the opposite of Parsley. Rather than giving her a conflict and resolving it in a single episode, Time is merely the concept of a character, who is also then discarded as the show loses interest in the main story. I'm not going to spend too much time here since I have given Amaryllis her praises in the previous videos. Amaryllis is probably the only character in the entire show that managed to grow and develop organically as the episodes went on, changing from a stereotypical mean girl into a stereotypical mean girl who also happens to be fiercely loyal to the handful of people she decides she cares about. The only thing worth mentioning that I didn't before is that Amaryllis is unironically a better leader than Rosemary is, being both supportive of her friends, quick to piece information together and good at taking charge and wrangling people into order when the time calls for it. I am convinced that Amaryllis started the show as nothing more than a stereotypical bully that was never supposed to get much more character than that. But as the story developed, the writers actually started to like her and as a result gave her more to do. A lot of that also has to do with the frankly amazing voice acting from Katie McVeigh. Ironic that she's universally accepted as the best thing in the show when she started out as someone we were supposed to dislike. I'm about to say something that will probably get me at least one angry essay in the comments, but hear me out. Snapdragon being trans weakens her character. Hear me out, hear me out, hear me out. The problem is not that the show has a trans character. The problem is that once Snapdragon is revealed in no uncertain terms as being a trans girl, all her personality up until this point is replaced by being trans. At the 2018 Crunchyroll Expo, Snapdragon's character was described as, quote, a pretty boy, a hottie, an angsty boy, a representation for all angsty boys out there, which I assume was a joke because they kept talking about representation at this panel, and that his only friend is Amaryllis. They also mentioned at the same panel that they had completed dialogue recording up until episode 6 at this time, meaning they could still change things after episode 6 as they hadn't recorded anything yet. 
At the start of the show, Snapdragon is shown very much within these parameters, and like I mentioned, I still find Snapdragon to be one of the best written teenagers in a cartoon. She most accurately captures that, ugh, whatever mom, attitude, perpetually over everything and everyone around her. This is further developed when we see her almost immediately crush on Sage after Sage yells at her and Amaryllis. Incidentally, this is almost definitely by accident, but it's interesting how Snapdragon is continuously drawn to aggressive women. This could almost be a personality trait if the writers actually picked up on it. Snapdragon is also shown to be in her head a lot. She was described at the panel as being angsty, so even in the earliest episodes of the show, you get the impression that she's definitely angsting over something that's bothering her. When she's teamed up with Sage, the girl she has a crush on, she becomes extremely upset after Sage tells her to her face that boys don't have the same emotions as girls, or that their feelings aren't valid because of their sex slash gender. Snapdragon struggles with living up to her father's legacy, being reluctant to switch from the heavy axe to the rapier despite the rapier fitting her better in what was actually a far better nuanced hint at Snapdragon being trans than the actual episode where Snapdragon has a flashback to her father. And then around episode 8, the concept of Snapdragon being trans is brought up in a more straightforward and on the nose way. A plotline they follow throughout the remaining episodes and spend the vast majority of time on when they're not focusing on Sage being awful and Rose's competency changing every episode. And suddenly, everything that comes after this episode and everything that came before this episode turns into Snapdragon is trans. Why was Snapdragon so angsty and broody at the beginning of the show? Because she's trans. Why did Snapdragon not have any friends outside of Amaryllis and why was she so closed off towards others? Because she's trans. Why did Snapdragon have a difficult relationship with her father? Because she's trans. And my absolute favorite, why did Snapdragon start to cry when Sage told her boys don't create emotional bonds as strongly as girls do? because Snapdragon is trance. In the video discussing this moment, I said that, don't, don't worry, worry, it gets it worse. worse. It, it gets it so much worse. worse. That is because in hindsight, it turns out Snapdragon is not upset that Sage is telling her she doesn't form friendships on the same emotional level as girls do. Snapdragon is upset because Sage is insisting that Snapdragon is a boy, causing Snapdragon to get very upset because she's struggling with gender dysphoria. And that. I'm a girl. You couldn't possibly understand. Girls and guys and guys and girls and girls and... <sighs> In other words, the show is not criticizing Sage for saying men don't form emotional bonds. The show is criticizing Sage for implying that Snapdragon is a boy. And in doing so, it actually reinforces Sage's toxic masculinity. Because it turns out later that Snapdragon isn't a boy. She's a girl. So when Sage said boys don't understand emotional bonds the same way girls do, she's right. Boys don't form emotional bonds as strongly as girls do, which is why Snapdragon isn't a boy. Because she forms strong emotional bonds just like girls do, because she is a girl. And so by making Snapdragon trance, they boil down every single personality trait, every single inner conflict, every single argument, every single conversation, every single interaction, every single moment that Snapdragon has ever been on screen as trans. Snapdragon now doesn't have a personality outside of being trans, and her trans personality does not have anything more than textbook cliches of being a trans person. She's uncomfortable with who she is, so she's angsty. She is in a conflict over her parents and what they expect her to be like. She doesn't want broad shoulders or grow facial hair, neither of which are things that she has. She wants to dress in feminine clothing. Oh, what the fuck? Mom, how do I be out here looking this fucking fly? Have you seen me right now? What the fuck? It's all just so basic and surface level. And once the plot point of Snapdragon being trans is introduced, you realize there's nothing deeper going on there, nor was there ever. The show doesn't seem to know what it wants to be as a piece of LGBTQ media. It tries to both be a portrayal of utopian queerness where everyone can marry anyone, people can be openly trans, girls can fall in love with girls, and everything is open and accepted. But it also seems unable to tell the story about the trans experience without including examples of transphobia. It only knows how to write a trans character in the narrative of the eternal victim, 
because the show seems unable to think of a trans coming of age story without making it about hatred and persecution. And so they end up breaking their own established world building by introducing straw man characters to be hateful and transphobic, because they need the transphobia to reinforce Snapdragon's trans identity. See, here's the thing. A person's identity is a crucial integral part of themselves that shapes their life, their relationships, their future and their experiences. But trans is not a personality type. In the 90s and early 2000s, when gay characters were finally allowed to be shown on TV and movies more openly, it was important to show gay people in a positive light. So at the time, all gay men had the exact same funny, entertaining, witty personality. That personality being gay. See, this is the color I want. This is Damien. He's almost too gay to function. Beret, a pot of beret, and souffle. I'm gay. <laughs> I'm super. Thanks for asking. Welcome to cheer. Are you trying to ruin me? Don't look at me. I'm hideous. They all sounded the same, they all acted the same, they all spoke the same, they all listened to the same music, they enjoyed shopping and girl talk. They were completely interchangeable. Because at this point in media, gay was a personality type. And the only kind of gay that was not this personality type was the other gay personality type, which was dying tragically from AIDS. Now, there were outliers, I do know this, but in the broad TV and movie atmosphere of this time period, if you were gay, this was how you were portrayed. And don't get me wrong, I'm not criticizing gay culture as it exists in the real world and the people in the community who are reflected accurately in flamboyant characters. I'm criticizing the fact that for a long time, this was the only personality a gay character on screen had. I'm criticizing the lack of diversity, not the behavior. What gay stuff do you like like? Um, I'm into comics. Like Kathy Griffin? She's hilarious. Uh, no, like comic books. That's not gay. That's just lame. Snapdragon's character is written with the same shallowness. Snapdragon is trans. That is her only personality. That is who she is. That is all who she is. And the writers are so self-congratulatory about having a trans character that that is the only thing Snapdragon will ever be allowed to be. Having trans representation in a positive light told from trans creators is great. I just wish Snapdragon could be given a character to go along with it. You're all I ever wanted. You're trans. Thank you. But what else? What else? Is being trans all that matters to you? Derek? What else? I... Uh, uh... What else is there? I'm just gonna lump everyone else together here because none of them are interesting enough to give more attention to. Caraway has no character beyond being the ambiguously wise teacher who sometimes relays information about magic when he's not relaying information about being trance. He has no personality outside of this apart from one brief mention of hanging out with Sage's cousins in a joke not even Rodriguez appears to understand. Sage's cousins, Aloe and Anise, are a lesbian couple who are married. Other than that, they have no real personality either, other than being the older sister types to Sage and Rosemary and being in love. Olive is introduced from her very first scene as eventually getting a redemption arc, so most of the time we're just watching her being a generic villain until she stabs Mandrake. She doesn't have a personality outside of this. She taunts the gang, she sulks in the attic, sometimes she does cat things. Redbud is only one joke that would have been relatively amusing if we only saw her once, but due to the fact that none of the other teachers have any personalities at all apart from being ambiguously wise, she ends up getting the most attention out of the faculty, which is annoying when she seems to only exist to murder her students for no good reason other than it's supposed to be funny. Mandrake is a murder-happy edgelord. None of the other characters do anything worthy of talking about. Parnell and Slime Boy are there too, I guess. And that's it for the characters. A broken collection of loose ideas and concepts that mostly come across as the writer starting a thought and losing interest halfway through, leaving loose threads and unresolved stories in their wake, or simply never even caring to create anything in the first place. I'm 
I'm not going to spend too much time here because I genuinely get overwhelmed by the magnitude of broken world building in this show. I have gone on an extensive period of time in these videos trying to explain all the many ways in which the magic system doesn't work. And I highly recommend going back and reading the comments on those videos as it seems like every single person who brings up the magic system mentions at least three new ways in which it makes no sense. In that 2018 panel, the writers described it with the nature of magic in this show is quite dynamic. It is a driving force of the story. This is the only mention the writers gave the magic system in this panel, and it appears they never developed it beyond this concept that magic is important to the plot, without ever actually getting to the point of writing the plot. Also, using the word dynamic is just a buzzword for the fact that they had no solid concept of what the magic in the show is like, and it'll just change to whatever they wanted to as they go along. Take a look at this guy. Go ahead, take a good long look. You see, they just didn't care. The crew cited their major inspirations for High Guardian Spice as older magical girl shows, specifically mentioning Sailor Moon, Tokyo Mew Mew, and Magic Knight Ray Earth. Rodriguez even mentions modeling Rosemary's personality off of Hikaru's, which makes a lot of sense in hindsight. However, I don't think the crew actually, um, watched those shows. I mean, obviously they watched them, but exactly what part of those shows did they get their inspiration from? Sailor Moon is the OG magical girl as hero anime, but apart from having a mostly female cast and Ikuhara cramming as much queerness as he could into every single inch of this show, it feels like the only parts of Sailor Moon the creators wanted to be inspired by was the surface level. Sailor Moon is about an ancient evil from thousands of years ago returning to do great damage to the innocent people of Earth, and Sailor Moon is the only person who can defend the place she calls home and slowly learns about her deeper purpose, both as a reincarnation of the Moon Princess as well as a paragon of love as a healing force. The plot of Sailor Moon is one of self-growth and discovery, completely intertwined with fighting an ancient evil to protect the world and the people you love. You can't separate those two things in the narrative. Tokyo Mew Mew is likewise about an alien threat to the planet Earth, and the main characters being directly given powers and abilities associated with some of Earth's endangered species. The plot is once again about the Earth being in danger from a direct and obvious threat, and our main characters needing to protect their home. In Magic Knight Ray Earth, three girls get isekai into a fantasy world to save its princess from the High Priest who has imprisoned her. Magic Knight Ray Earth is also unique as our main girls are both magic users who each wield a specific element, but they also carry swords, wear armor, and sometimes pilot mechs. Because why have one awesome thing when you can have all the awesome things? But see what all these shows have? A main plot. Sailor Moon needs to find the Moon Princess and defeat Queen Beryl. Ichigo needs to defeat the alien invasion. The Magic Knight girls need to rescue a princess. Now, what is the plot of High Guardian Spice? Not who the characters are, not what their relationship and friendship is, not like the whole pitch. What is the plot of High Guardian Spice? Four girls go to the High Guardian Academy to become guardians. There is an evil force called the Rot that appears to be killing trees in a forest somewhere. There is a place called Witch Country which seems involved somehow. High Guardian Spice was inspired by these magical girl shows but only because these shows had girls use magic and fight bad guys and be in friend groups. Nothing about these shows' actual narrative seemed to have played any part in the supposed inspiration. The one I think think might have been the biggest inspiration was probably Magic Knight Ray Earth, as it's the only one of the three that takes place in a fantasy world. But because the three main characters in Ray Earth are from contemporary Tokyo, the world of Sephiro is one they slowly learn more about as they travel through it, slowly becoming more familiar with this world as a location and we the audience learn along with them. But High Guardian Spice has no interest in building a physical world for us and the characters to explore. It's only interested in its world as a backdrop to put the characters into so they can interact with each other in quirky ways. In my opinion, the place this show should have drawn its inspiration from instead are shows like Ranma and a Half or Urusai Yatsura, 
Shows that are largely comedic in nature, focusing on their large cast interacting with each other either comedically or dramatically depending on the tone of the episode, as they weather singular episodic situations, sometimes mundane and sometimes fantastical, as the show hinges its main focus on playing around with the will they won't they romance of the main characters, which is a dynamic that also permanently keeps them in the early falling in love stages of a relationship. High Guardian Spice is clearly only really interested in shipping its characters and queer representation. So why even bother trying to write a large overarching plot if you're not interested in one? It feels like the only reason High Guardian Spice has a larger plot is out of obligation. Either because it feels it has to have a large overarching plot because that's what it's supposed to have based on its inspirations and its contemporaries, or because it was some kind of mandate by Crunchyroll, who wanted to really sell this idea that Crunchyroll was going to invest its profits in creating original media rather than pay licensing fees for anime. But whatever the reasons behind this decision, I think it was a wrong move. Urusai Yatsura also had the world sometimes needing saving, but Urusai Yatsura knew that whatever silly nonsense it had going on, at the end of the day, what it was about was whether Lamu and Ataru would ever romantically end up together. Ranma and Ahof knew that it was about whether Ranma and Akane would become a couple, or if Shampoo would get in between them, or one of the other 50 ships happening in this show. And whatever other narratives it decided to introduce would only be there briefly, because the plot was never the main focus. High Guardian Spice is a ship-focused dramedy forced into the role of an epic high fantasy about saving the world, without ever developing the world that needs saving or what it needs saving from. At some point while doing something else online, I came across this post, and I didn't really have a way to organically add it to this section, so much like this show, I'm just gonna tack it on here at the end for you to read on your own. Who was this show actually for? I mentioned the bizarre tonal disaster that was episode 7, and it's true that after this episode, the show seemed to decide it wanted a more mature atmosphere. But unlike other shows which might start lighthearted and slowly become darker as the plot happens, High Guardian Spice comes across as not knowing if it wanted to be for kids or an older audience. The rumor is that Crunchyroll mandated that High Guardian Spice aim for an older audience halfway through production, and I can believe it, as the mature elements introduced such as violence and swearing feel tacked on and like a last minute addition. But it confused the show more than it already was in who it wanted its audience to be. The show feels like it was made for children, but the violence and swearing obviously negates that. So maybe this show was made for a queer audience, which I think was probably the only real target audience the writers had in mind. But if the show was aimed at the queer audience and the Crunchyroll mandate made it specifically an older queer audience, then why does the show feel the need to waste large sections of its time explaining to the older queer audience what being queer is? The sections of the show where Carraway explains what being trans is feels like it's explaining the concept of transsexuality to an audience that isn't familiar with it. But if its target audience are exactly the people most likely to already know what being trans is, why waste so much time explaining it? You can have trans representation without reading the dictionary definition out loud. So who is this explanation for? The queer audience that already knows all of this? Or the audience who might not know what being trans is, but who the show obviously has no interest in catering to? The only answer I'm left with is that this explanation of what being trans is only exists here so that the show can self-aggrandize itself to a queer audience with no end goal other than to be praised for existing. It's not interested in these lectures actually teaching anyone anything. It's here for trans people to give it automatic adoration and praise with no effort on its own part. As for the mature warning at the beginning of each episode, I want to make it clear that what I'm about to say is nothing but pure speculation from me, and I have no solid evidence to support it. But I am confident enough in my guess to say it out loud. People on various social medias grumbled that they think the only reason this mature warning is at the start of every episode 
is because the show openly has LGBTQ characters in it and that it's some sort of microaggression or thinly veiled homophobia because there is nothing else in the show that would warrant a mature warning. However, I'm sorry to say I can only see this as almost like a learned victimhood on their part because none of the other anime hosted on Crunchyroll that feature prominently LGBTQ characters and themes have this maturity warning. Zombieland Saga has a trans character in the main cast who has an entire episode about her experience as a trans girl and it has no maturity warning at any point in the show's run. Yuri on Ice has no maturity warning. Wandering Sun, an entire fucking anime about a trans girl coming to terms with her gender, does not have a mature warning. On top of this, Crunchyroll actually has multiple articles on its own site specifically talking about and recommending anime with trans and queer characters in it. This warning is not some veiled mark of oppression against the queer community, because at no point does Crunchyroll warn people against queer content in any other show. As for violence, not even Chainsaw Man has a mature warning at the start, so I highly doubt the lackluster blood and high guardian spice would get some kind of deterrent warning people against it. So why does it have this mature warning? My guess is, when Crunchyroll decided to market their new Crunchyroll Originals program by showcasing High Guardian Spice before it had any animation to show and used virtue signaling as a selling point, focusing on the creators being either women or queer or both, they were taken aback by how vocally angry its user base was about this. However, the main complaint by the Crunchyroll user base was, in short, why are you using our subscription money to fund your own shows when we pay for anime? And why are you trying to justify it with wokeness as a shield when we are not happy with our money getting used for this? But of course, investing in original content was a business decision the higher ups in the company had already made and put into motion. And when a big company has made a business decision of this nature, no amount of consumer complaints will be blamed on the exact business decision they are complaining about. There will always be some extensional thing about the business decision that they can blame instead, rather than the decision itself. The Princess and the Frog didn't make as much money as we expected. It couldn't be because the story was lukewarm, the characters were pretty flat, and our first black princess spends most of her runtime as a frog. No, it must be because people just don't like 2D movies anymore. We gave it a shot, but the free market has spoken. Back to CG it is. Dead Space 3 didn't make as many sales as we wanted. It couldn't be because we tried to make a horror game into an action game, forced important story moments to be co-op only and it's completely littered with microtransactions. It must be because people just don't like horror games anymore. Time to kill another studio! And so, Crunchyroll's user base told them very loudly that they didn't like Crunchyroll spending their subscription money on an original product and justifying it so smugly by touting how progressive they were for it. And Crunchyroll decided that people don't want shows with queer representation in it. So when this show that everybody already hates finally came out, a show which Crunchyroll by now probably knew did not meet the quality level they were hoping for as they kept delaying it despite it being finished, they put a big massive shield in front of every episode. Because of people dislike this show because it has queer representation in it, we just need to put a big ass warning in front of the episodes. Because then they can't criticize us anymore because we warned them not to watch it. Either that or they thought telling people this is a mature story for adults would actually make it true. Again, this is all just speculation for me and I have no proof of any kind other than being old and having followed the entertainment industry for over 10 years. Do you guys not have phones? Yeah, you guys that, all have phones, phone. right? So what is the biggest problem of this show? More than broken world building, more than badly written characters and more than virtue signaling. In my opinion, the biggest and most glaring problem for High Guardian Spice as a whole, which affects every single avenue of it, is the fact that it's completely lacking in emotional honesty. 
High God in Spice feels like it was written with some mental checklist of things they need to include or targets they have to hit to automatically make it a good show. We need the characters to have an event happen so they can have this specific emotion at this specific point in time because that's how stories work. If we want our characters to be likable, we have to show them as being relatable but not in any way that could be viewed as actual character flaws. Because if we give them any sort of true flaws, we might be accused of our characters being problematic in some way. And then the teenagers on Twitter will be mad at us because we didn't character correctly. High Guardian Spice feels performative. It feels like it was written in an echo chamber where a small group of people who all have the exact same mindset, opinions, tastes and friend groups were in a room together and one of them stood up and recited all the right opinions and then got applauded for saying things the group already agreed with. And they just went through this feedback loop over and over, all making sure nobody says or does anything outside of this pre-approved echo chamber. And so when they wrote this show, making sure to only say and do these pre-approved things, they all nodded to each other that, yes, we have said all the objectively correct things in the correct way. Therefore, we have created a brilliant, pre-approved, objectively good story. And our audience will bathe us in adoration and accolades because if they are morally in the right, then they must be exactly like us and agree with everything we say by default. But nothing in that way of writing leaves room for any true emotional honesty. Because emotional honesty can be messy or nuanced, or it could simply make you feel far too exposed to the group you have surrounded yourself with, who constantly judge the level of correct all your thoughts and feelings are. But here's the thing, if you truly want to create something, whether it be a story or a painting or a movie or a song or even an outfit, you have to put some vulnerable, honest, exposed part of yourself into it. The thing you make doesn't have to be deep or important, it just has to have something that comes from a true and honest place. Because if you don't, you'll end up with nothing but an emotionless husk, constructed with no more honesty or truth to it than a movie written by committee to appeal to the broadest audience possible for maximum profit increase, with no room for anything that might at any point make your audience uncomfortable or feel anything more than the baseline of amusement. Because isn't that exactly what you're doing? Constructing a story by committee from pre-approved concepts slotted into place for maximum positive feedback in the form of internet approval? All the pre action sequences were already assembled before they even had a script in 2017. Or a director. Or a director. Or a writer. Which is a real thing, by the way. You know what show High Guardian Spice reminds me of a lot? I really like Family Guy, not for any one reason, it's just for a bunch of smaller reasons that build up until I just don't find this show entertaining. But one of my criticisms is the fact that the characters are written extremely inconsistently, changing their entire personalities on a whim from episode to episode, but not in a way where you can hand wave it away as a comedy show we're not supposed to take seriously. The characters in Family Guy feel like walking mouthpieces an amalgamation of surface-level, flanderized personality quirks who only exist to espout the opinions of the writers on whatever topic they wish to discuss that week. Either that, or they morph into straw men to be argued down and proven wrong, suddenly holding opinions that they've never even spoken about before. Quagmire is a sex pervert who constantly assaults and lusts after women regardless of who they're married to, who they're related to, what age they are, or how sober they are. But when the writers want him to, he has a monologue about spousal abuse and we're supposed to take him seriously. Meg is most often a literal punchline, aimlessly walking around the show to be beaten up and made fun of for being ugly. But when the writers want her to, she turns into a hateful deluded religious straw man so Brian can soapbox the writer's opinions on organized religion and the merit of atheism. But then at other times, we are to see Meg as a heroic martyr, taking the brunt of her family's abuse to provide them with an outlet and keep the family unit together, which is... Well, <laughs> that's sure an opinion. The characters in Family Guy are not characters. They're frameworks for the writers to indulge their own opinions through, using the show as a soapbox. But even Family Guy has the ability to have rare moments of honest emotion that you can feel comes from a real emotional place, rather than just sermonizing an opinion. What would I do if you weren't here? Hmm? 
You're the only one who makes my life bearable. You're my only friend, Brian. If I didn't have you, I'd be lost. Uh, you'd be okay. No, I wouldn't. Probably my favorite moment in the High Guardian Spice is the very small scene where Snapdragon asks Amaryllis if she'd still like her if she painted her nails too, despite it making no sense in the narrative. I like your nails. Would you still like me if, if I painted my nails? Only if you promise to stick to flattering collars. Be serious. <laughs> <laughs> I am. This is the only scene in the entire show that feels like it came from a place of honesty. It feels like something that was written from a place of experience. When people tell you to write what you know, they don't always mean write things that you've literally been through. I started reading a book a short while ago called Nor Crystal Tears. Now, I don't think Foster has ever been a two and a half meter long bug alien, but when the main character talks about his anxieties as a larva, because what if he comes out of his cocoon wrong? What if he doesn't spin it correctly? What if he leaves his cocoon too early? What if he doesn't do it right and ruins his life? Those are emotions I can not only understand, but even somehow relate to. And the way they were written, it doesn't come across as the author trying to check off a little box to make sure he did character backstory correctly. It feels like a person who knows and understands and has experienced what puberty and uncertainty and growing up feels like. How terrifying and uncertain it all is, and how you can drive yourself insane, worried you might on some intrinsic level be some sort of failure because you're unable to do something everyone else can do purely by instinct. It's a moment in the main character Ryo's life that's written from a place of emotional integrity. It's not there because the author wants 1982 Twitter to congratulate him on his insect representation. It's there because the author wanted to express the insecurities of growing up. High Guardian Spice doesn't allow its characters to be anything but perfect representations of whatever cause the writers want to white knight and receive praise for. Being queer, being trans, mental health, girls being strong female characters, etc. But the fact is that it is in the very imperfections that the show refuses to allow that an audience will grow to love a character. To rewind back to their cited inspirations, we don't love Usagi because she's a strong female warrior who says all the right things. We love Usagi because she isn't very smart, she isn't very ladylike, she's way too loud for what Japanese society demands, she's pretty bad as a senshi at first, and sometimes she lets her emotions get the better of her. We love her because she's imperfect, but she does not let her shortcomings stop her from treating everyone around her with love and understanding. We love her because we see her also sometimes fail at doing so, before she pulls herself together and overcomes those moments of weakness. And don't get me wrong, you can make the most sincere, heartful, genuine expression of who you are at your core in your movie or show or what have you, and still be rejected by your audience. There is absolutely no guarantee that just because you were bold enough to put yourself out there that people will automatically love you for it. But you have to try, even if you end up with the biggest piece of cringe ever seen on the internet. This is ignorance and completely unfair. This country fucking sucks, it just fucking sucks. You still have to try. Otherwise, really, what's the point of being an artist? A couple of months ago, every episode of High Guardian Spice was suddenly put behind Crunchyroll's premium paywall. Some comments on my videos wondered if this was perhaps a funding technique to try and build up a budget for a second season. I thought it was more along the lines of The Warner's films, which made absolutely no sense, were locked away in the studio vault never to be released. However, it seems Crunchyroll is just aggressively locking everything except for exactly 1000 hours of content behind a paywall, including every single one of their originals. So this isn't actually anything to do with High Guardian Spice. It's just Crunchyroll being extremely avant-garde by advocating for piracy, which I will admit is a pretty bold move for a streaming service. Anyway, moving on. When High Guardian Spice had only just been released, Rodriguez would now and then tweet about what he'd like to do in a second season of this show. 
These tweets consisted of things like teasing Sage and Rosemary as a couple, Snapdragon transitioning to female, and having a character that only speaks Japanese like this is fucking homestuck or something. I will, however, give Rodriguez endless compliments on the fact that despite the hatred and anger and absolute thrashing the show has gotten and continues to get online, he does continue to stand by it. It would be completely understandable if Rodriguez decides to never talk about High Guardian Spice ever again following the hate it got, but instead, he stands by his story. He still draws the characters sometimes, he retweets fan art, he takes full ownership for these characters. And if nothing else, Rodriguez managed to get an entire show off the ground and completed. That's no small feat, especially for a brand new studio with mostly first time creators working on it. And despite the disaster that High Guardian Spice ended up being, it will no doubt continue to open doors for him in the animation industry. But at the same time, tweeting about minute self-indulgent nonsense like ships and the queer identities of the characters and whatever else meaningless fluff, while never once even mentioning Lavender's name, never teasing anything about the plot or which country or any of the actual story of the first season, also sadly indicates that Rodriguez doesn't seem to have learned any real lesson from this show's debacle. Instead, he appears happy to chalk up the extreme hatred as every critic of the show being outed as a bigoted homophobe, and that he and his writers did nothing wrong and they are only hated for reasons outside of their control. And everything else that was bad about the show was due to the show having a very low budget, also something out of Rodriguez's control. Because no show that had a bad budget has ever been good or made any kind of lasting impact. You're supposed to be in jail. Yeah, and you're supposed to be dumpster diving for ham scraps, you six-piece chicken McNobody! Get out of my seat! The reason we say it's important to acknowledge our mistakes is because if we delude ourselves into thinking we've done nothing wrong in a situation, then there will be no reason to change anything we did the next time. Because if we did nothing wrong and it was all just people who hated us for things outside of our control, why on earth should we change anything? Rodriguez has openly denied any responsibility for why the show ended up being bad, from blaming a really small budget to blaming the use of a Korean studio, instead of acknowledging that every problem in this show was due to mismanagement. However, Rodriguez also claims full responsibility for everything good about this show, claiming in his professional website that he had control over every single aspect of it. So everything that was bad or went wrong wasn't his fault, but everything good was entirely because of him. But it ain't about how hard you hit, it's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward, how much you can take and keep moving forward. But you gotta be willing to take the hits and not pointing fingers saying you ain't where you want to be because of him or her or anybody. Cowards do that and that ain't you! You're better than that! At the end of the day, the fact remains that Rodriguez was given 12 entire 22 minute episodes to create his passion project using his OCs that he has been drawing since college. And he spent those 12 episodes wasting time, neglecting the plot, inserting unplanned character arcs and showing no interest in anything outside of ship baiting and sermonizing and then ended the wasting runtime with a cliffhanger because he felt a second season was a certainty he was entitled to. Luigi, Mario! Daisy! You gotta come with me, I need your help! And then he went on to tweet about how his loyal fans need a second season to get further development to the things he purposefully didn't feel like developing in the opportunity he was already handed. In the words of Kappa Kaiju, It was given to him! And yet, as much as I dislike this show, and as much as I raise my eyebrow at some of the things Rodriguez has tweeted, and how he's decided to try and navigate the entirety of Twitter kicking the crap out of him, I genuinely want to see the guy go on to do better things. High Guardian Spice is a badly written show with badly written characters from a creator who has no interest in taking responsibility for its condition. But he's a guy still enthusiastic about these characters that the entire internet told him they hate for almost 12 months now. He still consistently tweets about how much he cares about the animation industry, how much he cares about cartoons, how excited he gets about other people's shows getting off the ground and premiering, shows which get the acclaim and love his show did not. And don't get me wrong, 
I am aware that Twitter is where you wear your business suit and stay on your best behavior, or at least it's supposed to be. But I really want Rodriguez to do better next time. But for that to happen, he needs to be given a second chance. And despite my incessant complaining in this video series, I still want to give him that second chance. Spending so much time with this train wreck of a show does end with me sort of growing a warped attachment to it. I mean, I still really dislike it, but this show does grow on you. Like a fungus, but it still grows on you. I highly doubt High Guardian Spice will see a second season. However, I could be wrong. There have been shows with absolutely horrible first seasons that somehow managed to survive long enough to become beloved pillars of television. But the backlash for High Guardian Spice was so loud and so vitriolic, I don't see Crunchyroll being eager to stoke the flames anytime soon. Perhaps at some point they'll sell the rights to someone else who might decide it's worth bringing back. Perhaps I'm completely wrong and we will see a second season of Crunchyroll gets desperate enough to try and sell memberships. Who knows? But I don't expect to see this show rear its head again anytime soon. Following High Guardian Spice's release, a trend has come up of artists and writers taking the building blocks of this show and reworking it. Doing an image search for High Guardian Spice will show results for just as many character redesigns as actual official images. Some of these range from simple tweaks and adjustments to completely new designs that don't even resemble the originals, to reimaginings using the originals as a springboard. Similarly, writers have taken the thrown away and neglected ideas and plot points and tried to rework them into a more functional narrative, or just rewrote scenes that came across as clunky and awkward into being more natural. And I think this is because, as I've said earlier, the show did have potential. And every now and then you can see the foundations for something worthwhile. It's just impacted by everything else that's badly handled, badly executed, or just plain mean-spirited. On the High Guardian Spice Reddit, I saw some people grumble that it's easy to take something that already exists and redesign it, but it's a lot harder to make something from scratch as a way to criticize this trend. And they're right. It is harder to make something from scratch than it is to rework something that already exists. Which is why Rosemary started out as a Madoka Magica ripoff. And then, over time, was slowly changed and reworked and retweaked and redesigned until we ended up on the character she is now. She is by no means even close to resembling Madoka in personality or even looks that much. You may be able to recognize the inspiration, but you can't call her a ripoff. And so, I can only see the vast amount of redesigns and rewrites as being positive even if the people making these never do anything with them again and they remain as nothing more but an artist going, what if I try to fix this? I think that can be enough. Because if nothing else, they are the lasting, final testament to the fact that somewhere deep, deep, deep in there, this show could have worked. Nobody is making redesigns for the nut shack, is all I'm saying. It's the nut shack. I want to say thank you to everyone who joined me on this insanely long journey as I gradually lost my mind talking about this show. It's really helped my small channel in many ways. I know there are people who will watch this and only really wanted to hear someone drag High Guardian Spice. So if you decide to say goodbye at the end of this series, I want to say thank you for stopping by. I really mean it. Just do me a favor and throw me a like and maybe a comment so my stuff can show up on other people's recommendations. And to the people who decide to stick around after this, I can only hope to hold your attention as I move forward. I thought I had more I wanted to say in this Oscar acceptance speech at the end here, but I, I think that's actually it. Thanks for hanging out, guys. I'll see you in the next one.
Shinata.